Greetings, dear reader. It is my pleasure to read to you the book, entitled Beyond the Edge of the Universe, A Steady Path of Mindfulness and Letting Go, by Indu L. Shakya, PhD. Acknowledgements. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who supported me throughout this project. First and foremost, I extend my deepest appreciation to the late Pante Vimala Ramsi, the founder of Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, WM, and David Johnson from the Dhamma Sukha Meditation Center for setting me on this path. This book became a reality largely due to David's expert advice on editing, his critical review, and guidance through the publication process. Without his help, these scattered ideas would never have come together as they did. I appreciate help from Delson Armstrong for taking the time to review the manuscript and writing a beautiful endorsement for the book. A special thanks to Connell Clinch for dedicating his valuable time to meticulously reading every word, correcting errors, and helping the book progress toward publication. I also wish to acknowledge Venerable Obhasa and Venerable Dhamma Gavesi for their help with reviewing the text. I extend my gratitude to Professor Hridaya Ratna Bhadracharya from Lumbini University for agreeing to review the early draft of the book. I am fortunate to have received valuable feedback from Professor Pat Pridmore and Dr. John Pridmore, which helped me reorganize the content and enhance the book's clarity. I am immensely grateful to my family for their support in bringing this book to fruition. Pray and Anya, your contributions have been instrumental in making this project a reality. I cannot begin to count the numerous hours you've spent helping with idea generation, initial proofreading, reviews, and discussions that shaped the book into what it is today. A guide to the book. The book is an exploration of the intersection between the Buddha's teachings, particularly mindfulness and meditative practices, and modern scientific theories about consciousness, reality, and the universe. It is not a collection of philosophical notes, but rather a rigorously testable treatise on certain aspects of science, training of the mind, and the path of direct experience. It is divided into three parts, covering a wide range of topics that blend the insights from the Buddhist teachings, particularly those related to mindfulness, meditation, and the experience of Nibbana, and their relevance to life and with modern scientific concepts such as quantum mechanics, consciousness, and the nature of reality. Introduction here I introduce the core themes of the book, focusing on the practice of mindfulness, the pursuit of Nibbana, and how direct experience through meditation can lead to profound insights into the nature of reality and consciousness. Emptiness and Parallel Universes The discussion explores the concept of emptiness as understood in Buddhist philosophy and parallels it with scientific notions such as parallel universes and quantum entanglement. I reflect on my personal meditative experiences that reveal the nature of consciousness and reality as interconnected and impermanent phenomena. Fallacies of materialists. I critique the materialist perspective in science, which tends to reduce consciousness to mere physical processes. I support views that consciousness and mind may be more fundamental than matter and that modern science, particularly physics, is reaching its limits in explaining reality. Then I show that beyond all speculations lies a realm of unconditioned that provides ultimate safety from all cosmic conditions. Buddhist Meditative Practices I delve into various meditative practices, particularly those taught by the historical Buddha, such as Jhana S, some superhuman meditative states, using Samatha Vipassana practice tested through the TWIM approach. These practices are presented as pathways to experiencing the true nature of the mind and reality, leading to liberation from suffering. My accounts support the idea that the otherworldly experiences described in the Pali Sutta texts, also quoted by the David Johnson's book, The Path to Nibbana, can be replicated by anyone. Science and Buddha Dhamma The book bridges some gaps between scientific inquiry and the Buddha's ancient teachings, suggesting that the insights gained through meditation offer a deeper understanding of reality than what is achievable through science alone. I also discuss in an easily accessibly way how scientific discoveries, particularly in quantum mechanics, resonate with the Buddhist understanding of interdependence, impermanence, and the illusion of a solid, objective reality. The Path to Nibbana 
The concluding sections emphasize the practical and direct experiential aspects of mindfulness and meditation as a means to experience Nibbana, described as the ultimate state of peace and freedom from the cycles of suffering inherent in existence. It seeks to demonstrate that the value of unconditioned happiness is a remarkable achievement that can be attained in this human life. Some statements and experiences discussed in this topic may require direct understanding from meditative practices, recipes for which are explained in part two. Throughout the book, I intertwine personal experiences, particularly in meditation, with philosophical and scientific reflections, arguing for a more integrated understanding of consciousness and reality. The book is dense with references to both ancient Buddhist texts and modern scientific theories, aiming to provide a holistic view of the mind and the experiences of universe. This book can be used as follows. Part 1 can serve as a prelude for general and scientifically minded. Readers who may be keen to understand the nature of the mind without losing their investigative spirit. The chapters are intentionally kept light on technical details to foster open and inclusive discussions. This part can be skipped by readers who are more interested in learning the practices taught by the Buddha without delving into analysis of scientific concepts. Part the Tut offers a guide for beginners in meditation, featuring key instructions of the twin practice, stories, examples and accounts from my own experiences. It can help readers assess their own minds and see what kinds of experiences and progress in meditation they can witness around when. This should help determine whether and how to invest time and effort in learning the twin practice. However, note that everyone's mind is different, so individual experiences will likely vary. Part 3 is intended for those interested in exploring the deeper dimensions of the mind and the Buddha's teachings. It delves into the reasoning behind the outcomes of practices of deep meditative experiences which transcend the notions of space, time, and the sensory universe, leading to the realm of the unconditioned Nibbana. Chapter 1. Introduction. Quote from Itivutaka 2.45. Living in seclusion. Those of peaceful mind, discerning, mindful, given to meditation, jhana. Clearly see things rightly, and long not for sensual pleasures. Those peaceful ones, delighting in diligence, who see fear in negligence, are incapable of falling away, and are close to Nibbana. I am beginning this book with a wonderful summary text taken from the Itivutaka, which encapsulates the entirety of the Buddha's teachings. It evokes a warm feeling and a sense of happiness that awaits us as a gift for practicing diligently and remaining calm, composed, and careful in our attitudes. The subjects of this book are jhanas and nibbana, and how we can directly experience these sublime states of happiness. Now, let's delve into more details of the text. This means that those who know and see the arising of craving directly let go of it right then. These individuals possess a peaceful mind. How does one know and see craving? One should constantly observe the mind and see where it leans when any phenomenon arises in our awareness. This could be a thought, feeling, emotion, sound, idea, imagination, and so on. A mind affected by craving always leans towards liking something or disliking it. It may manifest as a gross movement of the mind or a subtle reaction, or the mind may simply shut off by showing indifference. All these are reactions of the mind that manifest craving towards the things entering its awareness. One lets go of craving not by forcefully suppressing or avoiding them, but by mindfully being aware and simply not keeping attention on them. This is a crucial point. Trying to suppress phenomena through reactions or by force causes craving to grow rather than subside. Then one observes that there was some subtle tension or tightness in the mind because of those phenomena. One then relaxes the mind and body by releasing any tension in the body. This covers the attitudes of those of peaceful mind discerning. Being mindful means having that observation of the mind that is neither too lax nor too energetic. The Buddha gives the simile of holding a quail gently in one's hands. It needs to be held very gently but kept close. Essentially, one needs to have a relaxed attitude but with keen interest in the meditation object. The object of meditation can be mindfulness of loving-kindness, breath, observation of elements, the five aggregates, and so on. Personally, I have been trained in mindfulness of loving-kindness, 
and I find it to be a very beneficial practice in many ways, but the key lies in the attitude towards the meditation object. After practicing in this manner for some time, the mind settles in a comfortable and peaceful way. The hindrances do not find any foothold in the mind because we are not paying attention to them and are relaxing any tension or tightness as they arise. It is akin to mud settling in the water of a pond, gradually revealing clear water in front of our awareness. What we see is the mind that is pure and empty of all distractions caused by the hindrances. This state of mind is called jhana. Now the mind is ready to observe things as they truly are. What is the reality of phenomena? They are not external to our mind. Rather, they arise because of the mind reacting to situations. When one realizes this through direct experience, cessation or niroda occurs, the culmination of the noble eightfold path. Therefore, knowing and seeing jhana is extremely important on this path. Indeed, if one experiences the happiness that arises from letting go of craving, one will understand exactly what this means. Essentially, the happiness or pleasure from letting go, or from jhanas, is far superior to what we experience from sense pleasures. Why? Because there are no sensual thoughts, no aversion, no excitement, no lustful intentions. All the worldly pursuits containing traces of greed, hatred and delusion are absent. The mind experiences this otherworldly joy or happiness which permeates and overflows through every cell of the body. The Buddha and his disciples were nourished by this sublime happiness. Hence, they did not seek sensual happiness and were content living in secluded places and forests. Now peace has become second nature for these meditators. They do not try to create peace or force themselves to be peaceful. They understand that peace naturally arises when the mind dissociates from phenomena, stops taking things personally, and avoids getting entangled in the mind's attempts to engage with them. They act in ways that maintain a balanced mind, naturally leading to inner peace. They are unwavering in their commitment to maintain this composure, adjusting their energy and practicing the other awakening factors. They live harmoniously, in alignment with societal norms and nature, always adhering to the five precepts or more. They are acutely aware of personal suffering and remain mindful not to cause pain to anyone, demonstrating love and kindness towards all, including themselves. They understand that any attempt to inflict pain leads to restlessness and remorse, requiring significant effort and time to regain mental composure if deviating from the practice of right effort. They are cautious and mindful in sustaining their practice and continuously purifying their minds. Those who live mindfully, practicing right effort, and have experienced the results of this path personally, know the Four Noble Truths intimately. When someone enters a state of cessation, niroda, and awakens from it, they gain direct insight into the arising of the universe and the world of experiences. They have no doubts about the path leading to truth. The depth of awakening to this experience deepens with each moment of practice. Essentially, this is what the Buddha conveyed. They have embarked on a gradual journey away from samsara and will inevitably reach the state of nibbana at some point in this life or the next few. Around the end of 2017, my life took a major turn. I learned that my mother had been suffering from a chronic cough for the past few years, and her condition was worsening due to irreversible lung tissue decay. In late November, I traveled from the UK to Nepal for a few weeks to care for her. It was an emotionally challenging time. She was hoping that I could manage her deteriorating health and provide assurance that her lung condition could be treated. We consulted the best doctors in Nepal in the hope of finding the right medication. Spending three weeks watching her become increasingly frail and helpless was extremely difficult for me. She has been my greatest inspiration to seek the path leading to the end of suffering. I had seen her meditate daily and explain the suttas. She used to say that the Dhamma is so profound that we, her children, would not fully grasp its true meaning. Her words propelled me to explore the path of direct experience and the essence of true Dhamma. By then, I had been practicing twim for about two years and had undergone some profound experiences. I wished to teach her this practice, but time was running out. Her deteriorating health prevented her from practicing with me. I gave her the book, The Path to Nibbana, by David Johnson. Her English skills were limited, but she made efforts to understand the twim method. 
I explained the 6R technique and the importance of relaxing the mind and body to release craving, which resonated with her. From the book, she grasped the significance of the word relax, which was truly inspiring for me. I wished I had more time to be with her and guide her through all the stages of jhanas using the TWIM approach. In January 2018, I received a call from Nepal urging me to take the earliest flight possible to see my mother before she passed away. I knew she was struggling due to the latest medication causing dizziness and weakness. She was on a ventilator and the doctors were doing their best. As I landed at Kathmandu Airport, my thoughts were filled with wishes for her comfort and recovery. Deep down, I held on to hope that she might survive this ordeal and eventually find freedom from her suffering, even though I knew it was a wish that kept my spirits up. Unfortunately, I arrived too late to see her alive. Not a day goes by that I do not think about her. I take solace in the belief that she has found freedom from suffering after leaving this life, guided by the Dhamma that she held dear throughout her life. I recall a sutta where the Buddha told Mahanama that those who have unwavering faith in the Dhamma are like ghee that never sinks, a thought that brings me comfort whenever I think of her. Witnessing death up close made me realize the harsh truths of life. Imagine suddenly discovering you have very little time left due to unforeseen medical conditions. What becomes the most important in such critical moments? Some might say winning a billion-dollar lottery. Others might dream of traveling the world or ruling it. Physicists and scientists might hope to teleport or explore the mysteries of the universe. Philosophers might seek answers about our purpose and what lies beyond death. Perhaps the greatest questions of all time may boil down to this. What drives this life filled with endless experiences of suffering and joy? Is there a lasting happiness and freedom beyond these experiences? These questions have plagued humanity since ancient times. What if we were told that death is merely a concept, a dream that we unknowingly fabricate, and that we can bring this dream to a complete halt? The existence we live, with its vivid experiences lasting decades for us humans, parallels the dreams we experience nightly. The Buddha discovered over 2,600 years ago that we live in an incredibly real-looking dream. He left us the means to awaken permanently from this dream and achieve freedom from the miseries we endure life after life. He called this state of awakening and freedom which transcends space and time and all feelings. Nibbana, a perpetual state of peace, calm and tranquility attained through the extinguishing of the fire of craving. While this may sound too far-fetched and fantastic to take seriously, there are indeed methods that can gradually guide anyone towards awakening by training the mind in the right way. Often, we become absorbed in the reality of everyday life, focusing on making the most out of our few decades of existence by indulging our senses with whatever pleases them. We pursue the finest tasting foods, the most luxurious cars, holidays in exotic destinations, and other pleasures to satisfy our sensual desires. But did you know there is a far superior pleasure and happiness that lies beyond these sensory pleasures? What's more, it is completely free for anyone to experience through simple exercises of training the mind. The Buddha called these experiences jhanas, milestones of spiritual success accompanied by mindfulness and full awareness. They are attained by precisely following the recipe of Nibbana that he left for the world to practice and experience. This book will delve deeply into the remarkable developments of modern times to draw conclusions that support my convictions and direct experiences. Perhaps it is time to give these ancient wisdoms extra consideration and see for oneself that they are real and attainable experiences for our ultimate happiness and benefit, rather than pretending we are too busy. Immediate questions may arise. Someone might say, what you are talking about is nonsense. There is no happiness outside the realm of our senses. I could not agree more. This non-sensual happiness will not make sense to us until we experience it directly. In fact, we need to let go of all our preconceived ideas and concepts of happiness. Deep within our minds lie layers of mental dispositions that shape our awareness and experiences. We favor certain experiences and avoid those that are disagreeable, almost as if we have no control over them. Deeper than these experiences lie another layer consisting of subtler experiences and attitudes that may challenge our perceptions slightly, but not significantly. These experiences are harder to let go of 
because we attach a sense of identity to them. We tend to believe that these attitudes and preferences constitute our personalities or are symbols of our existence and character. As we unravel these subtler layers of experience, they begin to lose their solidity, revealing more experiences of emptiness. We come to realize that our experiences are composed of constituent parts, like bricks and mortar in a building or composites in construction. These components are held together by a process we generally do not comprehend, yet it operates swiftly to make everything around us appear smooth and real. Now questions may arise. What is this thing we call reality actually? Are solid objects, liquids and substances around us truly real? What about our bodies, sensations, feelings, thoughts, imaginations and preferences? Natural sciences such as physics, chemistry, biology and cosmology have made significant strides in analyzing the nature of matter that constitutes the objects we perceive. The course of discoveries in recent years, decades and centuries has brought us closer to realizing that the reality we ascribe to these objects is not as solid as we once thought in the early Newtonian era. Moreover, the recent developments in quantum physics and the entanglement of phenomena have completely disrupted the predictable and smooth framework of space-time that Newton and Einstein introduced in their theories. If we review the last few hundred years of development in physics and other natural sciences, we have now reached a point where any scientific discovery may no longer be considered confined to an objective reality unaffected by the presence of a conscious observer. In this book, I will closely examine how we can release ourselves from rigid theories or speculations about consciousness. I will personally explore what it means to be mindful of all mental processes, including consciousness, and how they operate in our human experiences. I will detail techniques that allow our minds to train to such a degree that we can break through to even the subtlest experiences and observe the process of experience itself through the sharpest lens of mindfulness. Obviously, the terms consciousness, mind, and mindfulness are largely unfamiliar to many proponents of science who believe that science should not be influenced by human factors or subjectivity. It should be defined by the precise laws of nature that underlie them. This fact is verifiable by many observers who can arrive at a common conclusion asserting the results of the theories being investigated. Perhaps the time is now ripe to ask the scientific community what they perceive as the ultimate objectives of all their pursuits. The answers often revolve around maximizing or minimizing certain metrics, such as minimizing energy expenditure for a process, or maximizing the area served, and so on. These are always measured, compared, or quantitatively analyzed. If we step back and observe, there seems to be no end in sight to this process. It is an infinite loop where one can never find a state of total satisfaction, perpetual happiness, or complete cessation of desires. Pursuing the exploration of natural sciences solves our immediate problems. There is no denying this fact. But will it bring us long-term happiness? The answer to this question is not found within the domain of science. This is where this book comes in. To provide descriptions of techniques, practices, paths, and experiences of long-term happiness with freedom of mind that one can personally observe, be assured of the outcomes, and where one can be free of any perplexity irrespective of what they are. Throughout the book, I will use texts from the Pali Canon, translated into English, to ensure that my experiences and words can be traced back to these texts, assuring you that these are not merely my creative ideas. The Pali Canon contains the words of the historical Buddha on thousands of occasions throughout his life. They largely convey his messages to his disciples and all practitioners, on how all our sufferings can be ended for good. While many of his words appear simple, their meanings run much deeper, and their significance is realized when one directly experiences them in meditative states. These are dimensions of superhuman experiences, leading one to remain free from all distractions and entanglements of the mind. Chapter 2. On Emptiness and Parallel Universes These are strange terms connected with our experiences, the former is often linked to the state of the universe through the lens of mindfulness, also referred to as the lack of substance and solidity, a term popularized by the sage Nagarjuna, who wrote a philosophical treatise on the original teachings of the historical Buddha concerning the mind, phenomena, and the nature of reality, Kalupahana, 2006. The latter is a more hypothetical concept in science, often connected with perplexing notions like quantum entanglement 
and the Non-Local Properties of Particles, Green, 2011. Parallel universes have captured the imagination of physicists to address criticisms questioning their stance on objective reality. Like many proponents of science, I used to have dismissive attitudes towards the practices for the development of the mind and direct experience. However, over the years, my experiences and attitudes towards such ideas have changed. It was September 2021. I sat in meditation one afternoon for around an hour, radiating equanimity in all directions. The mind became bright, light and fresh. At times, it dimmed and wobbled back and forth. Then I realized that any wobble or fluctuation is just a potential phenomenon caused by the ignorance that these are me or mine. In fact, they are just layers of impurities or extraneous artifacts with which the mind is cluttered or stirred. I recalled the saying of the Buddha, Manasikaro Sambhava Sabe Dhamma, which means all phenomena are potentials that become manifest due to attention, i.e., all phenomena become reality only when they are perceived or originate due to our attention. If there is no attention, these phenomena simply will not arise. I then saw that all perceptions, including material forms, feelings, and consciousness, indeed come about when we are consumed in the flow of the process of dependent origination. With the non-understanding of this as a condition, formations come to be. At each contact point, the very start of choice we make in each activity is based on reaction. These feelings and perceptions arise due to contact that is identified with our experiences. These morph into consciousness at one end and mind matter, nama rupa in Pali, at the other. Duality arises. These are just vibrations that arise and pass away so incredibly fast that they manifest to consciousness as something solid, like objects. We know from physics that all atoms and molecules are empty of any substance. They repel each other, giving us a sense of resistance. Therefore, a rock feels solid, a chair supports our weight, and so on. In fact, these sensations continue due to our engagement with these phenomena, i.e. consciousness and mind matter. The moment consciousness is present, Namarupa also arises with it. The Buddha has said on many occasions that one can develop such an ability of mind where one can dive into the earth or pass through walls unhindered. Matter or elements, Rupa, can influence us as long as we take them to be something independent of our perception. When one completely lets go of any notion of these phenomena being separate, there is simply no resistance. There is no feeling, no perception, no consciousness. These four great elements simply cannot impact the mind, and the vibrations cannot arise. All that remains is voidness and non-contact. No fire, no pressure, no feeling, no material object. These things simply do not touch each other as if they were two parallel lines that never cross or meet. I have seen this a few times directly and realized that the world is simply an artifact, a byproduct of an accident where from the purity of emptiness, like flotsam on the ocean surface, it appeared due to a deep whirlpool. In physics, there are notions of parallel universes that are independent and remain untouched, but suddenly they come into contact like fine membranes touching each other giving rise to a new universe from time to time, Green, 2011. This brain theory of membrane-like occurrences of the universe is a concept, but the reality of our experience can also be like this. The moment anything is perceived, the world starts to arise, and all phenomena follow. But before these things occur, there is peace and calm. There is no notion of time, space, or concept. It just remains as an experience, nothing more than that. There is no I, no object, just experience. Here is a verse from the Dhammapada. All mental phenomena have mind as. Their forerunner, they have mind as their chief. They are mind made. Dhammapada verse 1, the story of Kakupala. This mind and mental phenomena sequence is a very important point. All mental phenomena arise and cease simultaneously. Cracking this point can lead us to the deathless a state I will explore in more detail later. The mind is truly the most complex architect of all we see around the world today. Everything that we have built and imagined is the product of our mind. We have made astonishing discoveries in recent centuries by making deep observations of physical, chemical, and biological phenomena. These discoveries have led to state-of-the-art technologies such as supercomputers, 
sophisticated software algorithms, stem cells, and many more. In short, by utilizing the mind's abilities to analyze and conceptualize, we have been able to create almost everything we can conceive of. When it comes to the origination of all phenomena and our experiences, it is widely believed that our minds, thoughts, and perceptions are so haphazard and complex that there is no such thing as science when it comes to studying the human mind. Most people consider such a topic as something beyond normal human capabilities to comprehend. They resort to ideas like a supreme creator or God behind them. Alternatively, some resort to mysticism and supernormal consciousness as the ultimate nature of all creations, including the mind. Direct experience and personal realization of mind and phenomena as a process is something they may never think of as a way out of the mystery of the mind. The Buddha spent six very difficult years searching for the answers to these questions. He did not accept the ideas of a supreme creator or any mystical experience or strange phenomena in the nature of reality. He penetrated the truth of our mind's workings with the discovery of the process called paticca samupada, or dependent co-arising. He saw with direct experience how his mind gets tangled with all kinds of thoughts, desires and experiences and found a way to prevent those tangles from ever arising. He saw that this process is so deep and profound that any living being with mundane thoughts and experiences would never discover this truth. A crude analogy for what the Buddha saw can be given. Imagine someone who is able to catch the photons at the source of light before they even start to travel the path to hit our eyes. He saw that people who are caught by the concepts of sights, sounds, tastes, touches and thoughts are acting way too late and missing the entire process of dependent co-arising at work. Thus, he considered such ability as being fully awake, bodhi, to reality to the extent that one is so alert and able to avert all kinds of disasters by seeing the root and letting go before they have any chance to manifest. One can truly appreciate the situation when one sees for oneself through direct experience how the mind leads to the origination of all phenomena. As one progressively attains all the jhanas and arupas, or the formless bases, the images of all subtle activities of the mind become clearer and sharper. At the stage of neither perception nor non-perception, NPNNP, one can observe directly the mind and mental phenomena arising without any distractions for a long time. If one is attentive enough to see the origination and relaxes the mind right then, one sees immediately how the mental phenomena also cease there and then. This process is amazing to watch during practice through direct experience. How indeed just observing these events without reaction directly leads to unprecedented peace and calm. Now, such experiences may be largely alien to the vast majority of people. Scientists talk a lot about the universe, how it arose 14 billion years ago. They think the universe progressively evolved to give rise to nature, beings, and sentience. They consider, by uncovering the deepest extents of the cosmos on one hand and the most fundamental constituents of the particles that make up the universe, our quest to unravel the nature of reality will be over. They are making progress by discovering things like the origination of the material. Universe may be purely accidental, in that we are lucky to have matter in the universe rather than a complete void in the matter and antimatter game. The universe is the ultimate free lunch, they say. In a similar vein, Alan Guth famously said that all matter we see in the universe is actually a byproduct of cosmic inflation shortly after the Big Bang. There was nothing to start with, but the process of inflation generated all the matter we see around us, which is the ultimate free lunch, the material universe, that came about without actually investing anything in it. Let's assume these are true, and all matter in the universe may have come for free. The fact that we live in a very precarious place where, at any moment, our existence is subject to cosmic conditions like radiations and supernovae does not make this universe an eternally safe place. The Buddha said there is a much more valuable lunch that is absolutely free for everyone. That is, we all have a mind, which, when cultivated, leads us to experience happiness that is totally unconditioned. All dependence of mind and body, like being subjected to cosmic conditions or undergoing biological processes, precipitation of embryos, growth and decay, cease forever. There is a sphere that the mind experiences after being freed from the hooks attached to each sense experience. 
e.g. visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile and mental. This is the sphere of the unconditioned. Therefore, there is no notion of loss or gain of objects craved by eyesight, sounds, loss of hearing, loss of taste, loss of pleasure and pain by the body, and thinking or loss of memory. All the stuff that makes up our world will not be there. In their place, there will be an awareness of peace, a sublime experience, the absence of all activities, just an awareness that is still, not subject to decay and death, pleasure and pain, not subject to any illusory appearance and disappearance, and rise and fall. This is what the Buddha called Nibbana, the ultimate counterpart of the universe with all the miseries we unknowingly create, or the ultimate free lunch. There are many occasions where the Buddha was continually reminding and encouraging people to practice the path. He has shown which show how much he cared to make himself heard. Obviously, he did not present any precondition or return for giving away the secret of how his path does indeed give us the ultimate freedom and happiness that we all strive for in life. Unfortunately, many people are so obsessed with the gratification of sense pleasures that they cannot even imagine that there is something beyond the five physical senses. They fail to realize that there lies our true happiness, the realm of mind free from all concepts and conditions. Even when one is offered a way to realize such things, immediately a few things strike their minds. Is this pleasure and happiness visible here and now to be experienced by all the five senses? I.e., can we enjoy it physically and or mentally? It is a fallacy to even think that such a thing called happiness beyond five senses does exist, and we can experience this happiness. If otherwise, how does this compare with all the sense pleasures we know so well? In the world of fast foods, fast cars, and access to all the luxuries, is this happiness something that can be possessed within a matter of seconds, a few minutes? We cannot afford time for experiencing something that takes long. I recall a simile of a tadpole and a toad by Ajahn Brahm from a while back. He uses this example to convince many of his listeners that there is a kind of happiness called jhana that is beyond the senses. The thing is, it takes a lot of practice and training of the mind to master the jhanas, as he teaches using breath and an object called nimitta, a sign of the mind latching onto an object through deep attention. Nevertheless, his direct experience is helpful in calming the skepticism of the vast majority of people who think that sensual pleasure is the only way to happiness. In this book, I will go into much greater detail on how the mind works while experiencing the happiness of all jhanas and arupas without being hooked into any of these experiences. This is a very important aspect called renunciation of the Buddha's discovery of the ultimate cessation of suffering, Nibbana. He also called it his awakening to the truths, or Bodhi. The awakening of the Buddha was not just about experiencing the bliss of meditation while being totally unaware of what is happening in the present moment. It was about how he awakened to two of the most profound experiences that transcend all logic and reasoning. A. Witnessing the truth of specific conditionality or dependent origination of all phenomena. And B. The state of complete freedom from the universe the stilling of all formations, destruction of all reactions, dispassion, cessation, and nibbana. The process of dependent origination always shows that consciousness is conjoined with nama rupa, mind matter for simplicity, and this is a standard formula almost everyone sees in the Pali texts. When it comes to deeper investigations of the links, we have to make use of a few more statements of the Buddha. The first verse in the Dhammapada states that the mind is the forerunner of all experiences. He puts the mind first and then the whole universe as the secondary experience, i.e. the mind is primary. So it is clear that the mind is the starting point for all our experiences that follow. Most of the time, the mind is in flux and looks for something to interact with. These are experiences and are called mind objects or dhammas in Pali. In particular, the mind interacts with the world due to contact, and mental formations are evident. These are feeling and perception arise due to contact, and they are bound up with the mind. Wait, according to the formula of dependent origination, feeling comes only after contact, doesn't it? Well, phenomena in our experiences do not necessarily follow one after another in a serial manner that we conceptualize so easily. The Buddha called this process Patika Samupada, which may be translated more accurately as conditional concurrent arising of phenomena. 
Dependent origination is a translation used by teachers like Bhikkhu Bodhi and many others when Buddhism spread to the West recently. What the Buddha means here is that a multitude of phenomena arise concurrently when certain conditions are met. The mind interacts with feeling at this stage, which gives rise to perception, i.e., naming or trying to make sense of that very feeling, giving rise to conscious awareness. Only now is the feeling cognized as one of the pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful feelings. Consciousness is what gives rise to a conscious entity or a subject, i.e., the feeler of the feeling, and the object that is being felt is distinguished, or the notion of I or self is established. The coming together of the mind and the mind object that is still a rudimentary feeling gives rise to consciousness, which stamps our identity as the first person. The demarcation of internal and external is established by consciousness, and the contact line is drawn, which, like a membrane, is the boundary where the phenomena are noted to occur. Only at that point does the feeling become established as my feeling to contrast with the object that caused the feeling to arise. Now the mind sees the feeling is caused by an object out there, causing craving or reaction to the feeling to occur. In summary, feeling is a very important link in the process of dependent origination that holds the secret to our suffering and happiness. This is where the whole universe seems to go off tangent and invite more and more suffering by reacting to feelings. Now the Buddha has said that consciousness is dependently arisen and subject to dependent cessation. When that dependence is let go of, consciousness becomes independent as it does not find any support from nama rupa or mind matter. Think of consciousness like a virus. It must have a living body, nama rupa, for it to survive. If it cannot find a nama rupa, it cannot sustain itself. The cessation of consciousness occurs when, during practice, we let go of all dependence of the mind on mind objects. Consciousness and the mind are different things. The mind is one of the six sense bases where consciousness lands. There is a sutta that says the mind in its pure state is luminous and bright. The six consciousnesses are like layers on top of the mind that start to cloud it and also give the illusion as if things manifest. The Buddha called these consciousnesses magicians' tricks, which manifest things for those who are untrained in the Dhamma. Thus, the mind that is no longer attached to the six consciousnesses is radiant all around, sabatopabhama, non-manifestative, anidasanam, and endless, anantam. This state of perfection of the mind from all dependencies is also the pinnacle of wisdom, the complete letting go of all conditioned experiences. The climax of wisdom is experienced by arahants after letting go of all the defilements or fetters of the mind. But we also experience some glimpses of such a mind during twin practice, explained later by the 6R process, relaxing the mind and body. The Kevada Sutta of Diga Nikaya, DN. 11 contains very deep statements by the Buddha about the nature of consciousness that ordinary worldlings are accustomed to and the type of consciousness of an arahant. Consciousness is very much interleaved with our perception of the world and material things. The interrelation between consciousness, vinana, and name and form, nama rupa, is the deepest point in the process of dependent origination, co-arising. This combination is also called a vortex or whirlpool or tangle, vata, where we are stuck from beginningless time. We cognize the form, material form, or four great elements by mentally formulating a name for each characteristic of forms with the help of the six sense consciousnesses. Craving comes into the picture here too, which stitches form and name while ignoring that consciousness identifies them as two. This is not the big craving that we are generally aware of upon reacting to a feeling, but a very subtle reaction to a form that arises as long as sankara or tendencies to react to phenomena, also called formations, arise. They feed more and more craving, as greed, hatred and delusion. Craving continually tilts the balance to give rise to measurements that define things as long and short, big and small, beautiful and ugly. Perception is like a database against which comparisons are made. Concepts and ideas of things arise due to the process, leading to further actions and reactions. When the mind is free from craving, the six consciousnesses also cease, and along with it, the notions of long and short also cease. Consciousness is one of the nutriments for the preservation of living beings, and as long as we have the notion of our identity or belief in solidity, 
the consciousnesses are not freed from their bonds to name and form. The Buddha makes us aware that the state of mind where consciousness is freed from name and form is where the four great elements find no basis. He is not saying that an objective world does not exist at all, but inferring that when the mind is released from consciousnesses established on name and form, the notion of immutable form no longer finds any ground. So the Buddha's answer to the mystery of subject-object existence is, when the six sense consciousnesses cease, all the notions of this duality cease as well. Quantum mechanics has proven this observation to some extent. It supports the idea that matter is a concept that arises only when measurement is made. Until then, it is just a potential. This point was a bit too hard to digest even a few decades ago. Now the ground for such assertions exists in multiple scientific publications. We think that the appearance of forms is actually something really existing and well-defined by space and time. That is why a disciple of the Buddha went as far as the end of the galaxy, called the highest Brahma world in Pali texts, to find where form or the physical elements cease, i.e. if there is any boundary. But as we know now, space and time are not truly existing things independent of sense consciousnesses. They are there as long as we have the mind pulled towards six sense consciousnesses. Cosmologists are now saying that space may actually be infinite, and there may be an infinite number of universes. These kinds of speculations and theories about the universe can go on forever. A wise person does not get involved with such thinking, but makes an effort to directly observe that consciousnesses are just reactions to apparent phenomena and see how they fit within the reality that is made of the impersonal process of dependent co-arising. To make the dependence of consciousness and Namarupa crystal clear, there is a very good example given in a Pali text. This supports my previous example of consciousness being like a virus that needs a body, Nama Rupa, to survive. Well then, friend, I will make up a simile for you. For some intelligent people here understand the meaning of a statement by means of a simile. Just as two sheaves of reeds might stand leaning against each other, so too with name and form as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, name and form comes to be. With name and form as condition, the six sense bases come to be. With the six sense bases as condition, contact. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. If, friend, one was to remove one of those sheaves of reeds, the other would fall, and if one were to remove the other sheaf, the first would fall. So too, with the cessation of name and form, comes cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, comes cessation of name and form. With the cessation of name and form comes cessation of the six sense bases. With the cessation of the six sense bases, cessation of contact. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Samyutta Nikaya 1267, The Sheaves of Reeds When dependence falls apart, it is not a state of annihilation. It is called the cessation of the dependent arising of all phenomena. This is a state where the cycle by which consciousness lands into Nama Rupa or a host body stops, causing a discontinuity in the entire rebirth cycle. Now does this mean the extinction of the existence of our true self and the loss of our essence as beings? The Buddha says, if we identify ourselves as a combination of body, feeling, perception, formations and consciousness, then we lament and suffer the loss. If we don't, the whole notion of suffering goes away. All that ceases is the entire notion of suffering and there is no lamenting about losing these experiences in the same way we do not lament if someone burns leaves and twigs from a forest, knowing they are clearly not us. Continuing on this topic of dependency, I shall add some more analytical comments. Bhikkhu Nanananda's book, Nyanananda, The Law of Dependent Arising, The Secret of Bondage and Release, 2016, is very illuminating in explaining these terms. He provides excellent examples to clarify the concepts. Namarupa is said to be born right at our first interaction with material forms. Nama consists of feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. These factors give us a notion of the characteristics and perception of form as hard, soft, hot, cold, etc. This is how a nondescript object becomes descript, i.e., we have a concept of a form. 
However, a form is not something that is a truly existing reality, independent of consciousness and nama parts. Physicists, until the advent of quantum physics, used to consider form just a bunch of atoms. Like a building consisting of a lot of Lego blocks, they asserted that atoms are indivisible, indestructible entities that define physical reality, while the mind has no effect on their existence whatsoever. This absolutism of atomic theory is proven to be untenable now, as new discoveries reveal that subatomic particles, such as electrons and photons, do not have a definite location until a sentient observer measures their state, e.g. location, amount of energy, etc. These particles are potentially anywhere, and they can do weird things, like appearing simultaneously in multiple places, or penetrating through barriers, Al-Khalili, 2019. So effectively, both Nama and Rupa are not material in the strictest sense. They can be called just a form of energy. I am quoting below from Nanananda's book on dependent arising. Name in name and form is formal name. Form in name and form is nominal form. So reality is not made up of two completely separate worlds of mind and matter, as propounded by Descartes and many recent physicists. Our interaction plays a significant role. We can cognize a form with the help of Nama constituents and sense consciousness as the condition. Consciousness and Nama Rupa are contingent on each other, like two sides of a roof leaning to support each other. Consciousness conditions Nama Rupa, and Nama Rupa conditions consciousness. We pull one, and the other one falls immediately. Our perception of the world is sustained by this duality between the two and runs like a self sustaining engine that seems to run as long as the two balance each other perfectly. All it needed was a spark to set off the engine, and the fuel never runs out until we discover the cause that instigates the two. Like a dog looking at water because it thinks it sees another dog, but actually because it looks, it sees a dog. Consciousnesses are like that, they reflect Namarupa and vice versa. This happens so fast that we don't notice the interplay until we train the mind to see these subtle things at a pace the mind can discern more clearly. The last component in Nama is Manasikara, or attention. It should be translated as the mind's act or trickery. When attention is replaced by attention rooted in wisdom, or Yoniso Manasikara, the play of the mind is exposed. We can break the dependence by simply letting go of attention to consciousness and Nama Rupa. All that is needed is to step out of the way. In the very late stages of meditation, there is a state where the bonds of the mind and mind objects start to weaken. We directly know that a light hint of craving sustains this process. Letting go of craving or any curiosity towards all phenomena will ultimately help us in this process. When our senses first interact with a form, either through the eye, ear, or other senses, the first thing that occurs is that a corresponding consciousness arises. The eye, ear, etc. are platforms for this interplay or bases for sense contacts. Consciousness always seems to be conjoined with the feeling and perception of Nama Rupa. They are latched up like male and female connectors. This is probably the greatest mystery of our existence, as they always arise and cease together. How can feeling arise before contact when we read from the Pali texts that feeling arises due to contact. Perhaps we should not take each phenomenon as linear, following one after another chronologically. The only thing latent in our propensity in this whole process of dependent origination is craving. In dependent co-arising, each causal arising is concurrent, so many things can happen at the same time. For example, sense bases that are platforms for Nama Rupa, and contact can arise at the same time that feeling arises too. Whatever we discuss here and try to make sense of intellectually will not help much. So directly seeing these processes is essential. Seeing a demo in our minds through practice will answer all our questions. I will go into much detail on this in later chapters. As one continues to observe the mind by repeatedly tranquilizing the body and mind processes while keeping attention on all arising and ceasing phenomena, mind objects, all perceptions of forms appear gross and cause tightness in the mind. So the Buddha's instruction is not to pay attention to the gross perception of forms and shift the mind's attention to subtler perceptions. That is, the perception of mind and mind objects. In the first four jhana stages, the mind attends to the body and feelings as some signs of forms to eventually arrive at the fourth jhana, where even pleasure and pain become gross for the mind. 
These mental states are also called formless realms or arupas. They are characterized by the gradual emptiness of any color, shapes, or forms. The mind can remain observant of any thoughts that arise and pass away while steadying its attention to mind objects, like perception and feelings and experiences that are pertinent to the basis of the mind. These are the arising and passing away of awareness of space and consciousness at all six sense doors. There are only six consciousnesses occurring at six sense contacts. Nothing more. There is no room for mysticism. And there is nothing very special about mind consciousness, apart from the five other body sense consciousnesses as far as the process of dependent origination is concerned. In fact, Majima Nikaya, MEN 38, spells this out plainly with a simile of six kinds of fires, each burning in dependence on a certain substance like wood or chaff. Mind consciousness is not more reliable than the other five, so we should not cling to it or consider it as more powerful or weak. If anyone conceives of consciousness as synonymous with ultimate self-awareness, then they need to read what the Buddha says in Majjhima Nikaya 38. Only by experiencing the mind devoid of any craving or other defilements, which can be witnessed through the continuous meditation practice of Tuimam, can the mystery of consciousness be fully known. Another way to look at consciousness is that it is one of the five aggregates which may or may not be affected by our tendencies to latch on. Suffering arises when they are identified as belonging to us. The Buddha's advice is always to remain free and disidentified with the five aggregates. There are more than 200 suttas on the five aggregates in the Samyutta Nikaya, SN, section 22 on five aggregates. For example, SN 2295, a lump of foam. SN 22.238, the simile of the vipers. SN 22.85, Yamaka true meaning of which go very deep to be completely disenchanted and be free of all dependence on all conditioned consciousness. One who sees consciousness as part of the impersonal process of dependent origination understands what they really are. This is more than general awareness without any notion involved. Dependent origination has to be understood holistically and seen in real time by one's experiences through practice. A very sharp lens of mindfulness within the practice consisting of the entire eightfold path is needed to fulfill this goal. The practice of TWIM consists of letting go of craving for all phenomena of dependent origination, which involves weakening our attention to unwholesome intentions and bringing in wholesome ones instead. In Pali texts, this process is called Samavayama or right effort. The TWIM practice I am uncovering throughout this book is mindfulness of loving-kindness through right effort. Vimalaramsi B, 2015. Here I explore the journey of the Noble Eightfold Path by keeping my mind free of the unwholesome, by letting go of all distractions while arousing the feeling of loving kindness as much as possible. It may surprise many, but using this practice can progress one from an untrained mind to experience all the way from the first jhana to the fourth jhana in just few days. After the fourth jhana, the practice of mindfulness of loving kindness turns into that of compassion, joy, and equanimity, also called Brahma-vihara. They lead to formless or arupa experiences of the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, and the base of nothingness, respectively. After having experienced enough of them and letting them go, one progresses to an experience called the base of neither perception nor non-perception. In summary, there are four jhanas and four formless bases in the domain of the Buddha's path of meditative experiences. The arupas are called the peaceful abiding by the Buddha. They are called so because one experiencing these bases enjoys heightened equanimity to all daily experiences that we otherwise would have reacted to forcefully. One's reactions to phenomena become much calmer by abiding in these bases. It feels as if we have become less burdened with perceptions and notions to experience the progressive stages of peaceful voidness. Personally, I like to give an example of this process by comparing the universe with stars and galaxies with the phenomenon of redshift. I found some images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey attempting to map the universe. This is based on repeated observations of the cosmos in the night sky to reveal that the farther one explores, the busier the cosmos looks, revealing that supreme voidness at the point of origin where peace and calm are abundant. A similar observation can also be made about the mind. 
as I practiced the path of experiencing all tranquil, aware jhanas, I felt that the movement of the mind gradually becomes less and less, and eventually comes to a standstill, as if looking back instead of looking far ahead in the cosmos. When I sat experiencing the base of nothingness, I recall the exquisite calm and composure of mind. I could see the mind quieting so much that I could see how far it came all the way from the universe that I left behind. The picture of Redshift reminds me of that experience. It is as if I was at the observatory capturing all the distant stars and galaxies where their lights are more redshifted the farther away they are. There was a stillness and peace and moments of relief like never before from where I observed. Figure 1 being an observer of the universe and a point of complete stillness. The state of mind and mindfulness of phenomena can be compared to such a process too. The state of stillness and calm after letting go of disturbances is not nothing and cannot be called absolute voidness. Bhante Vimalaramsi, my meditation teacher, used to say it is just nice to be in those quiet states. That is what I say too, just exquisite peace and calm. The practice leads one to find greater peace and freedom from reactions with each step on the Buddha's path. Voidness is a relative term, which can be stated only in the presence of other states. We can say a glass is empty or void, but by empty we are referring to it being empty of water, not of everything. The Buddha says that as one progressively refines mindfulness by letting go of grosser disturbances, this can be progressing to higher jhanas or letting go of craving arising at the connection of dependent origination, the mind descends into greater voidness. It can be experienced by witnessing the lightness and relief from letting go of burdens at different stages that we never knew were there before. As we go further, the relief also becomes greater and more sublime. In the words of the Buddha, he often abided in voidness. It is not an absolute state that is isolated from all other phenomena. At each stage of descent into voidness, there are two sides. One side is peaceful and quiet, with much of the grosser activities subsided, and on the other side, there are still activities of the mind that can be seen retrospectively. Complete voidness is what the Buddha refers to as the state of Nibbana. Even the cessation of perception and feeling is not completely void, as there are still some disturbances connected with life and the sense bases. The descent into complete voidness is another way of arriving at the unconditioned so one should continue until there is nothing more to let go of. This is what the Buddha said about the process of letting go and abandoning all perceptions to arrive at the state of the unconditioned. I will explain the Buddha's words on these states in later chapters of this book, drawing from my direct experiences to uncover as many insights as possible. Voidness is also a term that modern scientists are discovering, but they find it hard to define in an absolute sense. For example, they thought that empty space was completely void. But this assertion is no longer valid now, given the recent discovery of dark matter and dark energy. The realm of subatomic particles and the near-mystical nature of quantum entanglement add more questions to the notion of the solidity of matter in explaining their reality. In the next part, I will explore what is out there in the scientific community to plug gaps in our understanding, and if there is an end to the pursuit, that seems to ask more and more questions with recent discoveries. Part 1. On Science, Consciousness and Mind This part of the book aims to bridge some gap between concepts, theories and philosophies and the direct experience of introspection of mind. The idea emerged from recognizing a disconnect in public understanding of how science, consciousness and the Buddha's Dhamma are interconnected. While books by authors like B. Alan Wallace, the Dalai Lama and Mathieu Ricard bring science and Buddhism closer, they often don't delve deeply into the meditative experiences of jhanas, arupas and nirodha, which the historical Buddha emphasized as paths to end suffering. I address this gap by first exploring key developments in physics and cosmology, covering topics like particle physics, quantum mechanics and general relativity. I summarize the challenges faced by physicists and argue for a broader perspective that includes human experiences. While science has made strides in understanding natural phenomena, I critique the overreach of some scientists who claim it can explain all realities, including consciousness. I challenge extreme physicalist views and emphasize that the mind's direct experience exists in a separate domain. I acknowledge the progress made by alternative theories 
such as biocentrism and conscious agents theory, which challenge established notions of space, time, and matter. Without endorsing these views, I present a direct experiential approach to the mind-body problem and the observation of dependent arising of all phenomena. The interdependence of phenomena affects how we experience and interact with the world. I argue that by letting go of rigid notions, theories, concepts, and adopting a relaxed attitude and attentiveness towards minute experiences of mind, we can free ourselves from suffering. Observing the purified mind reveals that the universe is ultimately our own fabrication, offering a path to deeper understanding and liberation. Chapter 3. Flaws in Materialist Explanations of Human Experience In December 2023, I recorded a talk on all the meditative experiences that the Buddha describes in the Majjhima Nikaya 111, using Sariputta's direct experiences as a reference. I explored all the stages of purification of the mind, leading to a state where the mind remains completely independent. As all dependencies fall away, the mind finds no support, eventually diving into the state of cessation. I discussed how we can achieve these experiences through the combined practice of Samatha and Vipassana methods. I recognize that there are many preliminaries necessary to convince readers of the Buddha's path. It is particularly challenging to convince scientific communities about the nature of the mind and how it relates to the world of sense experiences and groundbreaking discoveries. In parts two and three, I will provide practical methods and delve deeper into the subject matter. Please bear with me if some texts in this part do not immediately make sense. Here I step outside the territory of the Buddha's Dhamma teachings to explore alternative worldviews, philosophies, and scientific explorations that attempt to answer questions about reality and the nature of our experiences. When discussing reality, it boils down to whether there is truly one way to arrive at a conclusion regarding the truth. Many argue that a rigorous scientific inquiry into the nature of reality is crucial, but does it lead to undeniable truths or more speculation and mental proliferation? Is there an end to this? These are the questions I am addressing here. I aim to bring forward perspectives on reconciling seemingly contradictory views of the world, from purely materialistic or hard physicalistic perspectives to philosophical, spiritual and direct experiential perspectives. It's about finding the truth directly and whether we can arrive at a conclusion through any of these paths. I will gradually delve into various topics, starting with scientific fields like physics and cosmology, and then exploring recent developments by modern thinkers, philosophers, and scientists who challenge traditional views that hard science is the ultimate tool to uncover the truth. I will discuss figures like Sir Martin Rees, who hosted a popular documentary series on UK television called What We Still Don't Know. It's a thought-provoking series where he asks some fundamental questions. I will also explore the views of recent scientific explorers like Max Tegmark and Sean Carroll and delve into the work of other scientists challenging the extreme physical, materialistic worldview. Specifically, I will cover Professor Donald Hoffman's work on the theory of consciousness and his theory that consciousness may be more fundamental than space, time, or matter. I will also consider the views of philosophers, scientists, like Bernardo Kastrup, whose analytical idealism has made a good impression on me. These thinkers are getting closer to understanding the root of our mind-body mechanism and the nature of reality. It's quite a busy agenda, and I hope to cover these topics in an accessible and understandable manner. I will blend my direct experiential understanding with these scientific and philosophical insights. I have a background in understanding scientific concepts, physical phenomena, and the properties of matter, space, and time, and how they relate to our current day technologies. Though I have a good understanding of technologies, recently I have started to question where we draw the line in this never ending quest, seeking inventions and discoveries. Are these discoveries making us happier? Science progresses through contributions in scientific journals and conferences, often offering minor improvements. While some researchers make groundbreaking discoveries, most scientific research focuses on tweaking existing methods, techniques, and technologies. Only a few scientists challenge established notions around space-time, our perception of reality, and the nature of consciousness, and make discoveries that shake the wider community. Until the last century, we had an established worldview of space-time from Newton, which Einstein later challenged with his theory of relativity. 
Now, the foundation of Einstein's general relativity is being questioned, and it may be time to explore beyond the domain of space-time into a higher realm. It's debatable whether the discovery of a universal consciousness or mind will solve the problem of our reality. But it is interesting to explore these ideas and see how they intersect with direct experiential reality. I have spent the last eight to nine years meditating and exploring the dimensions of direct experience of the mind and its relation to questions about the nature of reality. By letting go of personal emotions, ideas on space-time, form, perceptions, and even consciousness, we can witness the root of all mental proliferation. I will insert these perspectives throughout the exploration. In 2004, a documentary series called What We Still Don't Know appeared on Channel 4 in the UK, hosted by Sir Martin Rees from Cambridge University. The series asks profound questions like, are we alone in the universe? Why are we here? And are we real? It challenges traditional views and explores new perspectives from various scholars, scientists, and explorers. The series supports the idea that science, based on proven methods, is the most credible path to understanding reality. It compares modern scientific discoveries to ancient philosophical and spiritual approaches, suggesting that science is more advanced in answering fundamental questions. However, it is important to understand that ancient models, like the four great elements in Eastern traditions, are not primitive notions. These elements represent properties of our experiences, solidity, cohesion, heat, and movement. They are not about constituents of matter, but about how we perceive and interact with the material world. The four-element model provides a fundamental framework for understanding our experiences. Modern science, with its discovery of elements and subatomic particles, builds on a reductionism-based framework. However, the complexity of material interactions does not necessarily explain consciousness. Matter and consciousness are different domains, and assuming that scientific exploration can answer all questions about reality is too simplistic. In summary, while science has made significant progress, it may not be able to answer all questions about our reality, especially those intrinsically related to the mind and consciousness. A broader perspective that includes direct experiential understanding and alternative worldviews may provide a more comprehensive understanding of our experiences and the nature of reality. It's not just my view, it's becoming more apparent that many physicists are hitting a dead end with such a rigid materialistic perspective. They are trying to prove that they can build consciousness out of machines or computers using intricate circuitry of digital switches working with electrons. They claim that by building trillions of transistors on a chip, they can create consciousness and that this can answer all questions about consciousness, the mind, and our experiences. Science has had more than a hundred years to make this project a reality, but building consciousness from matter has not been successful in any experiment ever conducted. It's humbling to see the efforts of numerous brilliant minds to support a theory that consciousness is just a property of matter, which may soon be lost to oblivion. Well, let's not refute each other's ideas, doctrines, and concepts. The reality is that there are many unanswered questions. Despite many failures, the line of thinking that ignores deeper mind and matter interactions is also becoming a norm, fueling humanity's general direction. The survival of the human race seems guided by these notions. Explorations to keep our activities going, to keep our egos flourishing, and to sustain our self-images. This is often justified by claiming we are making progress and coming closer to reality. That's what scientists and philosophers like to be touted as, foremost explorers at the cutting edge who have been beacons of hope for humanity. I'm not refuting or saying that is the wrong path or that we shouldn't pursue it. But if we take a step back and see where we get caught, on the path, at what point we went too far, where is our boundary? Where in this process of our mind we went beyond our boundaries? I will go through in detail the process of mental proliferation and our direct experiential understanding through the observation of all mental phenomena. It's where we perhaps have gone far, diving into a never-ending loop of conceptual proliferation, and where our ultimate safety and well-being lie. Solution for this issue is not found in the realm of science. There are realms or states of mind where all mental proliferations and notions come to a complete halt and stop for some time. With the practice of taming the mind, we arrive at a state of complete peace, 
calm and composure, an experience devoid of all sorts of concepts and notions. That is also the state of complete voidness, a state of not being conditioned. Letting go of all conditioning, there is a process, a very well-defined process, that takes us back to the origin where we can directly see that there is utmost peace, tranquility, safety and complete freedom from the universe. That's the dimension I am keen to explore while discussing these scientific explorations and the famous mind-body problem. The mind-body problem has been bothering humanity for hundreds of years, and it is, as most scientists and philosophers realize, the crux of all our dissatisfaction and suffering. Our dissatisfaction with whatever we are experiencing, all this suffering, is rooted in the mind-body process. We need to go beyond philosophy to unravel the process. What is this reality? Where is that dimension where we get completely disentangled? Where is that state of freedom? These, in my view, are the ultimate questions linked to the mind-body problem. We might explore theories around this and find some new solutions to answer, whether it is the body or the mind that is more fundamental, or vice versa. While that may keep us investigating the problem, we might only be trying to satisfy our curiosity. So we may be trying to solve the problem in a fundamentally wrong manner. In my view and experience, this mind-body problem boils down to where we went off tangent and veered away from the present moment. It is just realms of concepts and a jungle of conceptual proliferation. This is the perspective I have. It's not merely a view, but a perspective from direct experience through meditative practice. As I mentioned earlier, this documentary goes into many key discoveries in science that were made to unravel the mysteries of subatomic particles all the way down to the very basic levels when scientists reduced atoms and molecules to the most fundamental level. That line of inquiry has recently hit a dead end. When scientists smashed subatomic particles in a large hadron collider, they were hoping to find even more fundamental entities that constitute subatomic particles. What happened is that when these scientists broke these subatomic particles and tried to analyze what lies beyond, they ran into a massive problem. They could not characterize all these phenomena of subatomic particles breaking down into more fundamental constituents. They found these particles do not adhere to the rules we are generally accustomed to in terms of the usual notions of locality and unitarity. Al Khalili, 2019. I will not go too much into these properties. So, locality means say we have some matter, and if we bring them together, they interact only if they come into close contact with each other. That is the notion of locality. For example, this hand can only affect the other hand if they come close to each other. So they say this whole universe is guided by this rule of locality. We can press a button, and only after activating that button does whatever function and movement get activated. Say we want to open a door, we have to press that button. So it needs close interaction. We cannot press a button here and make something in the Andromeda galaxy be controlled. So it has to be local. This is a fundamental property of physics. Another property of physics is unitarity, which states that if we break a particle into pieces, the constituents of that process, when added together, become the whole. For example, if we have a whole apple and break it down, all those pieces must come together to make up that whole. I have provided very simple examples for unitarity. This property states that any physical matter, including phenomena, must adhere to it. This is the foundation of physics and the basis of the entire universe, according to materialists and proponents of physicalism. However, when matter is broken down into subatomic levels, e.g. in large hadron colliders, at the smallest known particle level, suddenly these particles completely disregard all such notions. They do not adhere to them. These particles do not follow the rules of locality and unitarity, meaning they do not necessarily interact only when they are close and the constituents do not necessarily come together to form a whole. Interestingly, if a particle is broken into two, they become entangled. Therefore, if they are entangled, we know they are correlated. They remain correlated no matter how far apart they are placed. What scientists have found is that when these particles are smashed and sent, say for example, one particle to the Andromeda galaxy, and another to another galaxy, no matter how far apart they are, they remain entangled. This means they are dependent on each other. This is a ghost-like notion that physics cannot yet answer because it does not fall within the realm of traditional physics. 
it completely violates the locality principle. This is why I'm saying physics may have hit a dead end in this regard. As far as I know, particle physics doesn't know where to go next and what is the way out of all this confusion. There are also some fantastic theories about these subatomic particles. One theory suggests that they are not small constituents, but rather vibrating strings. Green, 2011. String theory has been in the limelight and has garnered significant attention over the last 20-30 years. However, recently, string theory may also have hit a dead end. It is not progressing. The theory speculates that we do not observe these particles because they exist beyond the four-dimensional space-time of our physical world. These constituents may exist in higher dimensions, proposing a theory of an 11-dimensional hyperspace. This is what string theory mathematically suggests. It remains speculative because current physics lacks the means to explore vibrating strings that operate on a scale of 10 to 35 meters and lower. This scale is incredibly small, and it is unlikely that scientific instruments will detect anything at this scale anytime soon. Anyone looking at these theories for empirical evidence through experiments does not buy such claims. They find these theories untenable because we can only construct them as models and concepts. Both these notions and concepts are akin to theories of divine experiences transcending ours into higher dimensions of divinity. We can categorize them similarly due to their lack of practical support. Without empirical evidence to justify and demonstrate them through means, they are as speculative as those hypothetical notions that lack grounding in reality. This is why we don't hear much about string theory nowadays, and I can appreciate why it hasn't gained wider public attention. It's essentially a non-starter, if I may say so. On the other hand, let's now explore another dimension of our experiences beyond a planet like Earth, or any small planet. Scientists have made significant progress in discovering galaxies and clusters of galaxies extending beyond the visible universe. These discoveries have led us to ponder whether this universe is static or evolving. As we delve into what is out there, I have explored an overview of what exists on the smallest possible scale. Now let me go beyond. The groundbreaking work on stars and galaxies, done by Edwin Hubble, revealed that these galaxies aren't static objects as previously thought. What he discovered is that when he measured a galaxy one day, and then the same galaxy the next, he observed that the galaxy had moved significantly farther away, some at speeds exceeding that of light. He then mapped all these galaxies and identified a pattern. Galaxies further from us move faster. His conclusion was that the universe is expanding. Thus, we do not inhabit a static universe where moons, stars and galaxies are fixed in space-time positions. This discovery prompted all scientific explorers to revisit their foundational assumptions. Until then, a very static notion prevailed, where particles and matter somewhat remained unchanged in their constitution until they decayed completely. Then, suddenly, the discovery of an expanding universe and galaxies moving away captured the imagination of scientists, leading them to rethink their basic premises. They began to investigate what causes galaxies and stars to move away from each other. This raised questions about Einstein's general theory of relativity and its implications for an expanding universe. Einstein had to introduce a constant to maintain a static universe, a tiny number 10 to 52 square meters, which he added to his equations. Although his original equations hinted at a dynamic universe, he opted for conservatism to avoid discord within the scientific community. Consequently, he introduced so-called a cosmological constant. Edwin Hubble's discovery abruptly reset our worldview prompting us to start afresh. Why can't the universe be static? If it's expanding, what is the fate of our universe? This uncertainty has left us in a confused state. If the universe is in motion, what occupies this empty space? It can't just be planets, stars, and galaxies. They occupy very little space in the universe. What does this void of space consist of? Scientists were compelled to introduce the concept of dark matter to address this gap because it's immeasurable, invisible, and beyond exploration. We have no means of directly interacting with this entity. It remains a concept, hence the term dark matter, a placeholder to fill the void we struggle to understand. Dark matter doesn't seem to adhere to any rules of physics that prove its existence. 
there have been inferences about what this dark matter might be in terms of phenomena. Some scientists have used the laws of general relativity to argue that when they don't observe a star in its expected location and instead see it slightly distorted, it must be due to something bending space-time, concluding that this distortion is caused by dark matter. This theory remains the predominant explanation for dark matter. This raises intriguing philosophical questions. If these phenomena extend beyond our imagination, beyond our frameworks of the universe, galaxies, stars, and all matter, do they truly exist as immutable objects independent of our perceptions? This leads us to question whether all these complex theories ultimately boil down to what we perceive. Are we truly living in an existing universe, or is it all just imagination? We lack certainty about whether we live in a confined and well-defined universe, especially when we consider what lies beyond 13 billion light-years away. Beyond our known universe lies the cosmos, another construct of imagination. This challenges the very concept of space-time, which exists only within our perceptual framework. Attempting to isolate space-time, universe and cosmos from our experiences yields no meaning. Scientific measurements are inventions to test assumptions and observations, but without someone to perceive and experience them, concepts like space-time and matter lose their grounding. Even the most extreme phenomena, such as the Big Bang and supernovae, are merely concepts sustained by our imagination. By labeling them in our perception, we create the illusion of existing objects occupying specific locations in the universe. We cannot definitively say that there is a boundary to our universe beyond what we can observe. Even when contemplating the vastness of the heavens and cosmology, these concepts struggle to maintain credibility. Schrodinger's equations have shown that matter and space-time are potentials until measurements are taken. They lack inherent solid properties that define their existence as tangible realities. Mathematics and theories serve as tools to shape our imagination until they can be refined by direct experience and correction. Therefore, I won't delve further into this topic. I believe it's a significant discovery that we're finding there are trillions of other galaxies like our Milky Way. We keep uncovering more and more data to fuel our imagination. That's all I'm going to say on that. Now let's delve into the question of reality. I'm now touching on the second documentary, Are We Real? As the name suggests, this is unsettling for some people and scientists who believe in permanence. If we can't define subatomic particles, and if we can't definitively define those large objects in the universe as persisting and objectively true entities, then what is our reality? Are our perceptions revealing a truth different from what's really out there? Are we perceiving reality as it is, or is our perceived reality just imagination? This is what this documentary aims to explore. Sir Martin Rees, coming from a fundamentally physicalist worldview, marvels at how entities like us, fundamentally composed of atoms and molecules, can ponder and contemplate these same atoms and molecules. He suggests that we are nothing more than collections of atoms and molecules, which due to their intricate and unimaginably complex nature, have developed the ability to think, ponder, talk, and conceptualize, all through the complex arrangements of these atoms and molecules. This is his proposal regarding the power inherent in such molecular complexity. However, modern scientists like Professor Donald Hoffman and Bernardo Kastrup would vehemently refute such premature notions. They find this perspective laughable and even ludicrous in light of recent advancements. Reducing our existence and living experiences to mere collections of molecules and atoms is absurd. Such an approach attempts to characterize experiences in terms of quantities or physical properties, akin to trying to define the universe solely in square feet, square miles, kilograms, and atomic structures. Physicalists attempt to equate the richness of our experiential universe to such primitive parameters, but this approach simply fails to capture the reality, the intricate experiential nature of reality that we perceive. It's like trying to represent our experiences with a two-dimensional image, showing a picture of a tiger and claiming that picture is the tiger itself. With such assertions, scientists have become somewhat dogmatic, exerting their authority excessively. Since they hold the authoritative position in the realm of science, they may feel they can hold all reasoning about experiences hostage to their own perspectives. However, new ways of critical thinking and a growing audience are challenging this. 
I understand that challenging established notions may not be well received and could be seen as too radical. Nevertheless, the tide is turning, and increasingly more people are asserting that these rigid physicalist notions fail to adequately explain all experiences. The documentary also presents an interesting perspective on life through experiments conducted by Professor Conway from Princeton University. A mathematician, he demonstrated that many behaviors mimicking life can be simulated using simple rules. He developed a mathematical model called the game of life, where placing just two or three dots and applying basic rules. Dots that remain too close suffocate and die, too far apart die from isolation, and those at the right distance mate and reproduce, can generate very complex organism-like creatures capable of movement and growth. This demonstrates that structured dynamism and complex manipulations of matter based on simple rules can mimic living behaviors. While these examples are intriguing and initially compelling, I fail to see how they can answer the complexities of our subjective experiences, awareness, and the realm of qualia. These attempts to demonstrate that life can emerge from matter simply by assembling atoms and molecules in a laboratory raise many questions. They suggest that one day we might create life from inanimate matter, atoms and molecules coming together to crawl and communicate with us. It's captivating and appeals to communities that value advancements in physical discoveries and exploration, but it paints an incomplete picture. In my view, these ideas venture into realms where we lack the means to fully comprehend reality. We cannot reduce subjective experiences to molecules and atoms. They belong to entirely separate domains. Are they correlated? Yes, but correlation does not imply creation. We may influence experiences through matter, but experiences themselves reside in the realm of the mind, a domain distinct from matter. While promoting only materialistic propositions and concepts, this documentary dismisses other ideas, such as the anthropic principle, as too speculative. The anthropic principle suggests that our experiences arise from our interactions as humans, not from an objective reality that must define all our experiences. This perspective was considered too simplistic, as it is not supported by theories that can be tested. In this regard, Sean Carroll's latest work goes some way toward reconciling key tenets of physicalism with human experiences and the concept of purpose in life. Carroll, 2016. My aim is to capture these concepts and notions of reality, not just through scientific theories, philosophies, or speculations, but grounded in practical experiences and direct observations of the mind. But before that, I delve into some more interesting notions that are bubbling up recently within the communities of scientists and explorers. Chapter 4 on theories supporting the role of conscious entities. Having reviewed the shortcomings of materialism in capturing reality, where does this leave us? This is a realm where everyone aspires to lead and discover new insights to prove superiority. Materialist scientists have had ample opportunities to showcase their theories by attempting to generate life from inanimate matter. However, this approach did not sit well with communities that began to consider the reverse perspective. They argue that life and living beings, experiencing physics and phenomena, take precedence. Biological processes, compositions and living entities shape the universe as it is, a viewpoint contrasting to the materialist stance. This dichotomy resembles the opposing poles of North and South. Momentum within scientific communities has been growing where some assert, forget about physics and matter, it's biology that shapes the universe. Creatures like us, with our biological processes and metabolism, define the universe's existence. These are the views of proponents supporting the anthropic principle and biocentrism, Lanza and Berman, 2009. They prioritize biology, relegating matter and its phenomena to secondary byproducts of our engagement with them. However, this thinking stretches beyond reasonable observation making exaggerated claims about the significance of biological processes in shaping reality. Their argument posits that all these universes exist and are perfectly suited for life. For instance, the temperature is just right for our survival, and other physical properties such as planet size and gravity are conducive to biology. If gravity were slightly different by a fraction, galaxies might not have formed or could have collapsed, rendering life impossible. 
According to biocentrism, the universe is guided and governed by our existence, not the other way around. This theory outlines seven principles, which I'll delve into in more detail later. While I won't delve into endorsing their theories and speculations, I'll contribute direct experiential insights to the mystery of life, providing substance to biocentrism. However, biology cannot be considered ultimate or even close to primary in defining all experiences, as it doesn't explain why they occur. Experiences originate from the mind, not from biology. Biology serves as a scaffold, providing basic support for life's activities. It doesn't adhere strictly to atomic molecular structures like Lego blocks or mechanistic formulas used in factories to produce goods. Biology operates under the laws of nature, possessing a degree of autonomy. This autonomy allows it to evolve without requiring inputs from countless external sources. Imagine a building constructed from millions of bricks and concrete. Biology isn't assembled in such a mechanistic fashion. Objects in the material universe compose biological creatures, yet they do not adhere strictly to mechanistic rules like musical notes. They exhibit a degree of autonomy. They grow organically, maintaining independence within the boundaries of living creatures to evolve into human-like existences naturally. This summary encapsulates the two thought-provoking documentaries aired on Channel 4, addressing profound questions of our time. What we still don't know. Whether we are real and why we are here. Regarding the third question, are we alone in the universe? It would be presumptuous to think that we are the only intelligent beings in the universe given the probability, the recent data on exoplanets, and moreover, even ancient texts suggest otherwise. These observations might lead some to conclude, if we can't control things or manufacture living creatures or experiences, science must be failing. Science, viewed as a success story for over hundreds of years of striving to simplify life through discovery, faces challenges. Despite scientists' efforts, consciousness remains unsolved. They've been unable to create consciousness from inanimate matter, leading some to assert that they were fundamentally mistaken for not heeding God's wisdom. According to the intelligent design theory, the creation of human and animal experiences isn't attributable to science, but to a divine creator. Such theory posits that a supreme being infuses consciousness into our experiences, intertwining consciousness with feelings and perceptions. Proponents argue that science is misguided and that true reality lies elsewhere, beyond our current understanding. The complexity of the universe suggests a grand cosmic mind is at work, harmoniously synchronizing all beings. This harmony can only stem from a grand framework, a vast network sustaining life. This perspective asserts that we merely play roles in a virtual reality-like game where actions are predetermined, akin to being remote-controlled in a simulation. These codes dictate our speech, our sensory experiences, all pre-programmed by a divine intelligence. Such views underpin the concept of a god or supreme being, transcending biological phenomena to address a complexity beyond conventional scientific understanding. These arguments can become excessively speculative when individuals become too enamored with concepts and ideas. Rather than getting caught up in these thoughts, I prefer to step back and adopt an objective perspective. Regardless of the theories, methodologies, or personal investments in them, people often embrace them as their own inventions, promoting their brands and striving for recognition. They state claims saying, I've developed this theory of consciousness. See how superior it is. I've achieved what others couldn't, surpassing superficial ideas to reveal reality. This competitive spirit drives scientific inquiry, fostering criticism to refine and improve theories, inching closer to a comprehensive understanding of reality in small incremental steps. This is the essence of science, objective and non-subjective, capable of authoritatively answering reality. Science has earned immense credibility viewing mathematical equations, experiments, and observations as the tools to unlock mysteries and comprehend the experiences we seek to understand. However, it becomes evident that science has its limitations when grappling with our subjective experiences. This isn't to diminish its progress in unveiling hidden patterns in nature, rationalizing processes, and formulating testable algorithms and mechanisms for validation. 
Science remains the go-to discipline for uncovering truths about the behaviors of subatomic particles and natural phenomena, an approach unparalleled by spiritual traditions or other speculative realms. Thus, the success of science has garnered much acclaim. It is deemed the sole vehicle capable of debunking dogma or beliefs steeped in subjectivity or ambiguity. It endeavors to eliminate ambiguity, presenting an indisputable reality that science alone can unearth. Yet perhaps science has been overly credited, assuming it can resolve the most challenging mysteries of our experiences. Scientists, by describing nature through mathematical equations, experiments and observations, aim to capture and explain all facets of understanding. However, this approach appears to falter in addressing such complexities, revealing the limits of science in understanding our subjective experiences. This conclusion was highlighted in 2023 when the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Anton Zeilinger, Alain Aspect, and J. N. Clauser. Their work demonstrated that the notion of locality, integral to Newtonian and Einsteinian physics, is fundamentally untenable. Locality collapses when applied to subatomic quantum processes. Roger, 2009. Particles, entangled across vast distances, defy locality's principles by instantaneously influencing each other's states. This discovery, tested experimentally over distances exceeding 100 miles across two islands in Europe, revealed that these particles disregard spatial and temporal boundaries. The traditional concept of particles occupying specific geographic locations is inherently flawed. So they are dependent, though I would hesitate to use the term dependent origination. This arises and simultaneously this arises. This is Paticca Samupada. So with the arising of this, this arises. With the ceasing of this, this ceases. We see dependent origination. This is a perfect example of dependent origination. What's happening is that they arise dependently. When this exists, this arises. When this doesn't exist, this ceases. This is exactly what the Buddha described, yes. I understand we can't directly correlate this with what the Buddha said to explain it. These are phenomena we can observe in our minds. In our observation of the mind, we don't see particles. We experience them as conscious projections, where the notion of space is just a label or some ambient noise. In our experience, we observe impressions as feeling, and immediately with feeling, we observe reactions. More specifically with feeling, there is perception and there is consciousness. Isn't that interesting? So this property of entanglement, spooky action at a distance, it has been proven that entanglement does hold, and it has consistently been demonstrated in numerous labs. Although I'm aware that some scientists remain unconvinced by the nuanced outcomes of quantum experiments, and believe there must be a deeper underlying reality. Baker, 2018. We don't need to take a side with any particular theory, as these are subject to review and change. What I'm saying is that these particles, observed in physical labs, have been seen and documented worldwide. They've been published, and all this evidence exists. Almost everyone is convinced by the latest theory now. However, what is true in our experience doesn't need certification from anyone to accept. Look, the experiment by Anton Zielinger says otherwise, you must be wrong. We don't need to submit to such authority. We might simply say whatever you're saying could be true. Your authority remains with you. You can impose that authority on me, and I'd accept that, that's fine. But you can't change or control the observation in my mind, where I observe feeling, and with that feeling I observe a reaction. I observe contact on a sense door, feel a sensation, and I observe a reaction on that sense door. I see the photons hitting my eye, and immediately with that vision, I perceive it, analyze it, and produce a reaction. All these things happen simultaneously. Space is just a concept. We might call it entanglement. Buddha calls it dependent origination. Simultaneously, one phenomenon arises, immediately linked to that phenomenon is another phenomenon. That's what dependent origination is. It doesn't claim too much about the universe. The Buddha didn't assert that dependent origination applies to matter or to subatomic particles. Although some Buddhists, like Tibetan Buddhists, are keen on formulating theories from the Buddha's teachings. They want to say, oh, what you've discovered now, the Buddha did similar things long ago. 
they strive to claim science and Buddhism are converging and describing the nature of reality in very close and accurate ways. They may assert that the Buddha's approach was highly scientific. Wallace, Buddhism and Science, Breaking New Ground, 2003. It's akin to acknowledging the authority of science and seeking to associate with science. But we don't need to submit to the authority of science. Science can be authoritative in its own domain. While it's tempting to explore the correlation between science and Buddhism further, they remain separate domains. The former investigates phenomena without engaging the mind and subjective experience, while the latter explores the mind and the path out of suffering inherent in the experiences. Having said that, exploring the close association between science and Buddhism isn't a bad idea. It's a useful exercise. Wallace, Hidden Dimensions, The Unification of Physics and Consciousness, 2007. What we need to consider is that science and the observation of the mind can remain independent, and they don't need to support each other. Our mind, our experiences, follow a very specific pattern. This pattern is entirely different from the pattern observed in nature. Physics tries to capture this through mathematics, observations, experiments, analyses, and various theories. These are the tools available to science. But for the mind, it doesn't need these sophisticated tools at all. In contrast, we only have mind and our experiences, and we have only the mind and mindfulness at our disposal to address suffering due to phenomena. The Buddha said in many teachings, the realm of the mind is far more extensive and powerful than the world we observe and create around us. I'll delve into more details later on how we unravel the nature of the mind through sharp, direct observations. Hopefully, this will provide context for why we shouldn't dogmatically assert that science is the only tool for understanding the truth of phenomena. And hopefully, these new perspectives on direct observation of the mind will encourage us to look beyond the tools of science to understand the nature of the mind. We need to take a step back to see what science is. Science has a blind spot, a significant blind spot, an elephant in the room, if I may say so. Science is completely oblivious to our inner experiences. Scientific studies have alienated the mind and the investigation of the mind because they don't want to associate with something too speculative or unpredictable. They consider the mind too arbitrary, speculative, and beyond the domain of what science should study. Some argue that we shouldn't bring the domain of the mind into the picture because it's too speculative. They believe science shouldn't delve into superstitions, imaginary notions of supernormal phenomena, or higher realities without empirical evidence. Thus, they tend to keep science away from consciousness, subjectivity, and the domain of the mind. I had a brief look into this, which led me to explore the relationship between science and spiritualism. I wondered why people are so intrigued by examining these domains side by side and what the latest discoveries or insights they are having. Surprisingly, such ideas are everywhere nowadays. Consciousness is certainly a very prominent topic these days. I found it interesting to find many videos on YouTube. One of these is called Awakening Mind in 2023, where two scientists, Donald Hoffman and Rupert Spira, are featured. Rupert is a philosopher who views the mind and consciousness as a path out of our miseries and suffering. Spiritualism is the way to go, and he practices a form of meditation that connects with Vedic philosophies. He talks extensively about the first-person perspective, and Donald Hoffman, a neuroscientist, supports a theory of consciousness that transcends matter and physicalism. This movie is about an hour long and is accessible to a general audience. It resonates well with those who don't necessarily support pure religious views but have a healthy skepticism towards blind faith-based approaches. It also appeals to those who are aware of scientific discoveries but are not fully convinced by all of science's conclusions. This movie is really interesting because it discusses the nature of the mind, delusions that we constantly carry with us, and the idea of taking personal experiences. It supports the notion that consciousness and the mind are closely linked. In a sense, the Awakening movie suggests that the mind and matter debate, the dualism that considers these as separate entities, causes much suffering. However, there is no such thing as dualism. What's happening is there's a single, non-dual experience, which aligns well with Advaita Vedanta philosophies, where the distinction between the world and oneself is false. This dualism, the separation between the world and us, is the root of suffering. 
When this duality dissolves into unity, it reveals our eternal essence. It is our undistorted consciousness, our oneness with the universe, and the fulfillment of our life's purpose. All suffering fades away when we become one with the universe. That's the ultimate path to freedom from suffering. That's the summary of the movie for me, or at least the essence that Rupert has experienced deep within himself. Perhaps that's his reality, as he claims it's how we achieve freedom from suffering and find true happiness. The movie proposes that giving much credit to the notion of universal consciousness as something supreme, the ultimate reality, may be correct. Consciousness is seen as something transcendent of space-time, matter and all our experiences, feelings, perceptions, notions, that are fabrications, distortions of the ultimate universal consciousness, which is non-dual, unmanifested, inherent in every being, and the source of ultimate happiness. That seems to be the ultimate message from him. Donald Hoffman contributes to this line of thinking. He says that space-time, matter and physicalism have hit a dead end on both sides, on the nanoscale of sub-subatomic particles and on the grand scale of the cosmos. Physicists can't explain experiences that span such vast scales, beyond even their best theories, rendering the universe unreal. The universe doesn't seem real when we contemplate what lies beyond all the galaxies, trillions or many more, which are just the visible part of the universe. Therefore, the idea of living in a material universe doesn't hold water because it can't be defined satisfactorily. Donald Hoffman's contribution to the theory of consciousness is about placing consciousness above space-time, at least more fundamentally. He concludes that over these 200 or 400 years of debates between mind and matter, materialistic proponents have gradually lost ground. Quantum mechanics is a good starting point. They may argue they are winning the battle, and proponents of the mind have their own arguments. Those who support the mind argue, no matter what physics proves, we can never dismiss the mind. That's the debate, a state of war, the struggle between mind and matter. Materialistic proponents have recently lost substantial ground because they haven't resolved this debate with propositions that can be reasonably justified, even for the simplest inquiry into our subjective experiences. Why simple observations can consistently affect states of matter. I think these materialistic proponents have bitten off more than they can chew. They should have simply acknowledged that their theories stop at a certain point and that the domain of subjective experience and consciousness is not within their scope. They shouldn't have gone further to claim that physics can explain everything in reality. They've taken on more than they can handle. That's what some scientists like Professor Donald Hoffman and others are challenging. Extreme physicalist notions about the nature of our reality. Donald Hoffman and his team have argued that giving too much credit to space-time-based models and considering space-time as a fundamental reality is flawed because space-time doesn't hold up when we start studying objects at the Planck scale or below. When we try to measure an object that is 10 to 33 centimeter and attempt to characterize it, it can no longer be characterized within the space-time framework. The very notion of measuring that entity or particle is invalidated because we simply run out of the space-time platform. This is due to the collapse of space-time as the energy required for measurement exponentially exceeds all energies available in the universe. Even if energy were available, limiting such high energy in such a small space-time creates a black hole, thereby destroying the object itself that we are trying to measure. It's as if we are attempting to measure that particular object, but the very laws of physics come into play to undo our efforts, much like trying to measure weight without any apparatus. How can we possibly achieve that? Simply put, we cannot. We need some foundation, but that foundation is now gone. Thus, space-time doesn't hold water when we attempt to measure an object at 1033 centimeter or below. This means that space-time is not the immutable fabric universal to all scales. It's a very delicate scale. For instance, if we want to measure 0.1 gram of matter, but our scale only measures in steps of, let's say, 1 gram, then that scale is inadequate. Essentially, the margin of error is one or more orders of magnitude greater than the precision we are striving for. This is why space-time loses its validity at the sub-subatomic level of the Planck scale. On deeper reflection, we realize that the space-time we once thought to be the foundation of our reality is merely a concept. 
It's not a fundamental property of nature. Rather, it crumbles when subjected to rigorous testing. So this led us to rethink, if space-time is not fundamental, then what is beyond space-time? Beyond space-time, I want to bring to light some direct experiences of the mind found in the earliest Buddhist texts. The Buddha said that when we move beyond experiences of matter, beyond the perception of matter, we arrive at the experience of space, the emptiness of space. This experience is known as the base of the infinity of space, the domain where beings abide in the base of infinite space. So this domain is also a perception that our minds can grasp. That's what the Buddha says. It means it's merely a perception. There's nothing immutable even in that space. The experience of space is just a perception. And the Buddha says that, okay, because it's just a perception, why do we want to hold on to this perception? Perception is our reaction to a phenomenon. Why hold on to space if it's just a notion? We need to let it go. And because it's a fabrication of the mind, we release and relax, and the notion of space also fades away once it ceases. That means it's not a fundamental reality. And what the Buddha says is when we let go of space, it brings us to another reality. It's not the fundamental reality either, it's a relative reality known as the infinity of consciousness. So beyond space, when we let go of space and it disappears, then all that remains is consciousness, or consciousness and whatever lies behind consciousness, to be more precise. Thus this experience is called the perception of the base of the infinity of consciousness. So space, the perception of space, disappears because it's not fundamental. Space is just a creation of the mind, just a concept. And when we let go of that concept of space, all that's left is the perception of the infinity of consciousness. Notice the word perception. So what does that mean? It's just a perception that exists. So this consciousness is also perception. It's not a theory. It's not a theory of consciousness. It's not a theory of space-time. It's not a theory of the mind. It's the direct observation of our experiences. That is to say, I didn't create this. I didn't create space. I didn't create consciousness. I simply stated what I saw, or rather what the Buddha saw in his observations. And this is exactly what we see when we introspect, when we observe our minds. It's not just me. There are thousands of meditators who know that when we let go of the notion of space, the infinity of space disappears, and it's replaced by the perception of the infinity of consciousness. And that's just a perception. What does that mean? Consciousness itself is just a perception. And when we go even further beyond that, we arrive at the infinity of consciousness. And when we let go of even that infinity of consciousness, then there's the perception of the base of nothingness. And this perception of nothingness is devoid of anything. It's simply an awareness of no things. There's just the mind, but nothing else. Yes, it's just a fleeting experience, merely an experience, but there is nothing beyond it. And even that experience transcends through practice. We understand that this perception, this notion of nothingness, there's a perception attached to nothingness as well. And when we move beyond that, we reach a state of neither perception nor non-perception. Now the foundation of perception somewhat becomes unstable. That perception no longer holds ground because it's actually a concept, a construct of the mind, a thin veil, perhaps, of our personalization, our ideas, our conceptualizations. So that's the thin strand of concept that remains at that foundation. We let go of neither perception nor non-perception as well. Then the Buddha says that when we've let go even of this small, unstable perception of neither perception nor non-perception, it means our entire notion of the universe and any reliance on our mental observations, perceptions, imaginations, all collapse. Then whatever experience we had of this universe fades away. There's nothing to fear or worry about such experiences. These are merely episodes touching the realm of the unconditioned. There will be complete emptiness, a complete loss of the world for a brief moment. It's not emptiness, it's a total disconnection of perception, feeling and consciousness from the concept called the world. That means letting go of everything, and when we have let go of everything, all these concepts, that's it. A state of complete and absolute independence from the universe. That's where the Buddha went and returned from. That's what the Buddha's path is about, and that's what I practice having first-hand experience of all these states.
So in this context, all I'm saying is that yes, consciousness is more fundamental than space, and consciousness will persist even if we let go of space. But it's a construct of our mind because, as we know, even this idea of space I mentioned is a construct. It's not a true foundation of our reality. And space, as I mentioned, doesn't hold any real ground even within a simple thought process. If space was a genuine framework of this universe, how could we reconcile the fact that we are living in an infinitely undefinable, unreal universe that continues indefinitely? What solid evidence assures us that we are indeed in a tangible universe? This demonstrates that all the countless galaxies and enigmatic dark matter are simply concepts that arise depending on our measurements. They do not exist if we do not measure them. They become mere imaginations to satisfy our mind's craving for permanence. Everything beyond our senses, including the concept of outside, is a product of our perception. Even the visual universe is a construct of our imagination. Space can be likened to a lens or an interface, as Professor Donald Hoffman aptly describes space-time as a headset. This means it's merely a convention, a method for facilitating our daily interactions in a universally understandable manner. This approach helps us navigate complexities like the Planck scale without confusion. We needn't concern ourselves with whether it's, say, 1020 Planck lengths. Instead, more generalized measurements like meters, relevant to human scales, give space practical meaning for our everyday activities. Recent experiments such as quantum entanglement and the measurement problem at the Planck scale suggest that space-time as a reality is under question. Further revelations from ongoing scientific experiments highlight the urgent need for a theory capable of refining our understanding of space-time. This is precisely what Professor Donald Hoffman is endeavoring to develop, a comprehensive theory of consciousness where space-time is viewed merely as a derivative. Causally speaking, while I hear phrases like booting up space-time from consciousness, I find them less convincing. It may be plausible to generate perceptions of space and time from consciousness, but the idea of consciousness as an entity creating space-time as its offspring or product seems untenable to me. Therefore, I have reviewed his two papers, one on the theory of consciousness composed of numerous conscious agents and another on the theory of the fusion of consciousness. The paper on conscious agents is essentially formulating a principle, providing a scaffold to place this theory of consciousness on a theoretical foundation. It proposes a primitive model of conscious agents interacting. The model of a conscious agent shows an agent having perception, taking action, and making decisions. Why these three properties? Why can consciousness perceive, act, and decide? Is this the ultimate model, the most rudimentary model, or an intermediate one until we discover an ultimate model? These are conceptual questions. A conscious agent is a concept that attempts to establish a framework consisting of a network of trillions of conscious agents, capable of simulating complex experiences using agent building blocks and Markov chain-based interactions. It resembles a vast probability matrix. The Markov chain defines probabilities, and with causal interactions among these conscious agents, we can seemingly recreate all experiences, including space-time. The theory suggests that space-time is merely an experience through which we observe the physical world. If the scaffolding of consciousness is constructed in a sophisticated manner, it could account for all experiences, including space and time. With a trillion by trillion sized matrix, we can explore countless permutations to explain various experiences. For instance, by taking the inverse of that matrix, we can alter our perceptions drastically. Multiplying a matrix with its inverse could nullify noise, leading to the loss of interference experiences. Similarly, fusing two consciousnesses with opposite properties could potentially cancel each other out, resulting in no consciousness remaining. Thus, we can develop mathematical relations of conscious agents to potentially explain phenomena like the different colors or tastes of chocolates, or the bitterness of medicines, by manipulating the values of the Markov chain matrix to generate complex matrices representing these varied experiences. Using conscious agent theory as a foundation for the experience of space-time, Professor Hoffman is now attempting to integrate it with another theory stemming from the latest developments in physics, based on experimental results from particle collision labs like CERN, characterizing fundamental particles such as gluons and muons using the space-time model after collision is highly intricate. 
simulating their behavior and outcomes through complex mathematics might be simplified using geometrical concepts beyond space-time known as amplituhedrons. These multidimensional polygons can represent particle interactions as geometrical shapes rather than mathematical equations. Amplituhedrons, with trillions of dimensions, could potentially account for all types of particle interactions in space-time, offering a comprehensive and mathematically precise representation of reality. This approach could satisfy those seeking a theory encompassing every possible experience. Amplituhedrons can be represented as geometrical shapes and sizes, and their properties can be characterized by a concept known as decorative permutation. Decorative permutation involves manipulating numbers or entries in matrices, akin to shuffling cards but within specific rules. These allowed permutations define the characteristics of amplituhedrons, which correspond to various physical particle interactions observed in life today. This experiment fundamentally links consciousness with space-time and particles at the most basic level. It's what I've gleaned from Professor Donald Hoffman's work, which is truly remarkable, profound, and a bold challenge to prevailing notions of space-time and materialism held by hard materialists who view consciousness merely as a property of matter. This scientific endeavor challenges the dogma that a material universe alone can account for all known experiences, a statement that seems quite absurd. These new theories like amplituhedrons and decorative permutations are advancing science, moving it forward towards a less dogmatic approach. Materialistic views in science have suffered significant setbacks in the past 50 years, failing to progress in multiple directions. Many physicists struggled to reconcile behaviors validated by quantum mechanics, and Einstein was no exception. Despite such challenges, quantum mechanics has repeatedly demonstrated that material particles lack a solid space-time locality. They exist as potentials. Quantum mechanics has shaken the foundations of rigid, deterministic, and static descriptions of particles, atoms, and matter within the framework of space-time. It challenges the notion that matter resembles solid balls or dots suspended in space, akin to Lego pieces, a concept supported by scientists like Max Tegmark, Tegmark 2014. Additionally, quantum physics has dismantled the idea that matter and things can be fully characterized by deterministic boundaries of location and time. It has shown that reality is rather probabilistic and shaped by our interactions. We cannot definitively ascertain whether a particle is here or there until we measure it. Only upon measurement does a particle manifest at a specific location. Until then, it can exist anywhere. This principle is encapsulated in Schrödinger's equation. Schrödinger posited that there are no vast Lego-like particles. Rather, particles exist in a superposition of many waves. He proposed that upon measurement, particles transition into a suspended animation-like state. Before measurement, they exist as concepts. The wave-particle duality inherent in physical reality remains a subject of challenge across scientific communities. Some scientists argue that particles persist even in the absence of observation, attempting to remove problematic consciousness-related notions from purely physical phenomena. Schrödinger recognized that quantum physics and mechanics implied something more fundamental than particles, suggesting that our current model of reality based on particle physics and space-time, may soon become untenable. He drew influence from Vedanta and other Eastern philosophies, and in his later years, he began to express the view that consciousness is more fundamental than material reality. This perspective supported the quest to understand the mind beyond mere matter and theoretical constructs, marking a shift towards a more philosophical stance later in his life. Schrodinger, 1956. Another very interesting notion worth exploring is biocentrism, which suggests that biological processes and consciousness are necessary for the world and experiences to arise. This idea challenges the reductionist view of reality as merely physical and mechanistic processes, leaving the door open for exploration of mind and consciousness. Chapter 5. Exploration of Notions of Biocentrism Biocentrism is an idea proposed by medical scientist Dr. Robert Lanza after years of research into human cells and the genome. He has authored three popular books on the topic, Biocentrism, Beyond Biocentrism, and The Grand Biocentric Design. 
These books are captivating reads that appeal to a wide audience, attracting considerable press attention as an alternative means to explain the nature of the universe. Biocentrism has been heavily influenced by findings from quantum physics and more recently by philosophies such as Vedanta. It posits that the universe and its intricate complexities only make sense because conscious biological entities exist to perceive them. According to biocentrism, biological systems like human beings are at the center of the universe, while matter and all experiences are artifacts of something intrinsically subjective. Lanza argues that some of the deepest mysteries in science such as the role of the observer in determining the state of particles, can only be explained through biocentrism. While biocentrism includes consciousness within its scope to elucidate subjective and objective phenomena, it does not extend beyond this to encompass the experiential understanding of the interaction between mind, mental phenomena, and material objects. Thus, biocentrism distinguishes itself from spiritual practices and religious beliefs concerning higher consciousness and divine beings like gods. Lately, it incorporated some insights from Eastern philosophies such as Hinduism on the concepts of consciousness and intelligence beyond the duality of subject and object. However, fundamentally, biocentrism can be viewed as a fusion of quantum physics and cellular biology, a combination that gives it a unique advantage over many other alternative viewpoints in closely explaining the reality of animate life. Biocentrism represents a significant idea, offering fresh perspectives that diverge from the dogmatic extreme physicalist view of the world, which reduces the universe to nothing more than a complexity of atoms and molecules. In attempting to unravel the mystery of life, it posits that life may also be engineered through carefully planned laboratory experiments. Biocentrism covers numerous areas in its quest to answer fundamental questions such as What is life? Why are we here? Rather than providing an overview of all books on biocentrism, I will outline its key principles here to provide some of the missing elements that may satisfy our thirst about why we should move beyond these intriguing notions and seek direct experience. It starts with an idea. There is no separate physical universe outside of life and consciousness. Nothing is real that is not perceived. There was never a time when an external, dumb, physical universe existed or that life sprang randomly from it at a later date. Space and time exist only as constructs of the mind, as tools of perception. Experiments in which the observer influences the outcome are easily explainable by the interrelatedness of consciousness and the physical universe. Neither nature nor mind is unreal. Both are correlative. No position is taken regarding God. There are seven principles of biocentrism that I extracted from the books. These are very interesting conclusions which may offer satisfaction to some intellectual curiosity of mind. All good and wonderful, no pun intended. I go further to say that we should not stop there and experience what is really happening in mind. First principle of biocentrism. What we perceive as reality is a process that involves our consciousness. An external reality, if it existed, would, by definition, have to exist in space. But this is meaningless, because space and time are not absolute realities, but rather tools of the human and animal mind. This is a good summary of human reality, because there simply isn't another way we can relate to all the experiences our minds concoct through our senses without involving consciousness. Consciousness has been touted as something supernatural, an inherently existing feature that defines our reality here, and that is the eternal essence of our self, even though our bodies die. However, note that there is much more to our experiences than just consciousness. Understanding how all six consciousnesses arise due to their causes and conditions will paint a much more comprehensive and less mystical picture. The assumption underlying this principle is that consciousness defines us and our experiences. It posits that consciousness is our self or identity. However, this may still be a premature assumption. When one develops mindfulness to a refined degree, one can directly see that consciousnesses arise and pass away continually, much like bubbles. And what's more, they arise and pass away without a controller, supernatural awareness, or being behind them. It generally seems to us that space and time exist independently of our experiences and provide definite coordinates for our experiences. These notions persisted rock-solid until the 19th century 
due to the highly successful and esteemed work of Newton on gravity and motion. However, this classical and solid notion became untenable when the very foundation of space-time was shaken by Einstein's discovery of the general theory of relativity. He proved that the only constant in the universe is the speed of light. Even space and time had to become flexible to accommodate his remarkable theory. However, in light of the latest developments in physics, we cannot state this with certainty. Space is not the fundamental barrier that separates entities from each other. According to quantum physics, in the realm of subatomic particles, electrons once associated can seemingly affect each other's states instantaneously, as if the spaces between them have disappeared. How the barrier of space can be overcome at the human scale, like the idea of teleportation, is so far considered a stage two impossibility by Professor Michio Kaku in his book, Kaku, 2008. How this can be made possible is a topic for future study. But fundamentally, if we can create an entangled pair of our body, we should be able to teleport as well. Interestingly, there are accounts of such feats being performed by the Buddha and his disciples on many occasions to impart his teachings to beings in heavenly realms or other parts of the country. This is mentioned just for reference, unless one wants to practice to directly experience such possibilities. A very revealing treatise on what the space and matter we see around us truly are given by the Buddha in his discourses on the elements. Here he explains that the notion of space or separateness between us, internal space element, and the world, external space element, arises due to the arising of consciousness. In other words, the moment consciousness arises in the eye, ear, and other sense organs, our mind registers the world as being out there. However, all the sights, sounds, tastes, etc. that we experience are reactions of the mind to impressions of elements with feelings and perceptions. The notions of here or there, in or out, are fabrications of the mind, or functions of consciousness. He advises that one should develop disenchantment and dispassion towards these elements by continually letting go of these mere concepts. The end result is, while the body will last as long as life supports it, the mind has been fully liberated from the body and becomes cool and free from agitation. It's a peculiar state, but nothing close to the annihilation of self that one might think. Time is not absolute. We all know this very well, both personally and scientifically. But time serves as a valuable reference that our minds create to keep track of all experiences. The mind experiences time as a perception of change when it observes all phenomena that are dependently linked together. In fact, time exists in the mind whenever it is preoccupied by distractions, no matter how subtle they may be. When one develops mindfulness to let go of all distractions, the only reality experienced is present moment awareness. All notions of the past and future simply fade away. This state of mind is devoid of all concepts, where all phenomena cease, and along with them, time also ceases. One is able to develop the mind by calming all arising phenomena and being completely free, dissociated and detached from them. Later, I will show how our minds construct all experiences through a process that is discrete rather than continuous. In Chapter 0. Chapter 9. Genesis of Material Universe and Contact and how this can be observed through direct experience in Chapter 0. Chapter 16. Exploring the Buddha's Samatha Vipassana Path. This domain of experience belongs to the mind. It's not a place like heaven or celestial realms, so having direct meditative experience is essential to understanding it fully. Second principle of biocentrism. Our external and internal perceptions are inextricably intertwined. They are different sides of the same coin and cannot be divorced from one another. Perception here refers to our conceptions. The role of perception is identification. Perceptions are generally categorized as internal and external. Those involving the mind are internal, while those experienced through the five senses are external. External experiences are sometimes referred to as the five faculties or domains, each distinct and non-overlapping in qualities, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. However, it's important to note that these faculties can only be experienced when the mind is involved or engaged. For example, one may have their eyes open but fail to see objects if the mind's attention is elsewhere or overwhelmed by other senses. Such situations are common, 
leaving us unable to comprehend what is happening around us as our attention was completely elsewhere. Perception is a part of the mind that arises to name or relate to an experience when the mind recognizes a certain feeling from the interaction of body and mind with objects. For perception to arise, feeling must arise. Feeling is the fundamental way the mind experiences objects, which can only be a. painful, b. pleasurable, or c. neither painful nor pleasurable, nothing else. When a feeling arises, the mind attempts to recognize and name it. That process is perception. Perception crystallizes in the mind as a full-blown consciousness of the object after the mind fully engages with it. Thus, in reality, there are no such things as internal and external perceptions. There is simply perception that arises whenever the mind reacts to a feeling. A study conducted by Professor Donald Hoffman's team, published in the article in New Scientist in 3 August 2009, Reality, the Greatest Illusion of All, concluded that external or objective reality can be rather frightening. In truth, reality is created by the mind and presented to it as perceptions. A virtual reality that we become conscious of in order to survive or thrive in adverse conditions. They suggest that anyone perceiving objective reality without modifications could potentially face extinction as they would struggle to adapt well to the environment. This raises a fundamental question. Our existence is perpetually preoccupied with desires for gain, the instinct for survival, and is driven by fear of losing these sensory experiences. These reactions are actually the causes of instability in the mind, keeping us caught in various existences from one life to another. The Buddha teaches that there is instability for one who is dependent, but there is no instability for one who is independent or unconditioned. What he means is that all our feelings, perceptions, concepts and fears are instabilities or oscillations of the mind, akin to someone suddenly put on a bicycle who doesn't know how to get off. They must keep pedaling forward to stay upright or risk an immediate fall. However, if they knew how to dismount safely and stand on solid ground, they would never worry or waver as they wouldn't need external support. We live our lives in constant fear of death or loss of sensory experiences and other concerns. These mind reactions keep us trapped in a cycle, always needing more reactions to survive. The moment one realizes that these reactions are merely creations of the mind, which is deluded into believing they are necessary for survival, one can completely let go of them. As all reactions cease, with their cessation, Fear of death, anxieties and agitations also cease. This state is not the extinction or annihilation of self, as many people think. Rather, it is the state of supreme peace and stability. The unconditioned, ultimate freedom from all sufferings. Also known as Nibbana, or the extinguishing of all fires. One experiences this state after developing the mind to a sufficient degree, and does not have to wait for death to experience this happiness. Third principle of biocentrism. The behaviors of subatomic particles, indeed all particles and objects, are inextricably linked to the presence of an observer. Without the presence of a conscious observer, they at best exist in an undetermined state of probability waves. One of the greatest problems in science is that Einstein's description of space-time, the large-scale view using general relativity, fundamentally conflicts with quantum theory at the very small scale where traditional rules of space-time break down for subatomic particles. The nature of matter, composed of the same particles, behaves very predictably on cosmic or human scales, but exhibits indeterministic, probabilistic, and discrete behavior at the quantum level. This dichotomy remains one of the greatest mysteries in science today. This mystery deepens with discoveries that subatomic particles violate the principle of locality the foundation of our existence in the common-sense world, and can exhibit behaviors such as existing in multiple places simultaneously, wave-particle duality, and influencing each other regardless of distance through quantum entanglement. Let's pause here for a moment to grasp the implications. This implies that particles do not exist in the strict realist sense of an independently existing world. Rather, their existence depends on our sense perceptions under specific conditions. The observer's intention to observe, the functioning of the observer's sense faculties, and the presence of an object within the range of those faculties and attention. As can be seen from the figure, the observation of particles occurs only in case 1. 
but not in cases 2 and 3. Case 2 represents the cessation state, where all arising phenomena cease due to non-reaction, 6R. Such states do not result from the annihilation of our so-called self, an observer or the world, but rather from our non-involvement in the process of the arising and passing of phenomena, which can occur both knowingly and unknowingly. Case 3, or non-seeing, occurs due to lack of sense faculty and or attention. The difference between cessation and non-seeing lies in the presence and absence of mindfulness, respectively. Understanding this distinction reveals the secret of awakening and true liberation. For a clearer illustration, we can consider how a person without meditative experience perceives the world compared to an accomplished meditator who fully understands the arising and ceasing prevention of phenomena. But let's continue to use the ideas of biocentrism for exploration for now. Fourth principle of biocentrism. Without consciousness, matter dwells in an undetermined state of probability. Any universe that could have preceded consciousness only existed in a probability state. This point is again a reiteration of the previous one. Now the focus is on consciousness rather than on perception. What we call matter is generally regarded as the physical and objective reality that exists independently, according to most physicists. There were times in the past 200 years when particle physicists were marginalized, as they were thought to be wasting time and resources on futile research and missing the bigger picture. Lord Kelvin, who discovered the laws of thermodynamics, touted to have said that physics had reached its peak and that all the important discoveries in physics had already been made, with only polishing the findings left to do. With the revolution in quantum physics in the 20th century, this notion of certainty and solidity of matter became fuzzy, as it seems that the fundamental particles that make up all matter cannot be defined within the generic space-time framework. Now let's conduct a thought experiment with the thing we call matter. Most people know that all knowable matter consists entirely of or from various combinations of the 92 elements naturally found on the planet. These elements reduce to atoms, then to electrons and nuclei made of protons and neutrons. Going beyond the subatomic structures of the elements, it has been understood that particles such as electrons and protons do not exist as solid objects like stacked Legos. The presence of these subatomic particles can only be ascertained by means of observations. In other words, our measurements. These particles only become a reality when our senses can grasp the nature of their presence through some effects which we call our feelings and perceptions. It would be pointless to talk about the existence of matter if our senses cannot make any sense of it. It boils down to how we make sense of it. Here comes another perspective on matter by means of elements, not the 92 elements from the periodic table which have different names that we are largely familiar with, but by means of feelings and perceptions of them. These are called the four great elements in Buddhist texts. Earth, water, fire, and air. These elements should not be taken literally as consisting of these objects, but rather as the properties of them that make up sensation in our bodies. Some elements manifest to our senses as hardness or repelling acts. Now we know that the matter we are talking about is at least 99.9999% empty. That is, it is extremely unlikely that electrons in our body cells would even come into close contact with the electrons of matter, e.g. walls we are interacting with. But how can it be that, instead of passing through matter as though through the morning fogs of winter, we bounce back or bang our heads so hard against these forms? We know in the quantum realm that such events occur all the time, an effect we call quantum tunneling, Al-Khalili, 2019. There is a deep implication from this thought experiment. Anyone who is able to develop their mind to cease the feelings that arise may actually overcome the painful feeling that is the outcome of interacting with matter that has solid or earthy properties. This is a very interesting phenomenon that has been observed in the Pali Canon texts, where the Buddha says, one who can perfect the art of serenity of mind by full tranquilization can achieve mastery, such as penetrating solid barriers like walls or enclosures. The four great elements, Mahabhuta in Pali, literally also mean the four great ghosts. Now this needs a little thought. These elements indeed do not have fixed nomenclatures with which they can be defined with certainty that they remain at the same or different states. 
These elements are representations in our minds in terms of perceptions of form, which are characterized by four properties, earth, water, fire, and air. In terms of experiences, we may never be able to truly fathom the reality of an objective world in terms of what our perceptions come in contact with. All that we experience are our projections of what is coming into contact with our senses. To dogmatically assert that the physical elements are really out there and come as a bunch of atoms and molecules is too naive and a premature conclusion. Countless results from high-energy particle labs give a very nuanced and illusory nature of particles that do not appear to conform to standard particle physics. The particles are our representation of phenomena that are rather probabilistic in nature, behaving very much like waves where they violate fundamental notions of standard physics, like locality and unitarity. Experiments with the quantum nature of subatomic particles have revealed that they can borrow particles from complete voids and even from the future and pay them back. That is, they do not have to sum to a total, as we are used to in daily lives, a violation of the law of unitarity. The famous experiments done by Anton Zeilinger et al. with entangled particles have closed off the loop, suspecting the validity of the assertion that spooky action at a distance is possible. The scientific communities postulating the objective reality of matter have lost significant ground in recent years. While the latest experiments have given some support to proponents of ideas like biocentrism, if we look at the problem of the reality of our experiences, all these debates and pursuits are actually prolonging more and more mental proliferation, leading to more and more unsettledness and suffering. There is a middle path where the ultimate peace, safety and freedom from all notions can be achieved. Fifth principle of biocentrism. The structure of the universe is explainable only through biocentrism. The universe is fine-tuned for life, which makes perfect sense as life creates the universe, not the other way around. The universe is simply the complete spatio-temporal logic of the self. The notion that the universe is perfectly tuned for life to observe it, and everything is just right for us, has been a puzzle for the vast majority of physicists as well. They are perplexed as to why the constant for gravity is so precise, down to a precision of 10 to the power of 120 zeros, and not otherwise. This figure dictates the state of our universe, which is evolving to sustain life as we know it, without crushing all creatures or leading to a big freeze where stars become too spaced out if expansion continues even a tiny bit faster. Claiming that only biocentrism can explain a universe finely tuned for life veers towards asserting the authority of biology over phenomena such as gravity and particle physics. For biocentrism to remain accurate, it should confine itself to the realm of biology. This way, it can remain somewhat autonomous from the physical phenomena that govern the behavior of inanimate particles and matter, without making excessive claims about the physics of matter and the reality behind the fabric of space-time. Whether we would like to accept it or not, phenomena that give rise to the perception of space-time and matter do exist in their own domains. It would be too presumptuous to claim that the universe exists as it is solely due to perception. In other words, saying that biology is the primary force governing the physical universe heavily biases toward giving too much authority to biology. This is not really the case. It's like claiming ownership of a process just because one process has a causal effect on another. The two can remain completely disjoint and governed by their own sets of rules. The illusion that one is the primary force for the other is very persistent. Furthermore, biocentrism cannot and should not claim that all mental processes are byproducts of biology. The realm of mind and perception is a completely different domain governed by its own rules. As it will be discussed in Chapter 9, consciousness and perception of the material universe depend only on the coming together of phenomena. Such processes occur because there is a suitable platform ready for them to occur, for example in humans or other creatures that react to them. However, this does not mean that biological creatures govern the perception of the universe. Biocentrism should account for the fact that neither the physical universe and natural phenomena nor biological processes can fully account for the rich life experiences characterized by entities like humans or animals. Both communities overlook the fact that there is a thing such as mind and mental processes, like feeling, perception, intention, contact and attention, that when supported by consciousness, 
bring all experiences into subjective reality. If we can truly appreciate how these three things come together to sustain what we all call life, then we are a step closer to cracking the tough nut of why there is suffering in this universe and how it can be ended. Sixth principle of biocentrism. Time does not have a real existence outside of animal sense perception. It is the process by which we perceive changes in the universe. Time is an invention of humans. We have inherited the mind-body process, whereby we cannot control anything as we desire. Time is defined by us as something against which we measure how much we have gained or lost in terms of the gratification of the six senses, agreeableness or its opposite. When we take a step back and observe the mind's reactions to feelings based on contacts with the six senses, notions of agreeableness, disagreeableness and indifference arise continuously. For those who understand how the mind works, these notions are the fuels that keep us bound to the framework of space-time. They are the means to measure how much we have gained or lost in terms of the assets of the six senses. Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches and thoughts. When the mind becomes disentangled from these three inevitable tendencies, an experience arises that is completely outside the realm of space-time. In this dimension, there is no gain or loss of sights, sounds, tastes, touches, smells, or thoughts. These notions vanish completely, yet the body and mind become extremely happy and comfortable. This experience is something completely alien to materialist scientists and worldly people. In such experiences, the notion of time fades away. There is simply no need for space and time in this dimension. However, those who are observant of all experiences of the mind will fully understand how the three tendencies can arise again, bringing back the notion of the gratification of the six senses through sense-door contacts. When these tendencies return, the notions of space-time and the gain and loss of senses become the new norm. The world arises from the non-world. The notion of the space-time fabric and its curvature, with the speed of light being the only immutable factor, has been with us since Einstein's development of general relativity. He changed our perception of time by convincing us that time ticks differently depending on how fast we are moving relative to each other. He theoretically showed that time ceases to exist if we were moving at the speed of light, meaning we wouldn't age at all. Obviously, such an event remains fiction today. No one has the ability to travel at such unimaginably high speeds. Even if we could travel at a tenth of that speed, it could potentially slow down the aging process that we all desperately try to avoid. Even in the realms of physics like gravity, space-time curvatures, and quantum mechanics, the notion of absolute time is not a convincing proposition. It is becoming open to interpretation, much like any other concept. When subatomic particles that are entangled become excited, they instantaneously affect each other's states. For these particles, the notions of relativity and space-time curvature do not exist. This suggests that objects in nature do not adhere to the laws of gravity and space-time as we commonly think, and the boundary of time becomes meaningless in those cases. The usefulness of time only makes sense when we can frame it within a concept or theory. When such notions dissolve, time becomes a completely irrelevant concept. To quote a text from the Buddha, There is a realm where there is no matter, no space, no concepts, no this world, no other world. There is no here and there, no coming and going, no objects. This is a realm of no concepts, no conditions, a state of total peace and tranquility, freedom from all suffering. The notion of time becomes real when there is suffering. When there is none, there is no time and no space. Seventh principle of biocentrism. Space, like time, is not an object or a thing. Space is another form of our animal understanding and does not have an independent reality. We carry space and time around with us like turtles with shells. Thus, there is no absolute self-existing matrix in which physical events occur independent of life. The notion of space is rather interesting as it has undergone revisions over the past few hundred years. Beforehand, humans used to conceive of space as a dome, an overarching roof beneath which all knowable experiences occur. Newton then introduced space into a precise framework of our reality by formulating the laws of physics around space and time. No one dared to challenge his doctrine of space-time as long as his authority prevailed. Einstein later modified Newton's laws of physics 
by introducing the notion of relativity and established that the speed of light is the only immutable in the universe. However, he did not shake the foundation of space-time and Newton's laws. New theories, such as space-time being just a headset, have recently emerged. The concept of space-time as a narrow framework of reality, within the grand scheme of consciousness, has been proposed by Professor Donald Hoffman after many years of researching human cognition. His insights into the perceptions of living organisms and their survival through the mechanism of evolution by natural selection led him to believe that beings do not perceive reality as it truly is. If that were the case, we would have become extinct long ago. According to Hoffman, space-time and matter are byproducts of a higher reality, more closely related to consciousness, a position contrary to what most physicalist proponents still hold. A vast majority of people from mystical traditions, and more recently, a small fraction of scientists who have transcended physicalist views of the world, have postulated that consciousness is fundamental. The idea of consciousness generating space-time is gaining wider appeal among some scientists and communities, like Vedanta philosophers. New theories are now emerging, suggesting that space-time and matter may be generated through the manipulation of sequences involving a plurality of conscious agents. It is easy to categorize consciousness as the core of our experiences, from which all subsequent layers of phenomena, including matter, space and time, can arise. This perspective strongly defines our identity and our place in the universe. If consciousness is the root of all phenomena, then where does it stem from? Such ideation can escalate indefinitely to higher and higher levels of consciousness. This is because consciousness, like everything else, must arise from conditions. To assert that consciousness is the ultimate reality is as fallacious as the physicalist notion that particles are the foundations of our realities. The error reference source not found, illustrates a crucial point in our experience. Contact. Insight into reality arises when observing the mind and its interactions with the universe in the present moment. We delve into contact in much greater detail later in this book. While new theories of consciousness may help alleviate the dogmatism of extreme physicalist views, there exists a perspective where one can remain independent of all these notions without being tied to either view. This perspective involves directly observing the process of dependent arising and ceasing of all phenomena as just that. A process. Consciousness is merely a part of this process. However, the world seems to be fixated on theories. Do we truly need a theory to see things as they really are? Chapter 6. Consciousness is not fundamental. Though someone might say, apart from form, Apart from feeling, apart from perception, apart from volitional formations, I will make known the coming and going of consciousness, its passing away and rebirth, its growth, increase and expansion. That is impossible. Samyutta Nikaya, 2253 Inspired Utterance What is our ultimate reality? Many may find consciousness to be an answer. Chalmers, 1997 Scientists like Professor Donald Hoffman also support this view. Throughout history, whenever human intellect has been pushed to its limits and investigated extensively within conceptual frameworks, it has often converged on consciousness. As soon as awareness arises, we see, become aware, and are conscious. This happens not only in our sense experiences, but also within our minds. This is why consciousness holds a supreme place in many philosophies and paths of spiritual inquiry. Across spiritual traditions, Consciousness is universally regarded as something supreme and beyond imagination. If I quote from the Bhagavad Gita, they establish a hierarchy, acknowledging the mind beyond which lies intellect, and beyond intellect lies what they call consciousness. Beyond consciousness, they describe the soul like Atman or Brahman, the ultimate reality. This understanding is not merely intellectual. Some meditators attain exquisite awareness experiencing a sense of oneness with the universe, believing this to be ultimate. Let's consider consciousness as the fundamental substrate for all other layers of experience. This is what Advaita Vedanta and the Upanishads suggest. Emotions, perceptions, attachments, feelings, birth, death, all these are seen as disturbances or anomalies to this overarching consciousness. It remains unaffected, indestructible, ever-present, 
pervading the essence of the entire universe. Beings may experience joy or suffering, but these are fleeting experiences. They believe in a fundamental essence in all beings, the Atman. Ultimate liberation in this belief system occurs when the individual Atman merges with Brahman, the overarching awareness governing the universe. This is deep philosophy, and I won't delve too deeply into it. I don't wish to dwell on something that is conditional or subject to experience, as there's still an idea involved. Instead of satisfying intellectual concerns and queries, I prioritize direct experience. In practice, I observe layers of perceptions, including consciousness itself, as just a perception, a refined experience that doesn't endure or hold water. It dissipates. There is a deeper experience beyond even that. In this sense, consciousness is just one construct. We don't need to analyze it prematurely or draw early conclusions. Let's say, okay, this is not merely an intellectual exercise. So beyond the perceptions of consciousness and nothingness, beyond perception and non-perception, there is the cessation of perception and feeling, simply called nirodha, where we know what direct experience says, and in the Buddha's own terms as well. Direct experience reveals that there is no ultimate, all-pervading, supreme, completely supernatural consciousness. The idea that they are experienced dependently is still our imagination. They are mere fabrications. So, when we practice letting go, or 6R, and we abandon all concepts to such an extent that we keep releasing anything that comes our way, as the Buddha instructs, keep letting go, keep letting go, don't hold on to anything, then even the subtlest layer of perception must be relinquished. We go beyond consciousness, far beyond. We realize that even the perception itself can be let go of. Consciousness is intertwined with perception. What happens is that feeling arises, then immediately perception, and with feeling and perception, consciousness is registered. Those who believe in supreme consciousness may assume that the peak of awareness is substrate consciousness. They do not realize that such concepts arise from reactions to feeling and perception. Holding on to such views leads to tendencies for consciousness to cling to conditioned experiences. Dependency means that without perception, we do not conceive, we are not conscious of it. Without perception, without feeling, consciousness simply cannot sustain itself. It's just a phenomenon, it's just potential. Consciousness is dependent, unstable, vacuous, a very fragile phenomenon with a shallow foundation. Therefore, given the nature of consciousness, there is no need to grasp onto it or regard consciousness as the essence of the universe. When we have let go of perception and feeling, there is no space for consciousness. It falls like a straw. And this is not philosophy, not science, not theory. This is direct experience, which we realize in our meditative practice. When anyone experiences the cessation of perception and feeling, they come into contact with the unconditional element. Everything in this universe, not just the material universe, but also the mental universe, is dependently originated, dependent on causes and conditions. Thus, we can examine anything in the universe, any entity, and immediately ask if it has the property of independent existence. The universe is a dependent experience. It does not exist apart from our conceptual constructs. There is nothing in this universe that can remain independent, not even concepts. We must step outside this universe. I am using we in a loose sense here. We have to let go of this universe to arrive at the state of the unconditioned. And that's what we do in practice. After letting go of all perceptions, after dropping all perceptions, we step outside the universe, the realm of the conditioned. When we enter the realm of the unconditioned, we experience that it is void, empty. We make contact with the element of emptiness, directionlessness, and desirelessness. That is what emerges from the cessation of perception and feeling, a contact with the unconditioned. Upon making contact with the unconditioned, based on that contact, feeling arises, and we return to feeling. Then naturally, we return to the domain of the world and begin to react to that feeling. If we react to that feeling, the reaction causes perception, and that perception generates consciousness. This consciousness persists as long as we have our mind and body to support it. As long as we are alive, that consciousness connects with Nama Rupa, or the mind and body, for simplicity. What is Nama Rupa? We have a body and we have feelings, perceptions, and other means of support. 
These restart the process of consciousness. This is the operating system of our experiences. This is based on dependent origination, the operating system for suffering, if we want to be more technical. The six sense bases arise for consciousness, and contact arises, feeling arises, and so on. This feedback loop begins to self-sustain. There is no way to end this loop without correct mental development, the noble eightfold path. That is the path to stepping outside this universe into the realm of the unconditioned. Thus, as we let go of space, time, consciousness, all perceptions, and the realm of the conditioned, we let go of the process. That is the process of letting go, and there is no need for a theory. I am inclined to create a theory of this process, but I don't need to. The thing is, I didn't invent this. Nobody invented this. The Buddha didn't invent this. It's not an invention, it's just an ongoing process that exists around us without our noticing. This is how our experiences work, and there is no need to develop a theory to describe it or to fit it into an elaborate framework. We are not scientists. We don't need to follow scientific methodologies. Because we are in a different realm of direct experience, we do not need to abide by any authority of the universe. There is no need to adhere to rules like modeling, peer review, proving the validity of results, testing against them, and only then publishing. No, we don't need all that. Everything unfolds in front of our mind and awareness. This is the realm of direct experience. Now I am trying to wrap up all these discussions and materials that I aim to capture to support the path of direct experiential understanding of how the mind works. While I was exploring the work of Donald Hoffman, I found myself drawn to see what has been put forth in that realm by proponents of mind in the mind and matter debates. This led me to the work of Bernardo Kastrup. I thought, okay, let me give his theories a listen. I do not specifically call it a theory because he's a philosopher, albeit one with a deeply analytical mind. So I haven't seen his inventions, equations, or models. However, his concept of analytical idealism sounded quite rigorous as it appears to be based significantly on a solid foundation. He explains these ideas purely based on the foundation of our experiences, logics, and inferences. What I found interesting and compelling to hear is that whatever experiences we have, nothing in our experience is material. Anything we experience, whether it's pain, being hit by a brick or pricked by a needle, or experiencing extreme heat or hunger, is all within the mind. There is nothing in our experience that originates from the physical world, no solid entity entering our mind and manipulating our experiences. Thus, our experiences are completely detached from the domain of physical matter, and no matter how much physical abstraction we use to attempt to create an experience, they always remain fundamentally separate. There is no way to transfer those experiences from one domain to another. For instance, if we simulate a headache by mapping neural activity and creating a mental image, someone might argue that this precisely mimics the neuron contractions causing the headache. We can create a map that generates a mental image, but we cannot claim it equals the headache we experience. They exist in completely separate or orthogonal dimensions. This argument resonates with me well and has provided some perspectives on what I have written earlier. I have incorporated some of his views into the questions of mind and matter. The experiences also align with what he has said about how the mind and body function. It's not that the body creates the mind. No, the body affects the mind in a way that constructs perceptions within the mind or configures perceptions in a way where the mind's receptors or areas are susceptible to impacts. These are impressions or signals. Then, the mind reacts by generating perceptions or experiences that correspond to, correlate with, and follow up on these impacts. It's akin to the phenomenon of magnetic induction. If we pass an electric current through one coil and place another coil nearby with wires wound separately, a current in one wire instantly affects the signal in the other wire. These are completely separate, but changes in one wire immediately impact the signal in the other. Similarly, the body can impact the mind instantaneously, but they operate in distinct domains. This is how I see it. The mind and body are correlated, but this doesn't imply that our mind resides within the brain. What we experience isn't merely neurons firing and modulating synapses. That's a concept, not a reality. These processes occur within their respective domains. Like the activities of our body cells, their mechanisms, 
decay, damage, or transformations reflect and induce changes that affect the mind in a manner akin to mutual induction. There is a strong correlation, but one is not merely a byproduct of the other. Therefore, the mind is not merely a byproduct of the body or matter. In other words, the mind is not synonymous with the brain, as many scientists may suggest. The brain is predominantly composed of fat and water. It's somewhat naive or premature to think that the brain alone creates consciousness or generates perceptions, feelings, and all other mental phenomena that we constantly experience. Instead, it's our mind's tendency to react to impressions to the body in a distinctive manner, manifesting through feelings, perceptions, and consciousness internally, not controlled by a separate entity. The relationship between the body and mind can be likened to two slabs supporting each other. One aspect that I find particularly intriguing is how our consciousness and perceptions, as human beings, often lead to a unique accumulation of personal tendencies. We tend to grasp onto our emotions and perceptions, constructing our identity and thereby creating a distinction or separation from others. Our ego, emotions and experiences sustain our identity because of this personalization. Bernardo illustrated this with a diagram of a vast expanse of water in his book, Why Materialism is Baloney. When a lake or ocean is undisturbed and calm without ripples, it represents a state of mind where nothing is taken personally, neither emotions nor mental phenomena. When the mind remains tranquil, like still water in nature, without grasping, there are no whirlpools or disturbances visible in the currents. However, when individuals begin identifying with currents, such as emotions, feelings, and consciousness, ripples and locations of currents become apparent in the great expanse of water. These ripples and currents arise because individuals start to identify with them, leading to continuous ripple effects that escalate unchecked. This process of identification shapes our individuality. Bernardo describes this as a dissociative process, akin to what we call life. Life, in essence, may indeed be a dissociative process. I couldn't agree more. Life seems dissociated from the nature of reality, appearing to rebel against it like a current in constant conflict with still water. This rebellion creates unnecessary suffering through reactions. Any trace of reaction binds us and keeps us in an infinite feedback loop, trapped in a chain reaction. This is the essence of dependent origination in general terms. It operates as an automatic, efficient, self-sustaining engine of the universe. Our experience runs so efficiently that even a fusion reactor might not match its efficiency. Dependent origination recycles everything, processes it, and continually creates new experiences without waste. In this regard, I found the analogy of water currents to be remarkably fitting. It aligns well with the vortex analogy given by the Buddha. The vortex analogy that the Buddha used illustrates a deviation from the norm. He describes this vortex as arising from consciousness and nama rupa. When consciousness and nama rupa collide, they generate a vortex that traps us indefinitely in samsara or the universe. Consciousness arises and finds support in a factor called attention, anchoring onto the platform of nama rupa. Nama rupa, although not explicitly broken down here, literally means name and form. Form refers to the body, i.e. rupa, which encompasses the four great elements, earth, water, fire and air properties and perceptions. Nama includes feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. When Nama and Rupa come together with consciousness, all phenomena, the universe, and experiences are sustained for countless eons and billions of existences. We have been trapped in this cycle for trillions and trillions of eons. This dependent origination operates as a perfectly efficient 100% self-sustaining engine, running purely on a feedback loop. It requires no external source and continually seeks a body to inhabit. Once human existence ends, it may find another human body as a platform, or it may inhabit an animal or any other creature. Consciousness lands into these experiences self-generated by our own attitudes and personalization. We may as well find in elevated experiences to ascend higher realms of existence, but all these experiences are akin to a game of chance, continuing indefinitely. In a sense, it's like changing rooms without ever being able to check out. A Hotel California situation within this universe. 
I've provided several examples, as I find it fascinating to illustrate how repetitive and precarious it is to become ensnared in such a loop. While I haven't delved deeply into the Buddha's Dhamma here, I aim to offer a keen perspective on where it intersects with reality. A deeper introspection reveals that all experiences ultimately boil down to this. Rather than viewing this through the lens of religion or philosophy, it's a matter of pure direct experience of the mind. Come and see for yourself as the Buddha advised. Everything he described unfolds naturally in front of our awareness. We cannot traverse this path without leading a purified, virtuous and moral life. It's crucial. This framework might lead some to perceive it as overly religious due to refraining from conventional worldly activities. However, maintaining a pure mind, devoid of guilt and remorse, is essential. It allows us to delve deeper into introspection, unraveling the layers of the mind and progressively letting go of deeper layers. Therefore, upholding a moral life is indispensable. Unfortunately, this is why the scientific community perceives the Buddha's path as a religion. When it comes to the mind, we can't merely investigate it as in a laboratory experiment. Regardless of our conduct, we must train and purify our mind to observe its deeper layers. This approach differs significantly from scientific methods. We must cultivate a fertile ground free from unwholesome thoughts, regrets and pain. Only then can we engage directly in the science of the mind and experience firsthand what the Buddha's path entails. Chapter 7 Cases for Seeking the Unconditioned Happiness Let's engage in a thought experiment from a technical viewpoint, as if my two conflicting personas, those of a scientist and a meditator, are conversing. Argument, this human life is precious. I must make a large number of contributions to the scientific forums, discovering new technologies and methods to improve human life. I cannot selfishly practice meditation to end my own suffering while humanity as a whole is suffering. Therefore, it is better to be a good scientist, doctor, engineer, or inventor. Spiritual development seems like a waste of my valuable time. Acknowledgement. Understood. We must do more than think of our own happiness. Okay, let's assume we have been very successful. We have discovered a phenomenal idea with the potential to change human lives, such as quantum teleportation or quantum communications using the properties of entangled particles. Suppose, with the discovery of quantum phenomena, we manage to develop ingenious facilities like unbreakable secure communications. The invention benefits all humanity. But does that mean humanity is happier overall? Have they shed all suffering arising from innate dissatisfaction and obsession with material objects, mere thirsts within humanity? Reality check. To think that by discovering groundbreaking ideas and inventing new technologies, we can eliminate human suffering is like chasing a mirage. As soon as a new idea becomes reality, its counterpart, distaste and aversion towards existing conditions and new desires for better, faster, more comfortable alternatives, become inevitable. Understanding this, even at a surface level, reveals the deep paradox of our experiences. Solution. The moment one realizes that our anticipations and imaginations are insatiable mirages, one can sit back and observe. Here arise all these flows of ideas, concepts and reactions. But where do they end? Ah, this thought is now heading in the right direction. We are close to realizing that the solution to the perennial pursuit of ending suffering lies not outside, but within the mind. One begins to grasp that there may be a process underlying all these flows. Feels like deja vu. Yes, these issues were pondered over 2,600 years ago. This lies at the heart of the process, called dependent arising of all phenomena. In today's world, it is increasingly difficult to abstain from engaging in and indulging in sensory pleasures due to countless inventions and sophisticated technologies that enhance our sensory experiences. Human activities are so molded by these amenities that people feel unsettled if they lose access to them even briefly. Attachment to sensory pleasures is not a recent development in human history. Even in ancient times, including Vedic times and during the Buddha's lifetime, there were individuals whose life philosophy was centered on enjoying such pleasures. Assuming that we have only one life on earth and nothing remains after death. In fact, many people, including some very famous scientists like Stephen Hawking, argued that everything we experience will cease to exist after death. 
making a case for why we should maximize our life experiences. Such beliefs can lead to attitudes of craving more and more sensory experiences, a lack of compassion for others' welfare, and a fear of death taking away everything we possess. Convincing people that the birth of beings in various realms is the result of their past actions, and that our experience of death does not mean annihilation, but rather continuation, possibly involving even more suffering and painful experiences in future existences, was one of the most challenging aspects of the Buddha's efforts to teach the Dhamma. He recognized that the reality of our existence and suffering are not insurmountable problems or phenomena beyond our understanding. There is a way out of this labyrinth of experiences. With the advent of the Buddha, the world received the middle path, which promotes knowledge, vision and awakening, while avoiding the extremes of indulging in sensory pleasures and self-torment. While this approach makes sense for those who believe that moderation leads to a balanced life without guilt or remorse, those who practice mental development understand that the middle path holds much deeper significance. The Noble Eightfold Path is the pathway to ultimate liberation from the world of suffering, a secret tunnel to escape the trap of unfortunate existences. This path offers a recipe for freedom amidst all the calamities and disasters that result from indulging in sensory pleasures, especially for those unaware of the workings of the world of dependently arisen phenomena at the deepest levels. The reasons why indulging in sensory pleasures is harmful and even dangerous may not be immediately obvious. After all, like most people, I used to wonder what harm I would be doing if I completely immersed myself in pleasures like drinks, luxurious cars, holidays, or extravagant parties. To delve deeper into why indulging in sensory pleasure is perilous, we need to grasp the principles of karma and dependent origination. Our experiences reveal that our minds operate in specific ways that are beyond our control. For instance, as soon as our eyes perceive a beautiful form or an attractive body, our consciousness of sight arises automatically, triggering desires for pleasure that obsess our minds. The Buddha clearly articulated this in the Majjhima Nikaya 22, Alagadupama Sutta, emphasizing that expecting to indulge in sensory pleasures without succumbing to lust or obsession is wishful thinking. Because that one can engage in sensual pleasures without sensual desires, Without perceptions of sensual desire, without thoughts of sensual desire, that is impossible. Majjhima Nikaya 22, Alagadupama Sutta The reality of our universe is that beautiful forms, sounds and sense objects are indeed very scarce compared to things that are unsightly, harsh and repulsive. The universe is structured in such a way that it delicately balances to provide all beings with experiences they deserve, not necessarily what they desire. This is known as the universal law of karma, or the moral efficacy of deeds. Whether committing the gravest crimes, such as killing family members, or engaging in acts of highest generosity, the Buddha teaches that it is an inevitable fact that the consequences of these actions will manifest someday, whether in this life, in the future, or across many lifetimes. Majjhima Nikaya 136 Mahakama Vibhanga Sutta those who expect to reap short-term benefits through unethical means are deluded, as they cannot deceive the universal law of karma. It is merely wishful thinking. The universe operates as a perfect simulation of the mathematical relationships of karma, where the actions, left-hand side, and their results, right-hand side of the equation, always balance out. However, karma's workings are so intricate that one cannot predict exactly when past negative deeds will lead to intensely painful outcomes, whether it's death in a violent accident or a prolonged battle with diseases like cancer. The Buddha's teachings aim to guide us away from this cycle of karma entirely, so we can break free from the perpetual equations of experiencing the pains and pleasures of past karma. The consequences of bad karma are indeed more painful when one pursues a path of sensual pleasures unknowingly, as starkly illustrated by the Buddha in the Magandhya Sutta, using the analogy of a leper attempting to heal his sores and blisters with fire. Master Gotama, that fire is now painful to touch, hot and scorching, and previously too that fire was painful to touch, hot and scorching. For when that man was a leper with sores and blisters on his limbs, being devoured by worms, scratching the scabs off the openings of his wounds with his nails, 
his faculties were impaired. Thus, though the fire was actually painful to touch, he acquired a mistaken perception of it as pleasant. So too, Magandia, in the past, sensual pleasures were painful to touch, hot and scorching. In the future, sensual pleasures will be painful to touch, hot and scorching. And now, at present, sensual pleasures are painful to touch, hot and scorching. But these beings who are not free from lust for sensual pleasures, who are devoured by craving for sensual pleasures, who burn with fever for sensual pleasures, have faculties that are impaired. Thus, though sensual pleasures are actually painful to touch, they acquire a mistaken perception of them as pleasant. Majima Nikaya 75, Magandhya Sutta Here, the implication is not that the physical act of sensual pleasures itself is dangerous, but rather, it is the inevitable yet non-obvious arising of unwholesome states such as lust, greed and delusion that pose the true danger. These states inevitably lead to further unwholesome deeds through body, speech and mind, resulting in bad karma. The game of karma operates in such a way that if one remains fixated on sensual pleasures and loses their human existence, they will likely descend to a lower realm. The painful fire referenced here is the fire of craving, which is the root cause of all unwholesome states and the suffering experienced today. The Buddha uses this as a deterrent to motivate us towards seeking a form of happiness that is not only safe but entirely wholesome, conducive to the practice for the complete cessation of suffering. He showed us that this happiness, which transcends the pains and pleasures of the five bodily senses, can be experienced by mind with gradually letting go of all desires and perceptions. The jhanas. Attaining the joy and happiness of jhanas marks a significant step in the Noble Eightfold Path that the Buddha encouraged everyone to experience. He refuted prevalent beliefs that happiness can only be attained through painful practices of body and mind. It is crucial to emphasize that the joy and happiness experienced in the jhanas are termed spiritual or unworldly happiness, devoid of unwholesome mental states such as lust, desire and covetousness that accompany worldly or carnal sensual pleasures. In essence, the happiness and joy found in the jhanas are vastly superior and purer compared to the fleeting happiness gained from indulging in sensual pleasures. While challenging to articulate in words, those who have experienced any of the jhanas can truly appreciate this reality. This is precisely the point the Buddha aimed to convey in the Magandhya Sutta, where certain religious groups accused him of discouraging people from indulging in sensual pleasures and promoting celibacy and moderation. He substantiated his teachings by embodying this example himself first. Magandhya, formerly when I lived the home life, I enjoyed myself, provided and endowed with the five chords of sensual pleasure, with forms cognizable by the eye, with sounds cognizable by the ear, with odors cognizable by the nose, with flavors cognizable by the tongue, with tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. I had three palaces, one for the rainy season, one for the winter and one for the summer. I lived in the rain's palace for the four months of the rainy season, enjoying myself with musicians, none of whom were men, and I did not go down to the lower palace. On a later occasion, having understood as they actually are the origin, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger and the escape in the case of sensual pleasures, I abandoned craving for sensual pleasures, I removed fever for sensual pleasures, and I abide without thirst with a mind inwardly at peace. I see other beings who are not free from lust for sensual pleasures, being devoured by craving for sensual pleasures, burning with fever for sensual pleasures, indulging in sensual pleasures, and I do not envy them, nor do I delight therein. Why is that? Because there is, Magandia, a delight apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states, which surpasses even divine bliss. Since I take delight in that, I do not envy what is inferior, nor do I delight therein. Majima Nikaya, 75, Magandhya Sutta The statements above about the origination, disappearance, gratification, danger and escape concerning sensual pleasures actually refer to the experience of observing mental phenomena while practicing mindfulness and letting go of unwholesome states. Implicitly, the Buddha is indicating that one begins to unravel how dependently arisen phenomena work 
and cease by letting go of these states. This process involves experiencing the four jhanas. The jhanas are highly pleasurable states distinct from any worldly experiences and are the rewards for patiently purifying the mind of unwholesome states. One can enter and abide in the jhanas only after letting go of sensual desires and the five hindrances. The Buddha showed us the way to experience all four jhanas, first, second, third and fourth, where one progressively weakens the five hindrances and cultivates the seven awakening factors. More on this is covered in part three of the book. The loss of these gross sensory feelings does not lead to annihilation or fear. Instead, happiness arises from the mind being free of these defiled states. Here is what the Buddha had to say about this process. But I teach a doctrine for getting rid of the gross acquired self, whereby defiling mental states disappear and states tending to purification grow strong, and one gains and remains in the purity and perfection of wisdom here and now, having realized and attained it by one's own super-knowledge. Now, Potapada, you might think, perhaps these defiling mental states might disappear, and one might still be unhappy. That is not how it should be regarded. If defiling states disappear, nothing but happiness and delight develops, tranquility, mindfulness, and clear awareness. And that is a happy state. Diga Nikaya Onin, Potapada Sutta. Now we know the danger of sensual pleasure and why it is so fearful. What kind of happiness should be cultivated then? Here is what the Buddha is saying about jhanas. Bhikkhus, there are these five cords of sensual pleasure. What five? Forms cognizable by the eye, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five cords of sensual pleasure. Now the pleasure and joy that arise, dependent on these five cords of sensual pleasure, are called sensual pleasure. A filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure. I say of this pleasure that it should not be pursued, that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated, and that it should be feared. Here, Bhikkhus, Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana. This is called the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. I say of this pleasure that it should be pursued, that it should be developed, that it should be cultivated, and that it should not be feared. Majjima Nikaya 139 Aranavibhanga Sutta. This book will go into a lot of details of Janas in subsequent chapters. So I will not explain more details here, as I still have many other cases to prove that there are many other valid reasons for seeking such happinesses. A taste of the unconditioned and grand futility of the samsara. The Buddha recapped the state of the world, samsara, to those who have developed his path and seen its futility in a very beautiful simile of some children playing with sandcastles. Suppose, Radha, some little boys or girls are playing with sandcastles. So long as they are not devoid of lust, desire, affection, thirst, passion and craving for those sandcastles, they cherish them, play with them, treasure them and treat them possessively. But when those little boys or girls lose their lust, desire, affection, thirst, passion and craving for those sandcastles, then they scatter them with their hands and feet, demolish them, shatter them and put them out of play. Samyutta Nikaya 23.2. A being. Those who understand the state of the samsara are clearly very intelligent boys and girls as they quickly grasp the world and become disenchanted. But the world is not as simple as a sandcastle, I agree. It requires a lot of thought and insight. The entirety of the world can be encapsulated in the experience of the six senses. Nothing more. The senses are like Lego pieces or sand particles the raw materials that form shapes like castles, animals, or anything else of interest. Now, interest is something akin to a glue that binds these particles together to create shapes that captivate us. The key lies in contemplation and finding moments of complete stillness amidst all activities. The world operates like a movie composed of frames. When these frames are revealed, the reality of the movie is also exposed. This is what meditation and jhanas do to our mind. 
They reveal the true nature of the mind and demonstrate how our reality is merely a composite phenomenon that is inherently empty, yet we are constantly deceived by the mind's movements. Case for continuation of the world. It is not uncommon to hear voices like these. The world has offered me the best tasting dinners in the most luxurious hotels on paradisiacal beaches of pristine islands. Surely it is absurd not to seek such opportunities. Such rarities must be celebrated and pursued. The world has given the best voices and music, like Beethoven, Beatles, and Yagjit Singh. Such masterpieces are the pinnacle of human arts and ingenuity. Why let them go for the sake of some practice, leading to cessation of our emotions and care for them? I am one of the most renowned scientists in the world with a Nobel Prize in physics. My discoveries have helped humanity by providing nuclear energy, which can power billions of homes without resorting to fossil fuels. Surely people like me will make Earth a heaven one day. All these experiences touch the extremes of our sensory bases. Their value is proportionate to the desire one places on them or how much access one actually has to them. So, there are valid reasons to continue engaging with the world and to strive to make it a better place. But as I mentioned earlier, regardless of how many sublime activities we engage in, the universe remains a ruthless place. We can never escape bad karma, even if we perform infinitely meritorious deeds, as we inevitably get pulled by sensual pleasures at times when craving overwhelms us and lack of mindfulness fails to lead us away from it. The Buddha teaches that even the highest bliss arising from the world is not even the sixteenth part of the bliss from a mind devoid of craving. I know it may not make sense to us now, but direct experience of all the jhanas can make this claim much easier to accept. It may surprise us to learn that there is an experience where any urge to see tantalizing scenery or the desire to dress impressively fades away. Our previous need for exquisite dinners becomes unnecessary as there is no such need anymore. The urge to fly at a thousand miles per hour via a private jet over the Caribbean or other exotic places is unnecessary, as there is no desire to escape anywhere. There is no need for a roof to avoid the cold or heat of worldly weather, as there is no discomfort pushing us to seek a luxury apartment. In short, when any sensory excitement and the desire for it vanish, there is no craving for sensual pleasure. In such a state, we discover an experience called cessation of desire, cessation of feeling, cessation of craving, cessation of mind and body, and cessation of consciousness. But it still constitutes an experience. It is an experience devoid of any sensation, yet replete with peace, calm, and contentment. A perpetual freedom from fear, death, pain, debacles, and disasters. No more nightmares or frightening experiences that snatch our lives away again and again. In such a realm, there is simply no need for geniuses who may discover quantum computers with unlimited problem-solving capabilities or perfect fusion reactors providing free, unlimited clean energy forever. These innovations make sense if we need them. If we don't, they simply do not matter. Those who experience cessation of craving in this very life have already tasted what lies beyond. So do not take life so seriously. Science without wisdom may be futile in the long runs. Science is a human endeavor with an objective to harness the power of our imagination, deeply observe natural phenomena, to discover new knowledge and applications based on these combinations. The word objective here is key. So far, the objective has always been how to achieve gains in terms of what can be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched, and ideas. All the advancements of science can be attributed to these six senses. A scientist may discover a superconductor that can significantly reduce energy waste due to heat. However, this will not liberate one from the inevitability of illness and death. Science does not provide us with the means to free ourselves from experiencing these states, nor does it offer a certain way out of all human miseries. Now let's contrast this with the story of someone who has trained their mind to see things as they truly are in terms of their experiences. Such a person recognizes that their reactions to thoughts, feelings, and ideas fuel further actions that perpetuate endless chains of thoughts, emotions, plans, and ambitions. By observing the mind and letting go of all reactions as they arise, one immediately puts an end to the potential infinite proliferation of these mental activities. 
In that stillness, they accomplish what needs to be done in each moment. While this may seem like giving up opportunities for worldly gains, such a person achieves something crucial and fundamental. They prevent any future consequences of actions that would have led to gains or losses through the six senses. If we examine closely, neither science nor the pursuit of worldly gains can free us from the cycle of repeated death, sorrow and pain that inevitably accompany our existence. The game of life and death itself. However, for someone who has seen the flow of the mind clearly as it arises, the reward may not be visible or measurable in conventional terms, but they have succeeded in transcending the game of life and death. We will delve deeper into this game later on. According to the teachings of the Buddha, human life is sustained by the delicate balance resulting from the interplay of two interdependent processes, our vital sense faculties, designations, nama rupa, and sense consciousnesses. These two exist in a continuum, mirroring each other endlessly, fueled by a desire or intention to act. Doing nothing is considered the annihilation of our experiences. This fundamental truth is the deepest conundrum of our existence, referred to as the vortex in Pali texts. It would indeed be a strange idea that our everyday experiences arise from an endless current generated by the convergence of nama rupa and consciousness. In the West, a widespread belief persists that with the end of the body and the exhaustion of vitality, what we call the self or individuality, also perishes at the moment of death. This belief fosters the notion that one can escape the consequences of deeds with the end of life and be free from all liabilities, regardless of one's conduct in life. However, there is karma, and no one can escape the consequences of their deeds. Being subject to karma repeatedly is painful and exhausting, whereas liberation from it constitutes ultimate bliss. What role does mindfulness play in this understanding? Why did only the Buddha emphasize it? What distinguishes it from other spiritual traditions like the Vedas, Upanishads, and their meditation practices? These are natural and valid questions anyone can ask. It is easy to dismiss mindfulness and the path of virtue, collectedness and wisdom taught by the Buddha as futile and incorrect methods. I encourage readers to let go of any preconceived notions, religious biases, and assumptions about various ideas, and instead focus on facts and open-minded attitudes. Let direct experiential understanding of the mind be the yardstick for evaluating which practice is best to see everything I have said directly for oneself. Chapter 8. Mindfulness and Vedic Philosophies The uninstructed worldling becomes frightened over an unfrightening matter. For this is frightening to the uninstructed worldling, it might not be, and it might not be for me, it will not be, and it will not be for me. But the instructed noble disciple does not become frightened over an unfrightening matter. For this is not frightening to the noble disciple, it might not be, and it might not be for me, it will not be, and it will not be for me. Samyutta Nikaya, 2255, Inspired Utterance now that I have made a compelling case for seeking happiness that is not tied to material things, I will explore other views before delving deep into the realms of the mind and direct experiences. Here, I will cover philosophies widely found in Eastern and specifically Indian landscapes. These philosophies and beliefs are intricately linked with the concept of reality, a term that has remained mysterious and enigmatic, with no definitive conclusions about what ultimate reality truly is. Vedic philosophies are known to humanity as the earliest scriptures attempting to unravel the nature of reality. They are considered utterances of the Supreme God, also commonly known as Brahman. The Vedas largely contain ritualistic hymns related to sacrificial ceremonies and chants for various traditions. Historical evidence suggests that the earliest Vedas date back to around 1000 to 3000 BC. Among the Vedas, the Upanishads are considered the most profound texts concerning the nature of reality, human experiences and practices for the realization of union with Brahman. This chapter will explore the key tenets of these texts to understand the basis of these thoughts, the practices involved, and how they differ from the path of mindfulness. Even before the time of the Buddha, Vedic philosophers such as Athaka, Vamaka, Vamadeva, Bharadvaja, and Agirasa pondered over the notion of reality. Their names were mentioned by the Buddha in the Pali Nikayas. 
indicating that these philosophical inquiries existed perhaps hundreds of years before him, with the rise of human civilizations. Throughout history, people have always been intrigued by the idea of understanding and connecting with ultimate reality. The time of the Buddha was no exception, as various philosophies, speculations and beliefs coexisted. I wrote this chapter to share my understanding with a Dhamma friend named Mr. Morali, whose full name I am not aware of. He raised a question regarding the mention of the Saviti or Gayatri Mantra in Buddhist suttas, particularly in Majjhima Nikaya 92 Sela Sutta. In India and Nepal, this mantra is well known as the Gayatri Mantra. Mantras are hymns that have been chanted for hundreds of years, and this one is derived from the Rig Veda, one of the earliest Vedic texts. During the time of the Buddha, there were three Vedas, and a fourth Veda called the Athava Veda was added later. The Buddha refers to the Gayatri Mantra as one of the most revered mantras among those who follow Vedic beliefs. He mentions this in the Sela Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 92 Sela Sutta, where he engages in a conversation with a Brahmin. During this discourse, he provides reference to these mantras and their significance in their spiritual practice. When the Buddha was invited for a meal, as a gesture of gratitude, he mentioned the Gayatri Mantra to express his well wishes. The Gayatri Mantra consists of three verses and twenty-four syllables. It is considered to be the beginning of a profound concept, acknowledging the presence of an ultimate reality or a universal being that is the supreme creator of the entire universe. One of the significant syllables in this mantra is the word Om, which holds great significance in various Vedic spiritual traditions. Om Purbhuvasuva, Tatsavitur Varenyam, Bhargo Devasya Dhamahi, Diyoyona Prachodayat. Rigveda 362, 110. The Gayatri Mantra is a cryptic verse that suggests the existence of a supreme being who governs every cell, atom, molecule, and particle in the universe. It is a hymn of praise for the Supreme Creator, often referred to as the Supreme Glory or a source of divine light. By reciting this mantra, individuals seek enlightenment and the experience of joy and the glory associated with the Supreme Being. Indeed, the Gayatri Mantra has been interpreted and translated by various philosophers and scholars, each offering their own understanding. Swami Vivekananda's interpretation focuses on meditating on the glory of the Supreme Being who created the universe, seeking enlightenment of the mind. Munir Williams emphasizes meditating on the excellent glory of the divine vivifying sun, seeking enlightenment of understanding. In the Vedic philosophical landscape, light is often seen as a symbol of auspiciousness and supreme knowledge. These interpretations reflect the significance of the Gayatri Mantra in Vedic philosophical traditions. In Buddha's teachings, the emphasis is not on seeking enlightenment through external divine beings or external sources. Instead, the Buddha teaches that the path to enlightenment lies within oneself through the cultivation of wisdom, compassion, and mindfulness. The practice of meditation in the Dhamma is a means to develop insight and understanding of the true nature of reality, including the nature of the mind itself. It is through direct experience and personal realization that one can attain liberation from suffering. So, while the concept of light and enlightenment may be present in various philosophical traditions, the approach and focus differ in the Buddha's path, emphasizing inner transformation and personal realization. Followers of this text envision a concept that there is a supreme being, a universal creator that defines all experiences, beings, and everything around us, and encompasses all imagination and notions. Everything is believed to be under the control of that supreme being. This belief is an established view among the followers of what we call Vedic philosophers, predating even the time of the Buddha. In the Indian subcontinent, they were seeking awakening and enlightenment. However, what they found was just the development of diverse philosophies without a consistent message or a core practice that unifies them. Thus, they couldn't settle on one particular backbone or a unified practice. They were divided into numerous groups. In the three Vedas, there are more than 100 Upanishads, which are extracted from the three Vedas. The Vedas focus more on rituals and practices related to solitude and austerity, while the Upanishads are more philosophy-oriented and closer to meditation. 
they aim for a higher level of realization and understanding of the ultimate reality. Out of Upanishads that are more than 100, around 20 are considered the root, Mula Upanishads, which are derived from the Vedas like Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, and Samaveda. These Vedas and Upanishads hold a significant place in Vedic literature, being regarded as the ultimate authority. Although I haven't extensively studied them or delved into detailed research, my general understanding is that they represent the culmination of Vedic and Brahmanic philosophies. They serve as a profound source of wisdom and knowledge. It is also referred to as Vedanta, and what I've observed as a distinct difference between their philosophies and what the Buddha taught is that the teachings of the Vedas and Upanishads lean towards the concept of a supreme being, as exemplified by the Gayatri Mantra with the syllable Om. This mantra introduces the idea of an all-pervading creator, and these views were presented in the early Upanishads. However, it's important to note that the universal creator mentioned in these texts is referred to as Brahman, which is distinct from the Hindu god Brahma. What the early Upanishads stated was that Brahman is the ultimate reality. However, in the later Upanishads, there was a slight fuzziness, and they began to contemplate how one could attain liberation if the ultimate reality is beyond direct contact. They started to develop the philosophy of soul or Atman, which refers to the smallest, most essential entity within oneself. One could consider it similar to the concept of an atom. Atman represents the unbreakable essence within oneself. According to these philosophies, all experiences are composed of this core, which remains unaffected regardless of the experiences one goes through, such as birth, death, pleasure, pain, happiness or sorrow. All those fleeting, impermanent experiences are considered unreal and temporary, while the core of oneself, the Atman, remains unaffected by any attained experiences. The concept of Atman developed to address this understanding. However, a problem arose for the later Upanishads in reconciling these conflicting views on the ultimate reality. They had to find a way to unify these perspectives and settle on a single truth. They concluded that there cannot be more than one truth and proposed the idea that the highest realization of inner truth occurs when the Atman merges with Brahman. This is where the ultimate reality lies. And those are the core ideas in the development of the philosophies of what we call yoga. These various yogic philosophies aim to bridge the gap between the universal Brahman and the individual self. They are highly regarded in the philosophical landscape of India and held in high esteem. From what I understand, the Buddha was familiar with these philosophies and had knowledge of the three Vedas. There are numerous instances where the Buddha addressed Brahmins acknowledging their expertise in the Vedas, grammar and literature. However, he also pointed out that despite their accumulation of knowledge, their behavior and attitude did not reflect a true understanding of the body, mind and the practice of inner development. That's why Buddha dismisses their teachings in a very fundamental way. He points out that despite their extensive knowledge and learning from countless books, their behavior and mindfulness indicate a lack of understanding of how their real-world experiences align with the development of the mind. The Buddha emphasizes that true reality is when theory is put into practice, when one's experiences in body, speech and mind intersect with mindfulness. This practical application is where the essence of teachings such as the Majjhima Nikaya, 95, Kanki Sutta comes into play. In these suttas, Buddha imparts basic lessons on maintaining mindfulness, which some Brahmins fail to grasp. They struggle to pass the basic test of understanding what true awakening entails. So there is a fundamental difference in the definition of awakening between Vedic philosophies and Buddha's teachings. The latter, as a teaching, stands apart and differs significantly from Vedic philosophies. Although I have not extensively studied numerous texts on Vedic philosophies, including the Upanishads, I couldn't find a single definition of mindfulness within them. Despite the large number of pages in these texts, there seems to be a lack of understanding or mention of mindfulness. It is quite surprising considering the prominence and influence of these texts. Their common way of expressing mindfulness is by saying that being mindful means being aware of whatever we are experiencing or aware of. They understand mindfulness as being aware of our experiences in general. However, the definition of mindfulness in Buddha's teachings goes much deeper. 
In the suttas, mindfulness is referred to as sati, which has a more refined and precise meaning. In everyday language, sati can be translated as clear awareness or attention. It implies being fully present and consciously aware of the present moment, understanding what one is doing at a more subtle level. The understanding in Vedic philosophies for mindfulness is not clear. It may be simply a general awareness or a basic level of attentiveness. However, when we delve into the suttas, the definition of mindfulness becomes much deeper. Mindfulness, at its core, encompasses various aspects, and there are several significant suttas that highlight its importance, such as the Satipatthana Sutta, which outlines the four foundations of mindfulness. These four foundations serve as the basis for attaining full awakening. As mindfulness develops, the practitioner progressively hones their observational skills, referred to as yonisomanasikara, or mindful attention of the root. This practice is continuously refined through the elements of relinquishment and relaxation. Relinquishment involves letting go of accumulated attachments or distractions that arise within the field of phenomena. Relaxation, on the other hand, refers to releasing any impact or imprint that these phenomena may have on the body and mind. By cultivating these two elements, the observation of the mind sharpens and mindfulness becomes razor sharp, eventually transforming into what the Buddha referred to as yonisomanasikara, or attention directed towards the root of all things. The term yonisomanasikara is a heightened form of the ordinary attention, manasikara, which pertains to normal observation of the mind. When one engages in observation, they observe what is visible, heard or sensed through the six senses. However, this normal observation does not delve into the root cause analysis. In contrast, Yoni Somanazikara is a solution to the very problem that the Buddha sought to address, the problem of suffering, birth, aging and death. In Western countries, the concept of root cause analysis is commonly employed to solve problems by identifying the underlying causes. Similarly, the practice of Yoni Somanasikara goes beyond surface-level observation and delves into the root causes of suffering. It seeks to understand why individuals' attention becomes entangled in the cycle of phenomena and inevitable suffering, and whether there exists a way to transcend it directly without resorting to abstract metaphysics. The Buddha was the first researcher in this lab, so to speak. He can be considered the first scientist who embarked on inner exploration conducting his own research and testing within his own mind. This process allowed him to unravel the intricate workings of the mind. Yoni so manasikara is the sharpening of observational skills to such a fine degree that it exposes the entire spectrum of reality, including the atoms and molecules that make up all our experiences. During the night of his awakening, the Buddha delved into the root causes of all the problems and suffering experienced in everyday life he started to trace them back, step by step. Gradually, he went beyond the experience of pleasure and pain, realizing that there was something preceding it. He discovered that contact was the cause of those sensory experiences. If there is no contact with external phenomena, those feelings on sense bases simply won't arise. This can be easily observed in everyday examples. He understood that feelings arise as soon as there is a sense of contact, and when contact is removed, the feeling ceases immediately. This was his approach to understanding the origin of experiences. He concluded that feelings are dependent on contact. Next, he examined the concept of contact and realized that contact is the meeting of two or more particles of phenomena. He questioned what these particles were. He recognized that as human beings, we all possess six senses. The body, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and mind. These are the internal bases. Then he explored the external bases and observed that when the eyes encounter colors and forms, the nose encounters smells, and the tongue encounters flavors, respective contacts occur. It became clear to him that contact arises from the coming together of these internal and external sense bases. However, this raised a new problem. We understand the internal and the external, and there is a coming together that creates contact. That is easy to understand. Now what is the difference between human beings and inanimate matter? For example, when we strike two bricks together, they also make contact. But what is the fundamental difference between the contact of inanimate matter and the contact experienced by sentient beings? What distinguishes beings with emotions, feelings, 
and consciousness from inanimate objects. The only factor that sets them apart is consciousness. So what is this consciousness? This inquiry led to the exploration of the concept of consciousness. What causes this consciousness to arise? Then he looked at eye consciousness, how the eye and form come into contact, and the arising of eye consciousness. He demonstrated that consciousness arises when the internal and external bases come together. The occurrence of consciousness is not a mere coincidence. It is not random. It consistently arises whenever there is contact between the eye and form. This is not a statistical or random sampling phenomenon. It is a well-established and easily repeatable pattern. Consciousness is a regular occurrence resulting from the meeting of the internal and external sense spheres, their conjunction and the arising of consciousness. Therefore, consciousness arises only under certain conditions. This is clearly explained in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 28. In this sutta, known as the Mahahatipadopama Sutta, a detailed analysis of the five aggregates is provided. It is stated that consciousness does not arise independently. Rather, it arises when there is a functioning eye and a visible form, and there is a corresponding conscious engagement. In other words, consciousness arises only when there is an internal and external connection. As the Venerable Sariputta said, Friend, it is with the eye and visible forms that consciousness arises. If friend internally, the eye is intact, but no external forms come into range, and there is no corresponding conscious engagement, then there is no manifestation of corresponding section of consciousness. So that means we understand that having a good working eye is not enough. We also need to have a basis of form. So this is clear. What it's saying is that it's not enough to just have the eyes and form for consciousness to arise. It won't. But then he says... When internally the eye is intact and external forms come into its range and there is corresponding conscious engagement, then there is the manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness. Okay, so what we are saying here is that consciousness does not come automatically. It has to be triggered by some element, some engagement. What is that engagement? That engagement is called Nama Rupa. Nama Rupa is divided into two parts. Nama refers to the naming aspect of external forms, and Rupa refers to the physical form composed of the four great elements. Now let's break down Nama into its constituent parts. Nama consists of feeling, perception, contact, intention and attention. These aspects are crucial for the arising of consciousness. We can say that consciousness would only arise if there is a corresponding conscious engagement. This engagement is the Nama aspect of Nama Rupa. On the other hand, Rupa is something that is perceived by the senses, such as the eyes or ears. The internal aspect is Nama, which includes feeling, perception, contact, intention and attention. Feeling at this stage is a subtle notion of the experience. Perception is an attempt to understand the experience. Contact, as mentioned before, is the coming together of the internal and external. The remaining two aspects, intention and attention, are closely related to the activities associated with karma, what we call sankara. Attention is bound with the element of consciousness. Only if we pay attention does consciousness arise. Now let's take a step back. What the Buddha discovered was that we can have an eye, and the eye is indirectly in the vicinity of a form. So the meeting of these two has the potential for union. However, if there is no attention, if we do not pay attention to the coming together of these phenomena, there will be no consciousness. Let's clarify with an example. So a driver is driving a lorry on a motorway and he is extremely tired. All of a sudden his attention slips for a brief moment, maybe just a few seconds. During that moment, his eyes are open, he is in a seated position, but his consciousness is not fully present. He doesn't see what is on the road and as a result, he crashes the lorry and falls onto the motorway. In this situation, the eye and the form were present but consciousness slipped because he was not paying attention. He couldn't perceive or make sense of the phenomena around him because he wasn't attending to them. That clarifies how in everyday life we can experience moments where consciousness is derailed. We may see something with our eyes, but we are unable to make sense of it. This absence of consciousness occurs because the corresponding conscious engagement or attention is not present. This interpretation highlights how Nama Rupa influences consciousness. It allows us to understand the causes and conditions that lead to a particular present moment 
and the preceding phenomena that contributed to it. That's how the Buddha approached phenomena by conducting a root cause analysis. He recognized that for consciousness to arise, certain elements needed to be present. There had to be contact, feeling, perception, attention, and intention. Intention, in turn, would influence subsequent actions and provide choices for engaging in activities through body, speech, and mind. These formations or conditioned phenomena would arise accordingly. Thus, the Buddha discovered that Nama Rupa, the combination of feeling, perception, contact, intention, and attention, was the factor that caused consciousness to arise. He then investigated what caused Nama Rupa to arise and found that it depended on awareness. Without awareness, these mental and physical phenomena would not arise. It is through awareness or consciousness that one is able to feel, perceive, and make contact with the external world. Awareness acts as the foundation for the arising of Nama Rupa and subsequent consciousness. What the Buddha realized is that consciousness and the mental and physical phenomena of Nama Rupa are interconnected in a continuous cycle. They mutually influence each other, like two mirrors reflecting one another. This ongoing cycle perpetuates the world of experiences in which we find ourselves. The experiences of consciousness and the formations that arise from them become the cause for subsequent actions and intentions. This continuous cycle of intention, attention, formations, and consciousness fuels the process of cause and effect, shaping our experiences and actions within the world. In a discourse by the Buddha in the Diga Nikaya, a bhikkhu asks about the cessation of nama and rupa and where the cycle of existence comes to an end. The Buddha explains that when there is a consciousness that does not engage with or depend on nama and rupa, when it is free from their influence and does not find any support in them, this is the state where nama and rupa are completely cut off and cease to leave any traces. This state of consciousness is beyond the realm of nama and rupa, transcending their influence and limitations. The Buddha called this the unestablished or non-manifestative consciousness. Actually, this is the core of the links of dependent origination. We know that although some may say dependent origination is linear and follows a series of chains, where one link follows another like dominoes stacked together, it's not that simple. I mean, the most complicated part of the links of dependent origination is the relationship between consciousness and all the experiences. All these experiences, such as contact, feeling, perception, craving, clinging, and so on, follow one another. Our experiences are entangled by the duality of consciousness and Nama Rupa. I have seen some books, like by Bhikkhu Nananda. Nyanananda, The Law of Dependent Arising, The Secret of Bondage and Release, 2016, where he gives an example of a dog looking at another dog walking on a plank over a stream. The dog stays still and starts barking, thinking that there is a dog underneath the wooden plank. But that dog doesn't realize that it's actually looking at its own reflection. It sees a dog underneath, but it's just a reflection. This situation is similar to us, as we often think that the world in front of us is completely independent and fully formed, a fully separate and real reality. But that's not the case. It's because of our engagement with phenomena that they turn into the image of that reality. So it's like that dog looking through the plank of wood and seeing its image, and it starts thinking that there is another dog in front of it. This is how our world, with its six senses and our perception of reality, is constructed through the engagement of consciousness and Nama Rupa, Nanananda 2012. Now, how do we demystify and understand our true reality? It's important to note that the exploration of the nature of reality is not unique to Buddhism. Many Vedic philosophers, rishis, seers, and ascetics were also grappling with the same question. They were trying to unravel the mystery of Brahman, Atman, and other concepts, seeking a realization that there is one ultimate reality. They delved into the realm of concepts and the understanding that this ultimate reality is all-pervading and unknowable through personal experiences. Each concept is their own, and obviously, what was missing and what they were not realizing is also subjective and dependently arisen. We can't say whether they are wrong or right in their pursuit. They may be completely right in their own journey, believing that they have united with their ultimate Brahman or Atman, and that this union represents their ultimate reality and liberation. If that is their truth, we are happy for them to have arrived at it. 
We don't need to agree or be afraid of their philosophies or their way of uniting with the ultimate reality. It's something we leave to each individual to decide whether they would embrace such philosophies and realizations or prefer to explore and discover the truth for themselves through direct experience. It's a personal choice to seek awakening and understand what it truly means. The Buddha did not provide a solution to the question of ultimate reality. He regarded such speculations and philosophical debates as completely futile. These distractions kept one away from the reality of the present moment. The Buddha did not waste a single moment delving into those speculations and debates because they would only take one further away from the truth. Those ideas, concepts and speculations would distract from developing mindfulness. They can be in direct opposition to what the Buddha encouraged us to discover for ourselves. They would steer us away from the practice of remaining present and mindful. What the Buddha is saying is that we, as human beings, have a unique opportunity to discover the truth. Instead of spending our lives seeking external causes for our experiences and engaging in endless philosophies, the Buddha taught a simple and practical approach. He taught four fundamental aspects of our reality. Understanding suffering, understanding its cause, realizing its end, and following the path leading to its cessation. This is what he taught. It's up to us to decide whether we want to explore the vast universe of speculation or focus our precious human existence on understanding these essential truths. Yes, so the Buddha provided a straightforward answer to questions about the right path and approach to take. He always avoided engaging in speculative views. However, this doesn't mean that the Buddha was evading or trying to dodge them. He was aware of those views. If we want to explore what the Buddha thought or said about speculative views, there is a very good discourse called the Brahma Jala Sutta in the Dikha Nikaya. It explains that even the philosophies of the Vedas can be categorized into one of these 62 speculative views. There is nothing that cannot fall into one of these views. Whether it is a concept of universal consciousness, a universal being, or an all-pervading supreme being, consciousness and all other perceptions are in the domain of concepts. What the Buddha says is that there are many spheres of being and countless experiences. All these sorts of experiences and pursuits of supernatural powers or psychic abilities, such as the ability to remember past existences, do not lead to the ultimate truth or solve the fundamental problem of suffering. These speculations and supernormal abilities do not address the issue of being conditioned by what conditions. The Buddha presents his teachings of dependent origination in the Brahmajala Sutta as the supreme fact connected with reality. I believe that if anyone truly seeks the ultimate reality, they should consider reading this discourse. If we are after the ultimate reality and really want to know what is beyond all these philosophies, speculations and everything, then I suggest you read this. In the Brahmajala Sutta Digha Nikaya 1, the Buddha discusses the last four categories among the 62 speculative views. He explains the four jhanas, stating that one will experience them as they progress through the jhanas. For example, in the first jhana, one would let go of hindrances, sense pleasures, and unwholesome states, then enter and abide in the first jhana. This first jhana is characterized by rapture and pleasure born of seclusion from hindrances, as well as happiness born of seclusion a state of great happiness and joy. Those beings who experience jhanas and think it is the ultimate reality fall into categories 59 to 62 of those speculative views. What the Buddha is saying is that experiencing jhana does not lead to awakening. In other words, we can experience jhanas, but they do not lead to liberation from samsara. I should also mention that the Buddha says if we experience a jhana and at the end of our life do not progress any further, there is a certain heaven we will be reborn into. For those beings who experience the first jhana, it's called the form realm, where the lifespan of that being is 100 mahakapas. One mahakapa is equivalent to around 10,021 years, so 100 mahakapas would be 10,023 years, a remarkably long time. They may experience bliss and think it is the ultimate reality, but it is still a speculative view and a delusion caused by their experiences. Now, this leads to the progression to the next experience, which is the second jhana. In the second jhana, one enters a subtler realm of joy and happiness without thinking and examining thoughts. In the second jhana, there is only rapture and pleasure, without any thinking or examining thoughts. 
The lifespan of beings in the second jhana is 200 mahakapas. Moving on to the third jhana, the rapture and pleasure cease, and there is only deep happiness within the body, accompanied by strong equanimity. The third jhana has a lifespan of 400 mahakapas. In the fourth jhana, beings experience a lifespan of 500 mahakapas. In this realm, beings have let go of pleasure and pain and abide in equanimity. However, even in the experience of equanimity, there is still a subtle layer of identification or speculation. The realm of these experiences is still bound by speculative views. So what is that speculative view? In the Brahmajala Sutta, at the very end, all these speculative views are discussed. People who repeatedly experience them do not realize that they are conditioned by feelings. These feelings, in turn, are conditioned by contact. They are constantly contacted by the senses, and as a result, they are swept away by the current of dependent origination. Contact serves as a condition for the arising of feelings, and with feelings as a condition, craving arises. With craving as a condition, acquisition arises, also known as upadana. With acquisition as a condition, existence arises. Habitual tendencies emerge from existence, leading to the cycle of taking on a body and undergoing rebirth. Each time one takes rebirth, they have to endure the suffering and pain associated with having a body. So what the Buddha is saying is that in order to truly understand the full depth of the links of dependent origination and the concept of contact, one must comprehend the Four Noble Truths. Without this understanding, it doesn't matter if one experiences the four jhanas or the formless realms such as infinite space or infinite consciousness. Even if beings in those realms live for thousands of mahakapas and experience immense happiness and joy, they will remain trapped in the cycle of conditioned existence. The Buddha provides this recipe for awakening, freedom from any conditions, emphasizing that experiencing supernatural or supernormal abilities and the bliss that accompanies them is not enough to attain the status of an Arya disciple. Representing a noble disciple in the superhuman category, who has transcended conditioned existence. That means those who are Ariyas, who have completely seen the conditioned reality caused by these links of dependent origination, and have directly experienced and seen that this seeing leads to liberation from the cycle of dependent origination. This is the fundamental difference. The distinction lies in the fundamental practice of mindfulness. Some people think that mindfulness is trivial and trivialize it considering it common and believing they have superior experiences, such as accessing realms of bliss or having supernormal experiences. However, in doing so, they delve into realms far removed from the present moment, losing awareness and becoming completely detached from the reality of the present moment. They mistakenly believe they are superior to those who practice mindfulness. If we go to India and Nepal, we will encounter rishis and various ascetics residing in caves in the Himalayas. They may claim to be in a state of superhuman or to be godlike beings, infatuated with their own attainment. However, as mentioned earlier, the Buddha was able to observe the behavior of those Brahmins, masters of the Vedas, and noted how they failed to practice mindfulness and control their anger. They expressed displeasure and reviled the Buddha, displaying their dissatisfaction without even understanding the nature of the five hindrances. Basically, they were not even familiar with the basic principles of mindfulness of the body. They didn't understand how the body reacts to feelings and how this can lead to displeasure, resulting in unskillful actions of body, speech, and mind. This lack of mindfulness is the underlying issue. I'm presenting this viewpoint without passing judgment on different philosophies or experiences. Everyone has the freedom to choose the path they believe is right for them. When it comes to our basic senses as human beings, it boils down to having a sense of morality, calmness, and composure, known as Sama Samadhi in Buddhism. It also involves having a vision and understanding derived from direct experience. This is the path that I personally follow, and I don't need to be persuaded by anyone claiming I am right or wrong. It is based on what I have personally observed and experienced. When it comes to different ideas, interpretations, and philosophies, we need to assess them based on our own experiences and how they contribute to our overall well-being. This becomes the criterion for determining whether we are on the right path or not, rather than relying solely on ideas and concepts. To provide some perspective, I have gleaned this from my reading of various texts, 
and I will provide some commentary on what I have found from these readings. There is a book that serves as a summary of all the Upanishads, titled The Realization of the Absolute, Krishnananda, 1947. The Absolute is referred to as Brahman in Vedic philosophy. The Absolute is unworldly in the sense that it has not, as the world has, distinctions of space, time and individuality, or name, form and action. Liberation is the possession and experience of unlimited, undivided consciousness of the Bhuma, or the plenitude of existence. There cannot also be any question in regard to the position of power, rulership and the like, in the state of the highest liberation. These are all relative notions of individuals. The ultimate reality is the absolute, which is non-dual, and therefore, there is no scope for the operation of an objective power in it. The absolute itself is power, not merely an exerciser of power. Power is a separative factor, a means to create duality, which is nullified in the absolute. The truly liberated one does not feel that he is the lord of anyone else, which notion involves distinction in existence, but he has the eternal experience of the essence of infinity. Okay, it sounds quite lofty and fantastic, presenting an amazing type of experience. Essentially, it all comes down to the concept that as soon as there is demarcation and power exercised by someone, phenomena bifurcate into two parts, the creator and the one exercising power. This duality is seen as the source of all problems. By understanding this fact, it seems they lean towards a philosophy of duality. However, when this duality dissolves and the distinction between the two is eliminated, they become unified. There is no longer a distinction between the doer and the deed, the sensor and the sensed, or the experiencer and the experience. They perceive a dissolution of the two sides of experience into one. This is considered the ultimate reality. So this is the essence and conclusion of the book. It immediately brings to mind the idea of union or some form of unification that transcends duality. It seems to move away from the present moment and engage in the realm of concepts. This is precisely what we refer to as the realm of concepts. It is the concept that there exists an absolute, devoid of any duality. This philosophy represents the true realization of the ultimate from the Upanishads. I find it relevant to show them some passages from the Sutta that discuss the Buddha's perspective on these ideas and concepts. The Buddha explains that such thoughts and concepts arise due to one's reaction to feelings. According to the Buddha, it is a very subtle feeling that arises when one imagines these ideas in the mind. However, they fail to realize that this imagination is created when the mind comes into contact with the object of the mind, resulting in the arising of consciousness. This contact gives rise to feelings, which then generate various ideas, concepts, and notions of ultimate reality, non-ultimate reality, duality, union, and other emotions. Ultimately, it all boils down to philosophical discussions. Even if it is not a philosophy, there are realms where, if one settles into certain ideas and experiences, they may be reborn in various realms. For example, there are four different Brahma realms where one attains jhanas, and beyond that, there are arupa realms, such as the base of infinite space and infinite consciousness. One's scope of conceptualization becomes limited in order to enter those realms. However, those who are bound by the concept of the senses will remain within the realm of sensory existence, which consists of about 16 different sensory existences. What I'm trying to convey is that one must personally test and verify all of this through direct experience. It is up to each individual to determine the approach that ensures they are on the right path. In the Buddhist text, specifically in Majjhima Nikaya 140, the Buddha discusses, The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations, and when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, Bhikkhu, I am is a conceiving, I am this is a conceiving, I shall be is a conceiving, I shall not be is a conceiving. I shall be possessed of form is a conceiving. I shall be formless is a conceiving. I shall be percipient is a conceiving. I shall be non-percipient is a conceiving. I shall be neither percipient nor non-percipient is a conceiving. Conceiving is a disease. Conceiving is a tumor. Conceiving is a dart. By overcoming all conceivings, bhikkhu, one is called a sage at peace. And the sage at peace is not born. 
does not age, does not die. He is not shaken and does not yearn. For there is nothing present in him by which he might be born. Not being born, how could he age? Not aging, how could he die? Not dying, how could he be shaken? Not being shaken, why should he yearn? So this delves again into exposing all kinds of concepts and what lies beyond them. It means that one must let go of everything, completely releasing all attachments. In the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path, the subtlest layer of conceptualization is perception, and even that is relinquished along the path. By letting go of perception and any form of imagination about how things should be, one can experience the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. At that stage, one realizes that the mind and its objects are not separate entities. They are merely constructs of the mind. When there is no distinction between the mind and its objects, one does not start to imagine. And when one does not imagine, it means that the concepts of mind and mind objects do not arise. As a result, when they do not arise, the consciousness of the mind ceases. With the cessation of mind consciousness, the notion of consciousness disappears because it no longer finds any support from the mind. This is how the chain of dependent origination collapses, with the realization that it is just an interplay of the mind. The mind was creating its objects, and due to heedlessness, we were only observing the surface and not the root cause. This is where Yoniso Manasikara recognizes and acknowledges that the mind and its objects are interconnected, and the mind object is a product of the mind. So when one realizes that the mind and mind object are not two separate things, the consciousness of the mind ceases. This cessation happens because the mind consciousness, which distinguishes between the mind and its object, stops. When one understands that it is the mind itself that creates the mind object, the mind consciousness ceases. At this moment, one experiences the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. This is how one reaches the culmination of the Noble Eightfold Path. When this experience occurs, awareness of the world and all the senses completely ceases. The mind comes to a complete halt, similar to a river that has been dammed, exposing the depth of the riverbed. To see what lies beneath a river, one must build a dam high enough to contain a large volume of water and sustain the flow for several days or weeks. If one wants to see what lies beneath the river, one would need to stop the flow of water into the dam by closing the dam gates. As a result, the old riverbed dries up. Through this process, one realizes that there is nothing beneath the river. This analogy illustrates how our everyday experiences are like a continuous flow that we have never had the opportunity to explore the depths of, which is similar to the interplay of dependent origination. In the practice of the Eightfold Path, we tranquilize all formations, including bodily and mental formations. This is akin to building up the dam, creating a space to store the water. Through this practice, we aim to uncover what lies beneath the surface, the essence of the flow of our sense experiences and how we have been carried away by the relentless stream of dependent origination for countless eons. This chain has never ceased thus far. However, by diligently following the Noble Eightfold Path, we have the opportunity to unravel this process and experience awakening from our experiences personally. This is the essence of the path we are on. I'm not attempting to persuade or impose a specific path on anyone. I simply emphasize the importance of directly experiencing and understanding how human experiences function. It is through this direct insight that one can come to realize awakening as taught by the Buddha. In this conversation, I can only share what I have personally seen, known and found worthwhile to pursue. I have tried to provide a comprehensive perspective on various aspects. I discuss dependent origination as something that continually shapes our experiences, with the crux of this process lying in contact. It is a very deep and extensive topic that was the subject of the Buddha's awakening to discover the deathless state. I will provide details of this process that I support through direct meditative experiences. The Buddha said, one can never become a noble person, one who will surely attain the deathless one day, without understanding this process. Chapter 9 Genesis of Material Universe and Contact There is a tangle within and a tangle without. The world is entangled with a tangle. About that, O Gotama, I ask you, who can disentangle this tangle? Where name and form, as well as resistance and the perception of form, are completely cut off, 
it is there that the tangle gets snapped. Samyutta Nikaya, 7.6, The Tangle. Understanding contact is crucial for experiencing the deathless. The universe, with all its appearances and experiences, can be fully comprehended when contact is understood. Among the various topics essential to understanding the Dhamma, one of the most important for enhancing and expediting our progress in meditation is having an experiential understanding of a component called contact. In Pali, contact is referred to as fasa, which essentially means touching. In Sanskrit, it is called sparsha, which implies coming together and creating a spark. Contact is a significant phenomenon, crucial to unraveling the liberation the Buddha has shown through his teachings contained within the Four Noble Truths. In the context of the Four Noble Truths, contact falls under the category of the arising of suffering. Examining the first noble truth of suffering reveals that suffering is rooted in phenomena we perceive or identify with as ourselves. This arising of suffering is dependent, as the Buddha stated, on contact. In a nutshell, dependent origination, the core of which lies in contact, consists of 11 more components. While it may sound like an oversimplification or something mystical, we need to understand the links of dependent origination not as a long chain of events that follow one after another, but rather as things that arise simultaneously. For example, millions of raindrops can fall at the same time. Similarly, when a light turns on, billions and trillions of photons arise simultaneously. These phenomena do not have to occur sequentially. This is precisely what the term means. Things arising concurrently. Praticca means dependent on a causal condition, and samupada is simultaneous arising. In contrast to natural phenomena, where things are completely uncorrelated and independent, like photons bouncing from a lamp into our retinas, the Buddha states that the phenomena of our mind lean on each other. Let's consider that there are 12 photons representing the 12 links of dependent origination. In contrast to random and independent physical phenomena, the 12 components of the dependent origination process of the mind are interconnected. They arise together and cease together. This means that if we let go of one link, all the others that depend on that particular link will immediately fall apart. There is no processing time or time limit that we usually associate with such phenomena. This is a quite counterintuitive state of our mind. I compare it to something that flows based on a very tightly balanced environment. The phenomena of the mind are such that any observation with some bias or inclination can start to oscillate them, creating millions of iterations of those phenomena. These phenomena become unstable and remain in a vibrating state. In physics, for example, if we go to labs like CERN or other high-impact research centers, we see that they investigate extremely minute particles. They have very delicate instruments with high sensitivity, and any influence from the environment can destabilize the experiments. They must perform their experiments in a very pure environment, as any influence, any atom, any molecule, entering the environment can completely derail the outcomes of their experiments. Similarly, the mind and the observation of the mind influence its flow in a very similar manner. Any observation, imagination or concept can oscillate and make the observation and flow of phenomena even more unstable. In circuit theory or any lab experiment, injecting a little millivolt or microvolt of current into a system can excite the system to generate a perfect waveform that can be controlled to a very fine degree in frequency and magnitude. This is common in labs. Our mind can be in such states. We have inherited these states of mind, which are already in oscillation and bouncing around too much. What happens is that we are bombarded with all sense experiences, hitting our awareness from six sense doors all the time. Those input signals are hitting our mind and body machine. The perturbation caused by the inputs is likely to continue the oscillation process indefinitely if we are not able to check and find the root cause of this oscillation. This is an example of our experiences. I am providing a scientific explanation based on an analogy as to why the links of dependent origination are so hard to put a full stop to. The cessation of suffering is a state of extinguishing, or all vibrations coming to a standstill. Say we are trying to switch off the machine and extinguish all sources of oscillation and vibration. But excitement and oscillation for the system are in constant supply. This is the state of the world. I used an example from a physics or electronics lab 
to illustrate how our mind can be compared to machines that can oscillate indefinitely and stay in an unstable or fluctuating state all the time. If no measures are taken to stabilize them, they can go further and even explode. Our mind can go to that extent as we have seen in life. Our human life is sustained in a delicate way. We tend to take everything so personally, and things can easily turn from a minor disagreement into a full-blown war and the destruction of a whole nation. Even the earth can be in peril if we are not careful to tame the mind. This is precisely the root of all phenomena. It all starts with the mind. I am using a framework for this topic centered around the notion of contact. I will put them in four categories, corresponding to the four noble truths. Contact itself is suffering, which is the first noble truth. The cause for the arising of contact is the second noble truth. The cessation of contact is the third noble truth, and the way leading to cessation is the fourth noble truth. I will make this chapter cover those four aspects of contact so that we can gain some understanding of this matter. I will try to show ways of soothing this process of being caught in the swing of dependent origination and the infinite amount of suffering it can generate. The key to stopping these phenomena from continuing indefinitely is to understand the link of contact. I will cover several suttas to provide both experiential and theoretical perspectives. So the first aspect of contact is its role in the context of suffering. This is from Udana 310, which is called Surveying the World. This sutta describes how, after his awakening on the bank of the Niranjara, the Buddha fully comprehended the links of dependent origination in both the forward and reverse orders. He understood the Four Noble Truths in three aspects and in all twelve permutations. He directly saw, tested, and thoroughly understood them, leaving nothing more for him to do. This was the culmination of his awakening. He understood that any residual fuel or excitement causing his mind to oscillate had been extinguished. His attachments were destroyed, and he saw that there were no traces or tendencies left in his mind. Everything had been completely extinguished. The Buddha compared this state to standing apart from the world and the universe, completely independent of it. It's like watching a movie where whatever happens in the movie doesn't influence us. The Buddha saw the universe as an ongoing movie and realized that he had come out of that screen, completely free from being bound to play a role. He was no longer an actor in that movie, and there was no way for him to go back and be a part of it. In Udana 310, surveying the world, the Buddha says, This anguished world, fully given to contact, speaks of a disease as self. In whatever terms it conceives of, even thereby it turns otherwise. The world, attached to becoming, given fully to becoming, though becoming otherwise, yet delights in becoming. What it delights in is a fear. What it fears from is a suffering. But then this holy life is lived for the abandoning of that very becoming. These verses carry a very deep meaning, coming from a completely different realm. The first few sentences distinguish the world as being fully given to contact. This means that all the inner turmoil and disasters in the world of experiences are inevitably caused by contact. The world sustains itself through contact, and when we surrender fully to contact, it's like sleepwalking into a wall without realizing it. Contact is like hitting a wall. All phenomena are constantly in flux, and what sustains them is our unawareness or lack of awakening to the fact that contact is the cause of so much suffering. We are not aware of what is happening to us. It's like animals harming themselves without knowing that their actions are causing harm, such as a monkey scratching a wound and making it worse. We exacerbate our suffering by fueling it and not paying attention to its causes. By relinquishing ourselves to contact, we provide extra fuel to unnecessarily prolong phenomena. Contact arises from a combination of rupa and nama. Rupa literally means appearance and consists of properties often associated with physical matter. In the physical world, these properties include the four great primaries, earth, water, fire and air elements. These elements have properties of solidity, cohesion, heat, and vibration. They can manifest in various forms, and by manipulating the combination of these elements, we can create countless different elements. Scientists have discovered more than 102 elements so far, but by playing with the configurations of these four primary elements, we can potentially create an infinite number of elements, which translate to acts of manipulating electrons, protons, and neutrons. 
Physicalists might object to this approach, seeing the four properties as emergent from the composition of atoms and molecules, not the other way around. However, they must consider what experience they can generate out of particular structures of atoms and molecules. Essentially, those properties are what matter to beings that have sensation, perception, feeling, and so on. It doesn't matter what the matter is composed of, whether it has 200 electrons and 200 protons, or any other configuration. We can give it any name we like, but when it comes to understanding and making contact with these elements, we can only make sense of them through the four properties. Earth, water, fire, and air. This is the perspective of Dhamma. Dhamma doesn't differentiate between these lab-created elements like uranium, plutonium, hydrogen, or helium. They all appear to us as appearances, as rupa, with varying degrees of experiences based on these four properties. When we interact with these elements through contact, we have feeling and perception, the rupa representing the elements and the labeling aspect, the nama. Nama literally means naming and refers to how we label and process experiences of these elements. The components of nama include feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. For example, when we sit down on a chair, we make contact with what feels like a physical object, rupa, which possesses the four properties. Through feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention, we recognize and make sense of the physical object. Nama labels and categorizes the elements based on feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention as soft, hard, warm, still, moving, etc. When Nama and Rupa come together due to contact, we become aware of an object. Through feeling, we determine whether the experience is pleasant, painful, or neutral. Through perception, we recognize and make sense of the object. Intention arises based on the feeling and perception. Contact with the object is made through the six senses. Attention arises, giving rise to a continuous awareness of the object. This is why contact is at the center of the universe and freedom from it. The physical elements, rupa, and the understanding of these elements, nama, support the arising of consciousness or awareness of the properties. This is how the process works. When we become aware, the sense of self or perception of self becomes amplified. That process identifies itself as a person in the middle of the universe. It starts with identification with the feeling. We identify with the feeling, which then becomes associated with perception. Consciousness discriminates objects and perceptions, leading to a sense of self versus the world. This fuels subsequent phenomena, starting with craving. Craving generates desire, whether it's a desire for more of what is pleasant or to avoid what is painful. If the feeling is neither pleasant nor painful, it leads to indifference. These three reactions occur because we have identified with the feeling. Leaning to either side has occurred, i.e., dependence has continued. So contact is a crucial point to consider. We can compare it to the saying, where do we draw the line in our everyday life? Drawing the line means staying within our boundaries and not crossing them. Crossing the line, like crossing a red line, leads to problems and issues. We draw the line in terms of our mind and mental object contact. We need to stay within the boundary of our sense bases, within our part of the fence or line. Contact acts as a border between safety and being out of control, between staying centered within and letting chaos unfold. This is how we should understand contact. Let me give an example from the suttas. The Buddha says, be it pleasant or unpleasant, or neither unpleasant nor pleasant, inwardly or outwardly, all what is felt, knowing it as pain, delusive and brittle, touch after touch, seeing how it wanes. That way he grows dispassionate therein, by the extinction of feeling it is, that a monk becomes hungerless and fully appeased. Sutta Nipata, 312, 738, 739, Dvayatanupasana Sutta. This passage emphasizes how feeling is the cause of escalation and problems. We tend to process feelings and make a case out of them, attaching thoughts to them and seeing how they develop. But feeling is caused by contact. Noble disciples who understand this see that feeling arises due to contact. Contact is just a spark. The Buddha advises us to see feeling as something fragile, like a burst bubble. There's no substance to it, so why do we make it into such a big issue? The Buddha teaches us to understand feeling as something brittle, 
not to be attached to whether it is pleasant, painful, or neutral. It's just a sensation, like a mosquito bite or spilling tea on our finger. Don't let it become an emotional feeling. By understanding feeling as just a sensation, we become free, hungerless, and fully appeased. This is the essence of the teaching on feeling. Feeling is brittle and unstable because it depends on contact. Contact occurs when two notions of different properties come together. By nature, contact is unstable and doesn't last long. Feeling is dependent on contact, so it is equally unstable. If there is no contact, there is no feeling. Feeling and contact are interdependent. We need to see the true nature of contact in this way. Whenever anything affects our body and we start to feel pain, we should not make it into a big issue. We should not take it personally, but rather see it as a sensation, as something influencing our body which we have no control over. External objects exert pain, and we must accept this reality. This example is mentioned in a sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, where the Buddha talks about contact as one of the four nutriments. Contact sustains the cycle of dependent origination and continues the suffering indefinitely. The Buddha gives a profound example, suppose there is a flayed cow. If the cow stands exposed to a wall, creatures dwelling in the wall would nibble at her. If she stands exposed to trees, creatures dwelling in the trees would nibble at her. The same would happen if she stands exposed to water or open air. Whatever the flayed cow stands exposed to, creatures dwelling there would nibble at her. This example shows that contact should be seen as a nutrient that sustains suffering. When contact is fully understood, the three kinds of feeling are also fully understood. At that point, noble disciples have nothing further to do. The lesson here is that the flayed cow suffers because it exposes its wounds to external factors. The contact invades its body. The problem arises when we let our attention flow outside, engaging with the phenomena perceived through our senses. This inflates the contact and triggers intention, attention, consciousness and craving, leading to further escalations. That is a persistent illusion that keeps us in the realm of dependent origination. To avoid this, we should observe what is happening within our mind and not let our attention flow outward. As I mentioned earlier, everything in our experiences is mental. There is nothing physical. This is achieved through the practice of tranquility and insight meditation, which gradually weakens tendencies for outward flow through the six senses and restrains the arising of contact. By practicing mindfulness of body, feeling, mind and mind objects, we can check the flow of the sixth sense contacts. The example of the flayed cow illustrates the importance of not submitting to contact and keeping it within ourselves. The practice of the four foundations of mindfulness fortifies our internal state and protects us from straying our attention outward. Instead of looking outward through the senses, we should focus on observing the mind's reaction to phenomena. We should not cross the line of contact and seek external gratification, but rather observe the mind's reaction and relax, preventing it from crossing the boundary at the level of feeling by not reacting. By stopping our reactions to feelings arising from contact, we remain on the safe side. This is the main message conveyed through the aspect of contact and why it is considered a source of suffering. Now I will cover what contact is and its origination. As I mentioned, the origination of contact is dependent on Nama and Rupa. Contact arises when we engage with Nama and Rupa, which give rise to consciousness. Together they form what we call contact. This is how contact comes into being. The origination of contact is due to attention, known as Manasikara in Pali, which means mind doing the work. Attention causes consciousness to arise. If we lack understanding of phenomena such as contact, feeling, perception, and consciousness, and if we are ignorant of their nature, the process of dependent origination will follow its course. As the Buddha said, contact leads to feeling, feeling leads to perception, perception leads to craving, and craving leads to clinging. We get swept away because we lack attentiveness, allowing the process of dependent origination to take over. This is why awareness and the ability to spot these phenomena as they arise is crucial. Attention, or manasikara, plays a significant role here. The Buddha has given us the practice of mindfulness, which replaces the indiscriminate observation of phenomena with an understanding of this process. When we understand this process and recognize that these phenomena are suffering, we can avoid indulging in them. 
Yonisomana Sikara, attention rooted in wisdom, helps us refrain from excessive indulgence. In the early stages of practice, these phenomena may appear jumbled, and we may not discern one from the other. However, as we progress in our practice, we learn to slow down the flow of dependent origination and become more skilled at observing it. Through the practice of the 6R method, mindfulness observes the flow of consciousness and phenomena. Right effort, guided by the knowledge of what is wholesome, aids mindfulness in bringing forth the wholesome and discarding the unwholesome. This leads to a greater sense of balance and a more neutral attitude towards these phenomena. Instead of perceiving them as personal crises, we see them as a flow that is beyond our control. Rather than fighting with them, we allow them to be. This understanding brings a sense of confidence and lessens the personal impact of these phenomena. As soon as we let them be, we learn that when we let go of the cause for another phenomenon, all dependent phenomena simply do not arise. They remain mere potentials. This is the beauty of the Dhamma. It is immediately effective. By letting go of the cause, we always make progress in our practice, refining our skills to more accurately let go of suffering. Initially, this practice is not highly skilled. We start by engaging with mindfulness and the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Mindfulness, guided by right effort and supported by right unification of mind, Samadhi, brings the mind to a state of equilibrium. In this state, the mind remains stable, calm and composed, not due to suppressing agitating phenomena, but by letting go of them, allowing us to observe the micro-events within our mind. As we continue with the 6R method and the practice of mindfulness meditation, the oscillations and personalizations of phenomena gradually become tamed. Their impact diminishes as we pay less attention to them, recognizing their inherent suffering nature. Engaging with them only leads to their amplification. Therefore, we practice to let them be without being attentive to them. Attention plays a crucial role in this process. In our practice, attention is guided by wisdom, which involves understanding and letting go of suffering. Wisdom allows us to replace unwise attention with attention rooted in wisdom, yonisomanasikara. This helps us denourish and remove the fuel for these phenomena, preventing them from sustaining further suffering. At this point, it might be relevant to read a bit of what the Buddha actually says in a sutta. This is from the Udana, which I find joyful to read because it contains profound statements from the Buddha describing the nature of his Dhamma. Though these verses are condensed, they carry great weight. This particular sutta, Udana 4.1, Megia, pertains to mental phenomena that grab our attention and trap us in suffering. Trivial thoughts, subtle thoughts, mental jerkings that follow one along. Not understanding these mental thoughts, one runs back and forth with wandering mind. But having known these mental thoughts, the ardent and mindful one restrains them. An awakened one has entirely abandoned them, these mental jerkings that follow one along. These mental jerkings can take various forms, such as emotions, attachments, anger or bitter attitudes, especially in the early stages of practice. They shake the mind, disrupting its calmness and causing oscillation and distraction. The Buddha advises us not to flow with them, but to abandon them and let them be. The awakened ones are completely unaffected by them, existing in a different dimension where these phenomena have no influence over their minds. The strength of the mind of an arhat or the Buddha is comparable to a rock that remains unaffected by any wind. This strength is supported by the factor of equanimity, the last factor in the seven awakening factors. Equanimity can be understood as neutrality or detachment, where the mind becomes uninfluenced, like a rock. Sariputta, for example, often practiced abiding in equanimity and embodied this state, as nothing could sway his mind. In a heightened state of equanimity, such as in the formless realm of nothingness, the mind is nearly impervious to any perception or imagination. Equanimity minimizes inner contact, and the mind becomes fortified. There is little room for anything to influence it. It weakens the link of contact, eventually leading to its cessation. However, there is still work to be done to completely extinguish contact, particularly in relation to the subtle layer of perception. The concept of contact is known as fasa, and equanimity plays a significant role in weakening this link. Gradually, through progression in practice, contact will cease. There is a need to further refine our understanding to completely let contact cease, 
particularly with regard to the subtlest layer of perception of identification with phenomena. So far, I have described contact as being of one nature, but it can also be decomposed into two aspects. When there is contact, it is an interaction between Nama and Rupa. Contact has two dimensions, the perception of form and the process of naming perception. In Pali, these are referred to as patiga, meaning friction or resistance, and adivakana, meaning verbal impression. When we make contact with an object, it hits our awareness in these two aspects. We feel a sense of friction or resistance, such as the sensation of touching a solid chair. At the same time, the nama aspect of nama rupa starts to verbalize and name the experience. These two aspects of contact combine to give rise to various feelings and perceptions, such as perceiving something as hard, soft, delicious, spicy or bland. Reactions to them strengthen formations and generate future karma. This is how contact is composed of these two parts. Now, our objective is to let go of contact and be free from it. As I mentioned earlier, the cessation, or rather prevention, to be more accurate, of contact comes through practice. The practice leading to the cessation of contact is not reacting to the impressions that arise in our minds. Whether we are exposed to the physical world or experiencing a mental dimension, these are both mental phenomena. We don't need to analyze them at a microscopic level. Instead, we treat them as phenomena and do not become associated with them. I have picked these terms from some suttas. However, when we are in a state of equilibrium and our minds are quiet, peaceful and still, these phenomena can become clear to us. At that state, we can explore and classify them. But if we are on the path and have not yet reached this level of clarity, it is better to lump them together as one phenomenon and let them be. We continue to practice by bringing forth wholesome qualities, such as loving kindness and compassion, of the four Brahmaviharas. We allow these phenomena to settle on their own, and eventually they will no longer be able to influence us, because we don't feed them with our attention. The Buddha has given us this guidance. Those who practice should be mindful and try to restrain these phenomena, but those who are fully awakened have completely abandoned them. These phenomena have no power to influence their minds. This leads to the cessation of contact, where, along with contact, feeling and perception also cease. In this state, the whole mass of suffering ceases because craving, clinging and other factors have been prevented from manifesting. The state of cessation of contact is where there is no more influence of Nama and Rupa. When we have refined our equanimity, such as in the fourth jhana or in the state of nothingness, the foundation of contact becomes shaky. There is very little room left for contact to make its way through, but it still manages to come through small openings. To completely stop the flow of contact, we need to practice non-identification. The Buddha mentioned that it can be abandoned. The way to abandon this contact is by not identifying with any of these phenomena. This is the state after developing equanimity to its fullest. The next step is to develop the state of non-identification, or atamyata. As this non-identification grows, any form of association completely fades away. The mind becomes stronger, and the flow of these phenomena becomes very shaky. They crumble and fall apart because they are not getting any fuel from attention. This process occurs after reaching the state of neither perception nor non-perception. In this state, the practice of the six Rs, mostly using releasing attention and relaxing, becomes automatic, and there is no interest in anything. It is a state of disenchantment where any notion of pleasure, joy and pain have been let go. In the state of equanimity, there is no attachment to feelings, and they become bland. They don't register in the mind. Gradually, the flow of contact becomes weaker through continuous practice of the six Rs. The last thread of contact is snapped, and the tangle is cut off. In Udana section 1, Sutta number 10, the Buddha describes the state of Nibbana and freedom. In that state, water, earth, fire and air do not find a footing. The form does not get any support because form and name are dependent on each other and their coming together is called contact. By letting go of attention and not giving attention to these phenomena, consciousness doesn't find a footing in Nama and Rupa. Consciousness becomes weak, which then weakens Nama and Rupa. This interdependence causes the phenomena to fall apart like two sheaves of reeds leaning on each other. Attention plays a crucial role in this process as it affects consciousness. When we give attention to these phenomena, they register in our mind. 
If we do not pay attention, and if we understand by wisdom that they are suffering, then they will not find nourishment. The nourishment is our attention for consciousness to grow. The first nourishment is food, the second is contact, the third is formations, and the fourth is consciousness. We are not fueling them or nourishing them with our attention. When they are not given attention, they gradually become weaker. Consciousness becomes weaker, which then weakens Nama and Rupa and so on. It's like removing life support from a patient, and consciousness starts to fall apart until the whole process stops. That is how the cessation of contact occurs. The cessation of contact means the cessation of feeling, the cessation of perception, the cessation of consciousness, and the cessation of all the suffering that follows. All the links dependent on feeling, persistence, craving, clinging, and so on, will completely disappear. This means we have let go of the root of suffering. Before the arising of the Buddha, the human idea was that suffering was a natural law that would haunt us forever. Another idea was philosophies like non-action to attempt to completely exhaust kama. But the Buddha taught that suffering is dynamic and doesn't stay with us forever. If suffering has a cause, it means there is something keeping it alive, and if we know the causes and conditions, suffering can also expire. That means suffering becomes meaningless. There is no need for its existence. Suffering simply doesn't arise. That is the state of freedom, freedom from agitation, fear, and being subject to the flow of dependent origination. This flow of dependent origination is the ultimate footprint of suffering, the DNA or recipe for suffering. By dismantling this flow of dependent origination, we can put a full stop to the flow that has been running for countless eons. With the practice of the six Rs, we can gradually put an end to it and achieve liberation. This is the experience of Nibbāna. However, many people, even Buddhists, harbor fear or misunderstandings about Nibbāna. They may associate it with extinction or annihilation, seeking instead a concept of persistent happiness. But in contrast, the Buddha's teaching asserts that Nibbāna is the removal of experiences and suffering, akin to curing cancer. Clinging to existence, the five aggregates, feeling, perception, these are likened to tumors. Nibbana represents an experience of freedom, a dissociation from the inclinations of the mind, and a complete elimination of tendencies to latch onto objects that cause suffering and pain. The Buddha uses the simile of a beam of light to illustrate what happens if all means for projecting that beam of light are removed. This state is supportless, measureless, and independent. Concepts and notions like happiness and suffering find no grounding there. This state of samsara to which people are attached, they think that even being reborn as an animal or a cow dung beetle is still desirable. Even if they were reborn as an ant, they would prefer anything to cling but being freed from all such things. True freedom cannot be compared in terms of existence and non-existence. The state of Nibbana transcends such comparisons. The concept of rebirth is eradicated. Nibbana is simply freedom. This life will continue as long as it sustains. When the body expires, the senses and everything else will cease. There is no lamenting over them. It signifies liberation from the cycle of birth and death, from the pain and misery of rebirth. We are no longer part of the equation of birth and death. Such equations simply do not hold in the state of Nibbana. Therefore, it may be challenging to understand the state of R, but it is liberating to be freed from being chained to sensory experiences, from being food for worms, or from enduring the suffering and pain that the universe abundantly provides. Now let's move on to the final part, which is the path leading to the cessation of contact. Before doing so, I would like to read a paragraph from the Udana, specifically Udana section number 4, verse number 11, titled Quarrels and Disputes. It addresses the causes of quarrels, disputes, and suffering. The Buddha states that contact is the cause of what is appealing and unappealing. When contact ceases, these do not arise. Whatever is meant by becoming and not becoming, that too is its cause. Therefore, contact is the primary factor that causes quarrels, unhappiness, and suffering. Contact is initiated by Nama and Rupa, conditioned by Nama and Rupa. How can we be free from the influence of form? How can we escape being hit by rocks, earthquakes, and other calamities related to form? It is by letting go of this notion of contact. And how do we let go of contact? 
it is by reaching a state where one does not participate in perceptions, neither engaging with abnormal perception. It is a state where we let go of all perceptions, yet we are not devoid of perception. This is the state of a setlessness where touches cannot touch, essentially the state of Nibbana. And how does one arrive at this state? It is when we have reached the state of non-proliferation, letting go of all perceptions, including feeling. This is what influences our interaction with form. When we achieve the cessation of perception and feeling, it opens the doorway to a state where we are unaffected by any of the elements, earth, water, fire, air, and yet still perceive. The cessation of becoming and impingements from all elements of the universe is Nibbana. It is extremely challenging to articulate this experience in words. It is something to be experienced, not categorized. What we experience is peace and sublimity, complete stillness, without possessions or any inclination of mind. It is a state free from form, feeling, pain and pleasure. A realm that is entirely separate from the sensory world. Now let's quickly explore the path leading to cessation. I didn't mention the four foundations of mindfulness and how they guide us to stay within the boundary, which is contact. The Satipatthana Sutta teaches us that our boundary is the six sense contacts. If we indulge and go beyond that, we enter the domain of Mara. When we contemplate and observe the four foundations, which consists of the body, feeling, the mind and mind objects, we do not stray beyond that boundary. We resist the temptation of Mara. By observing the mind, mind objects, body and feeling, we essentially divert attention away from the five senses and focus on the mind. This is how we remain safe and avoid becoming prey for Mara. Indulging in sense pleasures and being influenced by them accumulates karma. If we excessively indulge and lose our human life at that moment, there is a possibility of going to hell or being reborn as an animal. Mara's influence can trap us in the cycle of karma. The six senses are Mara's domain, and projecting outwardly invites Mara to entangle us in various realms of experience. To remain safe within these boundaries and avoid Mara's influence, we begin by observing the four foundations of mindfulness. This leads us to develop the seven factors of awakening, which stabilize and compose our minds. These factors straighten and converge our minds, guiding us towards the ultimate goal of freedom from all defilements and tendencies that cause suffering. They help us stay on a straight path, avoiding deviations and fluctuations. The path to the state of Nibbana is perfected through cultivating these seven awakening factors. The journey starts with mindfulness, the four foundations of mindfulness serving as a safety net to prevent us from straying too far. Once we establish ourselves within this boundary, the second factor is Dhamma Vikaya, the observation of phenomena. This involves examining what causes suffering and what leads to its cessation, aiming to release and let go of the escalation of these phenomena. Observing leads to awareness, followed by the factor of energy. With mindfulness, observation of phenomena and energy, joy arises. This joy, along with other factors, settles into a state of tranquility, calmness and composure. Tranquility is a profoundly peaceful and comfortable state. The joy that arises eventually transforms into tranquility. When the mind is tranquil and calm, it effortlessly remains composed. This state is called samadhi, where the mind stabilizes and stays still. Samadhi is perfected through the development of tranquility, joy and energy. When these factors are cultivated, the mind enters a state of happiness and culminates in the perfection of samadhi, known as sama samadhi, or the four jhanas. Within the experience of the four jhanas, the factor of equanimity arises. It allows us to observe phenomena as they truly are, noticing even the subtlest arising of these phenomena. Cultivating the seven factors of awakening enables us to track our progress. Mindfulness, observation of phenomena, energy, joy, tranquility, samadhi, composure, and upekka, balance, are all the seven factors that can be observed and checked off as we progress in our practice. Through repeated meditation sessions, the mind suddenly experiences great comfort, relaxation, and calmness. When we let go of anxiety, attachment, and concern, and maintain this equilibrium, we do not need to seek Nibbana. Nibbana will come and find us. This practice eventually bears fruit. It is remarkable how exploring various Dhamma topics together reveals their interconnectedness. The Buddha stated that there are no flaws in the Dhamma. 
From every angle, the Dhamma is complete, free from patchwork or stitched together concepts. This gift of the Dhamma is precious, and as human beings, we should be extremely happy to have come into contact with it. In conclusion, this is the essence of the practice and the essence of Buddha Dhamma. It is a journey that begins with developing joy, tranquility and equanimity. By letting go of habitual tendencies, the mind becomes unified and free from identification. This is the final part of the practice taught by the Buddha. The sutta that lays out all these practices in a coherent path, culminating in the deathless, is the Salayatanavibhanga Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya 137. The path involves gradual development of refined states such as joy, tranquility, samadhi, and equanimity. It doesn't stop there. Rather, it progresses finally towards to the state of non-identification. By relying on these qualities, liberation is attained even while living in this dependent universe, achieving ultimate independence. Chapter 10. How the Buddha's Recipe Got Lost This chapter doesn't focus much on meditation or specific experiences, but on the fate of the Noble Eightfold Path after Buddha's passing until now. I will cover various meditative states later, such as jhanas, the arupas, cessation and other experiences. What I've generally found is that while these terms and experiences are frequent in the Pali suttas, it's challenging to ascertain the original words of the Buddha in today's literature. There are likely thousands of books on Buddhism worldwide, and many people are writing them. The concept of Buddhism has become so widespread that everyone has their own interpretation of what the Buddha taught. Later traditions have added extraneous information and mixed in other teachings, religions, faiths and beliefs with the original texts. Now it's exceedingly difficult to verify whether something truly represents the teachings of the historical Buddha. No. So it's very common for people to struggle to find the authentic words of the Buddha even after decades of searching. As I mentioned, it took me over five years to identify the actual teachings of the Buddha as contained in the Pali Suttas. I searched everywhere, reading books by Nagarjuna, the Dalai Lama, Ajahn Brahm, Alan B. Wallace, and many others. I also delved into texts like the Lamrim Chenmo, highly regarded by Tibetan masters and scholars. Exploring these texts and thousands of pages can easily lead one into confusion and entanglements without clear answers. Therefore, finding the Buddha's words isn't straightforward, especially with the influence of later teachings like the Abhidhamma and its various versions across Buddhist traditions. Initially, I thought that the Abhidhamma, held in high esteem, must be the most authentic teaching of the Buddha. I read through the seven books of Abhidhamma from the Pali Text Society, such as Dhammasangani, Vibhanga, Katavatthu, and Pathana, with their intricate matrices detailing permutations of states of consciousness. I must admit, the Abhidhamma is not easy to grasp. I wondered how the Buddha managed to spread his teachings with such obscure and arcane words and confusing terminologies. Surely, there must be an easier way. It took me five years to realize that the teachings of the Buddha cannot be so difficult to comprehend. Then I began exploring further and finally discovered references to the Nikayas contained within the Pali Canon. This seemed like a promising place to search for valuable teachings. I started reading those books, perhaps beginning with the Majjhima Nikaya 4, the Bhayabhirava Sutta. Suddenly, I felt a sense of déjà vu, as if I were traversing through a jungle or forest filled with fear and dread. What the Buddha articulated resonated deeply. There are experiences of fear and dread in life, and there are ways to overcome them. The Buddha himself had faced and conquered these unwholesome states, eventually attaining the higher states of jhanas. He found a way to resolve these unwholesome states, and his mind became unperturbed, leading him to enter the jhanas. When I first encountered the term jhanas, I immediately recognized its significance. Finally, the Buddha is providing some foundational teachings. He explained the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana, detailing how he progressed through each and recalled his past lives, among other experiences. It's straightforward to understand. We need to undergo these experiences ourselves. By following these steps, we develop the ability to see past lives, observe the arising and passing away of beings in various realms, and ultimately grasp the Four Noble Truths directly. The Bhayabharava Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya isn't too difficult to grasp, at least that was my initial impression. 
When I read this, I was deeply motivated. It felt like a deja vu, a true encounter with the Dhamma. After being lost for more than five years, struggling through various Mahayana texts and philosophical treatises held in high regard for their profound and complex nature, I encountered a passage by Professor Kalupahana. He mentioned how some treat Nagarjuna as if he were a second Buddha, or even greater than the Buddha himself, claiming that Nagarjuna provided a final or supreme vision of the Dhamma that even the historical Buddha did not fully articulate. Such philosophies distort the Buddha's teachings and lead many astray. I found it difficult to believe in these fictional ideas, concepts and philosophies which kept me entangled for years. Encountering the true teachings of the Buddha is challenging, precisely the concern the Buddha himself expressed. I read suttas where he foresaw that in later times teachers would distort his teachings adding and subtracting elements that can confuse people and undermine the Dhamma's integrity. Perhaps this is why the Buddha predicted that his teachings would endure for only 500 years, as we observe today. Countless philosophies, but few direct experiential paths to understanding what he truly taught. The Buddha did not propagate Buddhism. That was an invention by some followers centuries afterward, adopting the styles of religious leaders who promoted their own philosophies. As different Buddhist sects arose, Buddhism fragmented into numerous factions, straying from the true teachings of the historical Buddha, which were at risk of being lost. However, practices like the TWIM and 6R method offer a glimmer of hope by aligning with the experiences described in the Pali Suttas. These practices provide a pathway, a ladder, to grasp some rare vision of the Dhamma. In this chapter, my aim is to explore a few of the Buddha's words regarding the future whether through foresight or recollections of past lives and past Buddhas. He foresaw how teachings would diminish over time due to carelessness and modifications to his authentic recipe, the Noble Eightfold Path. Distortions have obscured the complete and perfect Dhamma into something barely recognizable. I have a sutta here from the Samyutta Nikaya 20.7 called the Drum Peg. Here the Buddha states, Pikus, once in the past, the Dasarahas had a kettle drum called the Samana. When the Samana became cracked, the Dasarahas inserted another peg. Eventually the time came when the Samana's original drumhead had disappeared and only a collection of pegs remained. So too, Bikus, the same thing will happen with the Bikus in the future. When those discourses spoken by the Tathagata that are deep, deep in meaning, supramundane, dealing with emptiness, are being recited, they will not be eager to listen to them, nor lend an ear to them, nor apply their minds to understand them, and they will not think those teachings should be studied and mastered. But when those discourses that are mere poetry composed by poets, beautiful in words and phrases, created by outsiders, spoken by their disciples, are being recited, they will be eager to listen to them, will lend an ear to them, will apply their minds to understand them, and they will think those teachings should be studied and mastered. In this way, Bhikkhus, those discourses spoken by the Tathagata that are deep, deep in meaning, supramundane, dealing with emptiness, will disappear. So this was the concern the Buddha had. The teachings, though they may appear simple and plain, hold a profound meaning. Only those who have experienced the states described by the Buddha, such as the jhanas, can truly grasp what he was conveying. This is a crucial point to understand. The Buddha's teachings are not mere philosophy, analysis, or a third-person perspective. They are a direct experience of phenomena within the mind. How they arise, cease, and entangle us in what we call the causes of suffering, and how we can release those entanglements. In essence, this aligns with the first of the Four Noble Truths. Whether we label it suffering, craving, or entanglement, the Buddha's teachings aim to completely transcend all forms of conceptual proliferation, engagement, bondage, and attachment. It is not a superficial kind of joy and happiness sought by most people today. It's interesting to note that the Buddha's teachings stand in stark contrast to conventional wisdom about gains and happiness. Conceptual proliferation and anything that leads to engagement and entanglement are norms in daily life, the very fabric of our existence. These keep us bound and entangled in the cycle of birth and death. However, the Buddha teaches us to relinquish these ties, not identifying or associating with them, actions that lead to the birthless, deathless, unconditioned state. 
Understanding of this cannot come without practice. It requires practice in meditation or direct experiential insight. The more sophisticated our lives become, the more intricate the entanglements we create, recognizing that all fabrications that sustain what we call life are inherently fragile and relinquishment of ties is akin to taking a red pill. Yet this process need not be painful. The Buddha offers a joyful, liberating path to those who choose this path. Experiencing the bliss of the jhanas through letting go of distractions clarifies precisely what the Buddha meant. This is the true essence of the Noble Eightfold Path, a joyful path that most people overlook. The very first step on this path is right view, or what we might call the noble, supramundane view. What does right view entail according to the Buddha's teachings? Right view is a prerequisite for embarking on the Noble Eightfold Path. If we start with a distorted or incorrect understanding of right view, we will already veer off from the complete holy life it leads to. There are several remarkable suttas dedicated to providing a deep understanding of right view. They include Majjhima Nikaya 9, the Samaditi Sutta. In this sutta, Sariputta meticulously describes right view, elucidating how each link of dependent origination embeds the Four Noble Truths. Essentially, right view boils down to comprehending the Four Noble Truths manifested in all facets of our experiences. This means we don't need to grasp every detail of our experiences intricately. It can be as simple as understanding our daily life sorrows, lamentations, their causes, addressing the first and second noble truths, letting go of that suffering, the third noble truth, and practicing the path that leads to the cessation of all suffering, the fourth noble truth. His entire explanation can be summarized briefly as follows. Understanding the unwholesome, the root of the unwholesome, the cessation of the unwholesome, and the path leading to the cessation of the unwholesome. If one comprehends this, it means they have attained right view. The root is greed, hatred, and delusion. Sariputta focuses here on how the four noble truths can be seen in every experience to fully grasp the Buddha's teachings. This interpretation is profound as it directly illustrates how the teachings can be seen in every phenomenon. He examines all the links of dependent origination and asserts, Look, we can discern right view in each and every moment. Even if we miss the feeling, the craving or the clinging, we can still recognize them in this very life. When we encounter sorrow, pain and lamentation, if we look deeply, we will discover the four noble truths there and understand them. His final point is crucial. All suffering arises dependently. This means if we relinquish their causes, they can be prevented from arising. This is the essence of right view as expounded in Majjhima Nikaya 9. Another definition of right view is provided by the Buddha in response to a question posed by a bhikkhu named Kakanagota. He inquired, right view, right view. People speak of right view. In what way does one arrive at right view? The Buddha responds, Kakana, this world mostly adheres to two extremes, the existence or the non-existence view. He explains that those who lean towards existence entirely disregard the cessation or the ending of existence. Conversely, those who reject this world see non-existence or annihilation as the world. They view the world as everything disintegrating, everything ceasing. The Buddha further elucidates that those who observe what manifests, what is present in their awareness, often overlook the fact that these things cease and disappear due to conditions. Entropy, encapsulated in the third law of thermodynamics, defines the universe. According to this law, everything in the universe begins with order and ends with disorder. In our modern world, which leans towards this theory of entropy, this aligns with the view of the second type as described by the Buddha. There are people who observe the disintegration of the world. They see only the things that are ceasing or disappearing. The Buddha concludes, by not adhering to these two extremes, the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma via the middle. He then elucidates the dependent origination process, illustrating how ignorance conditions formations, formations condition consciousness, and so forth, leading ultimately to aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Those who perceive solid existence and something permanent out there, akin to existentialists, are only seeing half of the story. They believe the world objectively exists in that manner, but they overlook the ongoing process. They're capturing a snapshot, 
rather than watching the entire movie unfold. Conversely, those inclined towards non-existence lean towards a theory of universal destruction, focusing solely on aspects of decay. However, the Buddha teaches that the world isn't so starkly dualistic. It's nuanced and fuzzy. Phenomena continually arise and cease based on perception, following specific patterns rather than being random. For instance, Nama Rupa, or mentality and materiality, arises due to consciousness, which in turn arises from attention to Nama Rupa. This cyclical process perpetuates the creation of more experiences, mirroring the way the world operates. When we perceive phenomena as they truly are, not through preconceptions, we attain right view. This right view, according to the Buddha, offers a completely unbiased and harmonious perspective, paving the way to entering the Noble Eightfold Path. It encompasses impermanence and not self. Phenomena are in constant flux and cannot be claimed as mine because they lack permanence. This understanding of impermanence is fundamental to Dhamma, the first characteristic. The second characteristic is not self. Phenomena do not possess inherent identity or ownership. Identifying with them leads inevitably to suffering, the third characteristic. Ultimately, everything resembles dreams, empty of inherent substance. The world we perceive is merely vibrations or fluctuations of these phenomena. Some later traditions delved deeply into these ideas, adopting them as philosophical constructs rather than experiencing them directly through meditative practice, such as jhanas and direct states of insight. This is what the Buddha always emphasized, that any experience or teaching he imparted was not meant for us to formulate into philosophy, theory, or marketing material. That was never his intention. Instead, he urged us to see these teachings through direct experience. This is the essence of right view according to the Buddha. He wanted us to encounter the Dhamma firsthand, not to transform his teachings into abstract principles or doctrines for debate. That was never the purpose of the Dhamma. Now, how can we be absolutely certain that a teaching attributed to the Buddha is indeed his, coming directly from his mouth and not from later traditions or others? Is there a litmus test we can apply to authenticate his words? Clearly, the Buddha foresaw this issue that people would question the authenticity of his teachings. This is where the Pali Nikayas play a crucial role. They contain revealing suttas that address this concern. One such example is found in the Anguttara Nikaya, A.N., in the Book of Eights, Sutta number 53, titled Just Brief. This sutta provides concise teachings that can help verify the authenticity of the Buddha's words. Let me now read through these key paragraphs briefly. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Vesali in the hall with the peaked roof in the great wood. Then Mahapajapat, Gotam, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, stood to one side, and said to him, Bhante, it would be good if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma in brief, so that, having heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One, I might dwell alone, withdrawn, heedful, ardent, and resolute. Gotama, those things of which you might know. These things lead, one, to passion, not to dispassion. Two, to bondage, not to detachment. Three, to building up, not to dismantling. Four, to strong desires, not to fewness of desires. Five, to non-contentment, not to contentment. Six, to company, not to solitude. Seven, to laziness, not to the arousing of energy. Eight, to being difficult to support, not to being easy to support. You should definitely recognize this is not the Dhamma. This is not the discipline. This is not the teaching of the teacher. So, okay, that's what the Buddha says. What is important to emphasize is how we recognize any of those eight qualities that lead to passion rather than dispassion, bondage rather than detachment, amassing rather than relinquishing, strong desire rather than the relinquishing of desire, non-contentment rather than contentment, seeking company rather than solitude, laziness rather than arousing energy, being difficult to support rather than being easy to support. Any teachings that lean towards these qualities are not the Dhamma, because true Dhamma embodies the elements that the Buddha mentioned. But Gotami, those things of which you might know, these things lead, one, to dispassion, not to passion, two, to detachment, not to bondage, three, to dismantling, not to building up, four, to fewness of desires, not to strong desires, five, 
to contentment, not to non-contentment. 6. To solitude, not to company. 7. To the arousing of energy, not to laziness. 8. To being easy to support, not to being difficult to support. You should definitely recognize, this is the Dhamma, this is the discipline, this is the teaching of the teacher. So, if we delve into the details of these eight points, the first point is about dispassion, not passion. This means that as we begin to practice the jhanas and progress along the path, we naturally become less attached to our senses and less entangled by anger and emotions. Our pursuit of experiences is guided by the Dhamma, and we do not feel a strong need to cling to all experiences. Jhanas arise spontaneously when we release our reactions to sensory experiences. We can observe that any attachment or strong desires lead us away from peace and calm. They only bring disturbance and turmoil, not a state of perfect equilibrium. When we calm the turbulence of the mind through experiencing jhanas, we see that they arise precisely because we have let go of those reactions. We have relinquished them and allowed them to pass without reacting. This is achieved through dispassion, not through passion. Therefore, if we find ourselves becoming passionate, it indicates that we are engaging with those phenomena, thereby stirring them up and causing them to intensify rather than subside. However, our practice aims at pacifying these phenomena, letting go of them, and cultivating dispassion. The second point concerns detachment, not bondage. While these concepts are somewhat similar, detachment here means not being connected or attached. It implies refraining from trying to possess or own those emotions or attitudes. If we attempt to possess or be possessive of them, it leads to bondage. Instead, we aspire to be free from attachment and possessiveness. Our practice involves being unattached and letting go of any sense of ownership or clinging. Regardless of how attractive or appealing these phenomena may appear, we recognize them as transient and conceptual, continuously releasing our grasp on them. The third point focuses on dismantling or dispersing these phenomena, not constructing them. This refers specifically to the five aggregates. Often we mistakenly identify ourselves with these physical, physiological and mental aspects that constitute the aggregates. However, in our practice, we directly see their impermanent and conditioned nature and to dissolve any attachment or identification with them. Rather than reinforcing them, we let go of the notion of a permanent self or identity associated with them. We acknowledge their arising and ceasing, refraining from clinging. In essence, it's akin to perpetually constructing the heaps of the five aggregates. These aggregates represent residues from our interaction with these phenomena. We sustain our physical form, nurture our feelings, engage with perceptions, and develop tendencies to repeat these actions, thereby establishing habitual patterns. These are formations, and consciousness delineates what is perceived as external and what is internal or mine. Consciousness, referred to as vinana in Pali, draws this distinction of self. The five aggregates continue to accumulate our experiences and contribute to our distinctiveness or identity. However, in the practice of Dhamma, we aim to discern this continuous construction process and recognize the impermanent and conditioned nature of these aggregates. We comprehend their arising and ceasing, understanding that they do not define an enduring and unchanging self. Through dependent arising, they are constructed based on our attention. By dismantling our attachment to these aggregates and letting go of unwise attention, or ayonisomanasikara, as described in the sutta, we can achieve liberation from suffering and attain freedom through dispassion. And this is what the Buddha teaches. When we begin to identify with the five aggregates, which are merely a collection of phenomena, we start to perceive them as ourselves, and therein lies suffering. Any attachment to these phenomena, saying, this body is me, this feeling is mine, this perception is me, this consciousness is me, and these formations are me, leads to suffering. Experiencing higher jhanas assures us that letting go of these phenomena leads only to greater ease and comfort. Whenever we start labeling these phenomena as me or mine, it indicates delusion, assuming ownership where none exists in the universe. Nothing in this universe remains constant, and we delude ourselves by thinking these things define us. They exist due to undue attention, yet there is nothing within them that we can truly claim ownership of. The moment we begin to identify them as ourselves, it leads to delusion, 
and these identifications become sources of suffering. However, with insight, one begins to let go and disassemble these aggregates rather than seeing them as consolidated or constructed. Simply treat them as particles, like kidney beans spilled from an open basket. These aggregates are similar, treat them accordingly. The practice involves recognizing them as composed and constructed rather than accumulating them. Therefore, we should view them as disaggregated, not attempt to construct them through concepts. The fourth aspect is fewness of desires, not intense desire. This relates to our aspirations, desires and concepts, urging us not to fabricate stories from feelings and perceptions or to develop strong cravings for things. These are akin to multiplying concepts or what we term papanka in Pali. Those who perceive these phenomena realistically view them as scattered particles. However, those who perceive them as solid, unified entities due to imagination, experience desires and attachments. When we view them as random particles lacking substance, as mere concepts, then desires and attachments dissolve. The inclination to possess diminishes. Otherwise, sensual desires proliferate and attachments deepen, prompting us to crave more and more. We can observe this truth whenever mindfulness weakens and waves of phenomena overwhelm our minds. Sensual desires arise as we seek to gratify our five senses because we perceive these phenomena as solid and highly appealing. For instance, when we encounter a beautiful body, hear pleasant music, or taste delicious food, instead of mindfully recognizing their impermanent and transient nature, we solidify them in our minds and engage in fantasies. This results in desires, attachments, and longings. Strong desires arise because we have already indulged excessively in conceptualization. While this may bring temporary satisfaction, in the long term, it leads to discontentment and suffering as our unbalanced minds ensnare us in episodes and narratives they produce. The fifth point pertains to devoid of non-contentment. When we refrain from identifying with any of these phenomena or other desires, and we have lost passion for them, they are no longer associated with us. In that moment, we reside in the present moment. Therefore, when we are fully present, nothing in our awareness is entangled or linked together. We perceive the bare thread of phenomena, realizing that there is no value in building them up. Everything that arises and ceases does so independently. They become interdependent only when we engage with them. Thus, there is no reason to harbor desires or passion. By remaining in the present moment without discontent or non-contentment arising, we discover happiness and joy in accepting things as they truly are. The happiness that arises from letting go is what brings contentment. Therefore, when we practice correctly, we experience contentment rather than discontent. Moving to number six, it concerns leaning towards company rather than seeking solitude. This might seem counterintuitive and could be one reason why later Buddhist traditions deviated from the Buddha's original teachings. Here, the Buddha suggests that mixing with people, attending parties, and seeking company tends to stir up more desires, ideas, and attachments. Essentially, the Buddha's Dhamma is not for those who constantly seek companionship, opinions, or external support for enjoyment. When we practice in seclusion, we find happiness from within and do not need to seek it outside ourselves. Engaging in conversations, sharing emotions, or venting dissatisfaction will not lead to inner peace and contentment. What the Buddha advises is this. No monks, do not constantly seek company or remain in crowds. Even when you are in company and cannot be alone, strive to maintain noble silence. If speech is necessary, inquire about the Dhamma. Seek guidance on practicing. Letting go of reactions to phenomena, avoiding attachment, observing the cessation of phenomena, and experiencing higher states of mind. Seek instructions on experiencing the jhanas, letting go of unwholesome states, and finding the happiness that arises from the jhanas. This crucial point might have been misunderstood by later Buddhist traditions. They might have thought that the Buddha advised against being in the company of others, whereas the actual teaching emphasizes mindfulness in speech and using it to clarify doubts and seek guidance on the path to liberation. There is abundant joy and happiness in seclusion and letting go. Some might not have appreciated what the Buddha taught. He advocated staying in solitude, being one's own lamp, being one's own island, 
and examining inner foundations rather than focusing on external matters. The foundation of mindfulness involves observing our body, feelings, mind and phenomena internally and consistently, rather than getting involved in external activities or mental proliferation. Therefore, the Buddha advises maintaining solitude, remaining alone, and practicing in this manner to attain peace, calm, joy and happiness from within. Number seven pertains to the arousing of energy, not laziness. This directly relates to the practice where some individuals may lean towards enjoyment, laxity and consuming drinks that induce drowsiness, leading to a generally relaxed attitude. What the Buddha emphasizes is this. Do not be lax in your daily life, be more energetic and utilize your energy appropriately. Arousing our energy involves striving, also known as the four right efforts or the four right strivings in the 37 wings of awakening, Bodhipakya Dhamma. Here, the four right strivings guide us to use our energy to cultivate diligence, commitment, and staying on track. We need energy to maintain focus, continuity, and progress in our practice. Therefore, we should avoid slouching or feeling lethargic, where our minds drift and clarity fades. Instead, we must energize ourselves. Arousing energy is about maintaining awareness without being loose or lax. When we notice any slackening or drifting from our practice, we must be vigilant, alert, and proactive. We use our energy to foster those qualities that may be lacking. Being mindful and dedicated to our practice demands effort and energy, which is what the Buddha encourages here. By sustaining this level of energy and vigilance, we can advance on our spiritual path, cultivating all the necessary qualities for awakening. Number eight advises us not to be difficult to support, but rather to be easy to support. While this primarily applies to people in monastic traditions, it is equally relevant to practitioners who recognize the futility and vanity of indulging in luxury items. They are not demanding and do not fuss over whether they drink water from a gold cup or a porcelain cup. They simply need water. There is no need to make a fuss over the type of food or drink they consume. The focus is on fulfilling their body's basic needs. They do not demand luxurious or extravagant accommodations. They are content with simple ones. Their lifestyle becomes easier to sustain and manage. Those who have realized the truth, experienced the Dhamma, and found happiness through practicing the Noble Eightfold Path see the emptiness of sense pleasures. They are content with very little and can live on a minimal budget because their desires for luxury have vanished. They require only sufficient nourishment to sustain their bodies, recognizing that the body is essential for practicing the Noble Path. As human beings, we possess all five senses. We require sharp ears to listen to the Dhamma, clear eyes to see, and a healthy body to endure physical discomfort. These faculties should be robust and healthy to progress on the journey towards enlightenment. The body is crucial for practicing the Dhamma and crossing over to the liberation on the other shore. This encapsulates the essence of the Buddha's teachings, leading us to the peace and calm he demonstrated. He taught that once we attain the state of jhana, we transcend the influence of the controllers of the sensual realms, the maras or beings of the sensual heavens. They cannot reach us. We have closed the door to them. This signifies complete safety and freedom from their influence. This dharma emphasizes the progressive refinement of our understanding of phenomena and the cultivation of detachment to attain complete emptiness and ultimate freedom. Freedom is a broad and generic term, but when we speak of nibbana, it is equated with freedom in its fullest sense. So, what does this freedom entail? Some may wonder, are we free from what? Are we relinquishing our ability to enjoy Friday night drinks, luxurious hotels and dinners? It's understood that this is not the aim. They do not wish to renounce such things entirely, fearing that pursuing nibbana will strip away all sensual pleasures and experiences. They perceive nibbana as something not worth pursuing because they believe they would lose these comforts and pleasures. However, the reality is that through meditation, practice and clear insight, we discover the happiness and joy that arise internally, liberated from all these phenomena. The bliss and contentment that result from being entirely free from feelings, perceptions and attachments far surpass any sensual pleasure or experience. In this way, we can liken it to closing the door on any influence from the four great elements. We cease to be affected by materiality, 
preventing these elements from stirring any perception within us. We then enter a state, I hesitate to call it another realm, as this might be misleading, where Nibbana signifies freedom from any such impingements or influences. It is complete freedom in every sense. Nothing remains in us or can be influenced by any phenomenon because we are utterly devoid of possessions. There is nothing in the universe that can sway this awareness of safety and security. The reward for practicing the Dhamma, experiencing the inner happiness of all jhanas on the way, letting go of attachments and ultimately transcending dependence on all phenomena, leads to a happiness culminating in a deathless, conditionless, unshakable freedom from all sense perceptions. Jhanas serve as crucial milestones on this path. This concludes this chapter, setting the stage for the next.